Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Ghosted by J.M. Darhauer. Narrated by Joe Arden and Maxine Mitchell. Prologue. One year ago. Drip, drip, drip. Rain fell from the overcast sky in sporadic bursts, quick, manic showers, followed by moments of nothingness. The weatherman on Channel 6 had predicted a calm day that morning, but the woman knew better. A tumultuous storm was rolling in. There was no way to avoid it. Thump, thump, thump. Her heart beat frantically, blood surging through her veins, mixing with enough adrenaline to make her stomach churn. She might have been worried about getting sick if there had been anything left inside of her to give, but no, she was empty. Burying her mother had taken everything out of her. This, on top of that, was too much for her to bear. Boom, boom, boom. Kennedy Garfield stood on the front porch of the two-story White House, staring out into the yard as thunder clapped in the distance. Lightning illuminated the darkened afternoon sky, giving her a better view of him. Her uninvited visitor stood a mere ten feet away, dressed in a designer suit that cost more than she made in a year, but yet he still somehow managed to look thrown away. His black tie hung loosely around his neck, his button-down soaked and clinging to his ashen skin. Why are you here? she asked, unable to handle his silence or his sudden presence. As quickly as this storm rolled in, she needed it to go back away. You know why I'm here, he said quietly. Despite his passive tone, he must have worked up a lot of nerve for him to show his face. Even from a distance, she could tell he'd been drinking, his eyes bloodshot and glassy. You shouldn't be here, she said. Not now. Not like this. He said nothing for a long moment, running his fingers through his thick blonde hair, the ends curling from being wet. He was drenched, although the rain had since slowed to a steady trickle. She wondered how long he'd been standing outside before she noticed him. Before she sensed him. She imagined it had been quite a while with the condition he was in. Beep. 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 The yellow cab parked along the curb blew its horn, the middle-aged driver growing impatient. Kennedy nearly laughed at the sight of it. She figured taking a cab would have been beneath him those days. Limos and town cars, with chauffeurs and security, were more his level. Or so she'd heard, anyway. He glanced back at it, his face flickering with a hidden aggression, before he turned back around to face her. His expression softened when their eyes met. I'm sorry, he said. I heard about your mom and I just... I wanted to be here. Crack, crack, crack. It was the sound of her heart being torn apart once again. You shouldn't have come, she said. An assault of tears burned her eyes, but she refused to shed a single one. Not while he was there. Not while he was looking at her. So many years later, and he still got under her skin. You know that. You're just making this all so much harder. I know, but... He paused, his blue eyes imploring. I was hoping I could... I mean, I wondered if it would be okay if... No, she said, knowing right away what he was asking... But there was no way it would happen. Not then, and certainly not with the condition he was in. He knew better than to even ask. But I said no. He sighed as the driver laid on the horn for the second time. Eyeing her warily, he took a step back, and then another, before turning to leave without saying goodbye. They'd already said enough goodbyes to last them a lifetime. Stomp, stomp, stomp. Kennedy stiffened as footsteps stomped through the house behind her, on a mission as they hurried her direction. The front door flung open, a tiny human tornado appearing at her side, wearing a fluffy black dress with her brunette hair and pigtails. Despite all the darkness surrounding the little girl, she was all bows and sunshine, innocence and happiness. And Kennedy would do everything in her power to keep her that way. She didn't need to know more devastation. She was too young to endure that kind of pain. 
Too young to have her heart broken by Jonathan Cunningham. Who is that, Mommy? The little girl asked, watching the cab as it disappeared into the storm. Did they come for Grandpa? Were they Nana's friend? It was no one you need to worry about, sweetheart, Kennedy said, gazing down at a pair of twinkling blue eyes. Something her sweet little girl had inherited from him. The man was just a little lost, but I sent him back on his way. Back on his way. One. Kennedy. The beeping of the checkout scanner is monotonous. A dull drone I barely hear anymore as it melds with Wilson Phillips's Hold On playing on the station over the loudspeaker radio. The same songs, day in and day out. Same constant beeping. Same everything. Same customers in and out of the store buying the same things they've bought before. My life has become a predictable loop. A real-life version of Groundhog Day that I have no intention of trying to change. I'm the personification of an alternate ending where Phil accepts that he's stuck listening to Sonny and Cher every morning until the end of time. If you'd have asked me years ago if this would be my future, I would have laughed in your face. Me, Kennedy Reagan Garfield. I was destined for greatness. I'd been named after a pair of iconic presidents. My mother, the idealistic liberal, and my father, a strict conservative, never saw eye to eye on much. Except for me. They never agreed on health care or taxes, but they were both convinced their little oops baby would be somebody. And here I am. Somebody, all right. Assistant manager somebody at Piggly Q Grocery in a blink and miss it kind of town in upstate New York. $13 an hour, 40 plus hours a week with a full benefits package, including unpaid vacation days. Not that I'm ungrateful. I'm doing better than a lot of people. My rent is paid every month. My electricity hasn't been cut off. I've even got overpriced cable. But deep inside, I know this isn't the kind of greatness my parents envisioned for me. Assistance needed on three? The high-pitched voice squeals over the loudspeaker, drowning out the music. My gaze scans the register area, waiting for someone else to respond, but nobody does. It always falls to me. Shaking my head, I stroll over to lane three, to the young blonde girl running the ancient register, ringing up an older woman's groceries. The cashier, Bethany, looks at me, dramatically pouting as she wiggles a can of chicken noodle soup in my face. It's coming up a buck and a quarter, but Mrs. McCleskey says there's a 99 cent sign back there. It's a dollar twenty-five. I know it is. Even Mrs. McCleskey probably knows and wants to make a fuss about something. I smile, though, and override the register, giving it to the woman at the discount. I step away to let Bethany finish ringing up the groceries as Mrs. McCleskey asks, How's your father doing? I don't have to look to know she's talking to me. I start straightening up the candy rack near the register. He's hanging in there. Thought about baking him a pie, she says. Does he have a favorite? Apple? Cherry? Thought about pumpkin? Or maybe pecan? I'm sure he'll appreciate whatever you make, I say. But he's more of a chocolate cream pie guy. Chocolate, she mutters. Should have known. The radio moves on to Lisa Loeb's stay, and that's about when I decide I'm done with this day. I stroll to the front corner of the store to where Marcus, the manager, hangs out in an office tucked behind customer service. Marcus is tall and slim, with brown skin and black hair that's starting to show signs of impending gray. I'm going home, I tell him. Now, he glances at his watch. It's a little early. I'll make up for it tomorrow, I say, clocking out. Marcus doesn't argue. 
He knows I'm good for it, which is why he gives me leniency. Actually, I know how you can make up for it, he says. I need an extra shift worked, if you're willing to pull a double on Friday. Bethany asked for the day off, but there's no one to cover. I want to say no, because I hate running registers. But I'm too nice for that. We both know it. Do me a favor, he says. Stop by on your way out and tell Bethany I'm approving her request. Will do, I say, walking out before he can ask me for anything else. I stroll down the cereal aisle on my way through, snatching a box of Lucky Charms off the shelf. Bethany stands at her register, skimming through a magazine she grabbed from the rack beside her. I glance at it, rolling my eyes. Hollywood Chronicles. The epitome of trashy tabloids. I set my cereal down on the conveyor belt and pull out a few dollars. Bethany closes the magazine and tosses it down in the bagging area before ringing me up. Marcus approved your day off, I tell her. She squeals. Really? He told me to tell you. Oh my god! She shoves my cereal in a white plastic bag. I didn't think there was anyone to cover my shift. Yeah, well, I could always use the overtime. Bethany squeals again, reaching across the lane to grab a hold of me, squeezing me in a hug. You're the best, Kennedy. Special day? I guess when I pull away, holding the money out to her before she can even tell me my total, hoping she'll take it instead of hugging me again. Alanis Morissette's Ironic is coming on, and if I don't get out of here soon, I'm going to lose my sanity. Yeah, I mean, sort of. She blushes as she shoots me a look. It's kind of stupid, really. There's a film that's supposed to be shooting in the city. My friends and I are hoping to go down and maybe, you know, see what we can see. I smile softly. There's nothing stupid about that. You don't think so? Of course not, I say. I went to a movie set once. Her eyes widen. Really? You! The way she says that makes me laugh, although I probably should be offended by her incredulous tone. It's not like I'm some uptight old lady. I'm not Mrs. McCleskey. I'm only a few years older than her. Yes, really. What movie? It was just one of those teen comedies. The titles all kind of sound the same. Who was in it? Anyone I might know? She wants to hear all about it. I can tell by the curious gleam in her eyes, but I have no desire to get into that story tonight. It was so long ago that I really can't even say. Bethany counts out my change, and my eyes drift to the magazine she's been reading as I grab my bag. All at once, my insides freeze. Ice running through my veins, the cold striking me straight to the bone. Plastered on the cover is a face I know. Even wearing a black hat and dark sunglasses, ducking his head, he's easily recognizable. My gut burns, twisting and coiling, and... Ugh! 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 He's standing beside a woman with platinum blonde hair. While he shies away from the camera, she's wide open, looking right at it, her green eyes vivid in the photo. Black leather covers her supermodel frame, while red lipstick accentuates a set of pouty lips. Her skin is a deep tan, like the woman lives on a beach somewhere. Ugh, it makes me sick. Even I have to admit she's beautiful. Below the photograph of the pair is a massive caption written in bold. Johnny and Serena's secret wedding. My eyes linger on those words. I think I'm going to throw up. Do you believe it? Bethany asks. My gaze lifts to meet hers. Believe what? That Johnny Cunning and Serena Markson eloped? I don't know what to say. I don't know what to believe. I don't know why it even matters to me. I don't know why my chest feels tight at the mere insinuation that a wedding might have happened somewhere at some point, 
a wedding where he was the groom, but I wasn't present. I feel like an obsessed, lovesick fangirl, convinced the heartthrob was supposed to be mine. But he wasn't. I think, where Johnny Cunning is concerned, anything's possible. Yeah, you're right, Bethany says, picking the tabloid back up as I head for the exit. Really hoping to run into them this weekend. My footsteps falter. Them? Yeah, the movie that's filming. It's the new Brizio one. Something happens inside of me when Bethany says that. Something that knocks the wind out of my sails. Whoa. It's a crushing, soul-sucking sensation that starts deep in my chest, right where I used to keep my heart. It's gone now, locked away in a steel-reinforced safe, padlocked and hidden where no one can get to it without my blessing. The spot where it used to be, now nothing more than a black hole that desperately pulls at the rest of me, trying to swallow me up at the sound of that word. Breezio. They're still making those, I ask, trying to keep my voice steady, but even I can hear the change in my tone. Pathetic. Of course, Bethany laughs. How do you not know? I thought everyone knew. I haven't really been paying attention. More like I've actively avoided, but that's another long story. You've seen them, though, right? Bethany narrows her eyes. Please tell me you've at least watched the others. I've caught bits and pieces, I admit. She throws her hands up dramatically, like my answer is absurd. That's just... insane. Oh my god, you need to watch them. The stories are amazing. So funny and just... I don't even have words. And Johnny Cunning. That man is serious eye candy. You're totally missing out. I'm dead serious. You need to watch them. I'll keep that in mind. Good, she says, smiling like she won something. The first one is called Transparent, and the second one is Shadow Dancer. And the one they're filming now? Ghosted. I look away from her when she says that. Well, good luck this weekend, I mumble. Hope it works out for you. Bethany says something else, but I don't stick around to hear it, carrying my lucky charms as I jet out to the parking lot. Puddles cover the asphalt since it rained most of the morning. It always seems to rain at times like these. I dodge the water, making my way to my car. It's only a few blocks from the grocery store to my father's house. In this tiny town, it's only a few blocks to get anywhere. I pull my old Toyota into his driveway and park as brakes screech in the street, a big yellow school bus coming to a stop in front of the house. Perfect timing. Lights flash and the door opens, a bundle of energy bursting off the bus and rushing toward me. Mommy! I smile as I gaze at her, her hair wild even though I put it in a tight braid this morning. Hey, little one. Three and a half feet tall, just shy of 40 pounds. Average for a five-year-old, but that's the only thing average about Maddie. Smart, compassionate, creative. She insists on dressing herself, which means nothing ever matches, but the girl somehow makes it work. Everything I do is all about her. Anything to keep the smile on her face, because that smile is what keeps me going. It's the reason I get out of bed in the morning. That smile tells me I'm doing okay. In a world filled with so much wrong, it's nice to know I'm doing something right. She wraps her arms around my waist in a hug as the bus pulls away. I hear the screen door bang and watch as my father strolls out onto the porch. Grandpa! Maddie says excitedly, running to him. I made you something! She yanks her backpack off, dropping it to the old wood and digs through it for a piece of paper. A drawing. She shoves it at him, and he takes it, a serious look on his face. Rubbing his scruffy chin, he squints his eyes as he studies it. Hmm. 
Maddie stands in front of him on the porch, eyes wide. I stifle a laugh. How many times have I seen this play out? His house is wallpapered with her art. Same routine, every single time. She eagerly waits for his assessment, nervous, and without fail, he always says it's the best whatever she drew he's ever seen in his life. This, he says, nodding, is the greatest puppy I've ever laid my eyes on. Maddie laughs. It's not a puppy. It's not. It's a seal, she says, yanking the top of the paper down to look at it. See? It's all gray and it's got a ball. Oh, uh, that's what I meant. A baby seal is called a puppy, too. Nuh-uh. Yep. Maddie looks to me to be referee. Mommy? They're called pups, I tell her. She turns back to him, grinning. It's a good puppy? The best, he confirms. She hugs him before grabbing the drawing and running inside the house to hang it up. I join my father on the porch. Nice save. Tell me about it, he says, eyes studying me for a moment. You're off work early today. Yeah, well, it's been one of those days, I say. One of those days where the past comes rushing back. Besides, I have to work a double tomorrow, so I've earned it. A double? He looks confused. Don't you have plans tomorrow night? Yep. I pause before correcting myself. Well, I mean, I did. I so rarely have time for a social life that I haven't even considered that. But I could use the money, and I've already got a babysitter on tap, I say, slapping my father on the back. Can't say no to that. Shaking his head, he sits down on an old rocking chair on the porch. It's starting to drizzle again, the sky darkening. I lean against the railing, staring out at it as Maddie comes back outside, leaping off the porch. The girl loves storms. I can't remember the last time I played in the rain. That's what I think as I watch her running through the small front yard, splashing in the puddles and stomping in the mud. Did I ever have that much fun? Was my life ever that carefree? I can't remember. I wish I could. Something's bothering you, my father says. It's him, isn't it? Turning around, I lean back against the wooden banister, crossing my arms over my chest as I regard him. He rocks back and forth, an identical chair beside him glaringly vacant. My mother used to sit there with him, every morning, drinking coffee before he set off to work. We buried her a year ago. Twelve long months have passed, but the wound still feels raw, the memories of that day gnawing away at me. It was the last time I saw him, too, as I stood right here on this porch. If the headline I caught earlier is any indication, he's had quite an interesting year. What makes you think it has anything to do with him? I ask forcing myself not to react, like it doesn't matter. But I'm not an actress. You have that look again, my father says. That vacant, lost stare. I've seen it a few times, and it's always him. That's ridiculous. Is it? Of course. I'm fine. I didn't say you weren't fine. I said you looked lost, not that you didn't know your way. He's eyeing me warily. I'm not sure if there's even a point to lying about it when the truth is written all over my face. And the truth is, I do feel lost. Caught a story in a tabloid, I say. It said he'd gotten married. And you believe it? I shrug. I don't know. It doesn't really matter, does it? It's his life. He'll do whatever he wants. But... But they're filming in the city again. And you're worried he'll show up. Worried he'll try to see her again. My father motions past me at where Maddie is still running around in the rain. 
I smile softly as she twirls, oblivious that she's the topic of conversation. Or are you worried he won't, he continues, worried he gave up and moved on? Maybe, I think, but I don't say it. I don't know which possibility worries me more. I'm terrified he'll force his way into her life and break her heart with his brokenness, like he once broke mine. But at the same time, the thought that he might have given up scares me just as much, because that'll hurt her someday, too. The rain starts falling harder as I mull over those thoughts. Maddie is running circles around the puddles, soaked. Water streaks her face like falling tears, but she's smiling, so happy, ignorant to my fears. I should get going, I say, before the storm gets any worse. Go on, then, my father says. But don't think I haven't noticed you didn't answer my question. Yeah, well, you know how it is, I mumble, leaning down to kiss my father's cheek before grabbing the backpack from the porch. Maddie, time to go home, sweetheart. Maddie runs for the car, yelling, Bye, Grandpa! Bye, kiddo, he calls out. See you tomorrow. Waving goodbye to my father, I follow her. She's already buckled up when I get in the car. My eyes seek her out in the rearview mirror. Tendrils of her dark hair fall into her face. She tries to blow them away, her blue eyes watching me. She has a way of looking at you, like she's looking through you. Like she can see how you're feeling on the inside. Those things you try not to let show. It's unnerving sometimes. For being so young, she's quite intuitive. Which is why I plaster a smile on my face. But I can tell she doesn't buy it. Home is a small two-bedroom apartment a few blocks away. It's not much. But it's enough for us, and it's what I can afford, so you'll hear no complaints from me. As soon as I open the front door, Maddie takes off through the apartment. Straight into the bathtub, I shout, locking up behind me. I flick on the hallway light as I make my way to the bathroom, passing Maddie's bedroom as I go, seeing she's rooting through her dresser, looking for the perfect pair of pajamas. She's fiercely independent, something she got from her father. I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready, she says as she runs into the bathroom when I get the water started. Shoving between the bathtub and me, she grabs the pink bottle of bubbles and squeezes some under the faucet, giggling, as always, when they start to form. I got this, Mommy. I take a step back. You got this? Uh-huh, she says, not looking at me, fixated on the filling bathtub. She sets the bottle of bubbles down on the floor near her feet before turning the knobs, shutting off the water. I got this. Like I said, independent. Well, go on then. Do your thing. I don't close the door, but I give her some leeway, keeping an eye on her from outside the bathroom. I can hear her splashing, playing in even more water, like the rain hadn't quite been enough for her. I use the time to gather up laundry, trying to distract myself, but it's pointless. My mind keeps going back to him. I sort two weeks' worth of dirty clothes into piles on my bedroom floor. Every time I pause, my eyes flicker to my closet, drawn to the old ratty box on the top shelf. I can't see it from here, but I know it's there. I haven't thought about it in a while. I haven't had a reason— Life has a way of burying memories. In my case, they're buried under a mountain of other junk in the closet. I fight it for a moment, but the pull is too much. Abandoning the laundry, I step straight for the closet, digging out the box. The cardboard rips when I yank it down, falling apart in my hands. Things scatter around the floor. A picture lands by my feet. I carefully pick it up. It's him. He's wearing his school uniform, or as much of it as he ever wore. No sweater, no jacket, and no dress shoes, of course. 
His white button-down is unbuttoned, the tie draped around his neck. Beneath it, he's wearing a plain black T-shirt. His hands are in his pockets, his head cocked to the side. He almost looks like a model, like the picture belongs in a magazine. A knot forms in my chest. It's suffocating. I can feel the anger and sadness bitterly brewing inside of me, growing stronger as the years go on. My eyes burn with tears, and I don't want to cry, but the sight of him takes me back. All done! My gaze darts to the doorway as the small, cheery voice echoes through the bedroom. I grip the picture tightly, holding it behind my back. She's dressed in a pair of red pajamas, her hair drenched on the ends, a few bubbles around her ears. Mud still streaks her right cheek. All done, I ask, raising my eyebrows. Did you even wash your hair? Nope. Of course she didn't. She can't. And what about your face? I ask. I'm starting to think you only played in the bubbles. So? I'm gonna get more dirty later. So, I gasp, acting horrified. You can't stay dirty. You have school tomorrow. She looks about as thrilled about school as I was as a child. Rolling her eyes, she shrugs, as if to say, why does that matter? Before I can say anything else, her attention shifts to the mess scattered along the floor, her eyes widening as she gasps, Brizio! She dodges forward, snatching up the old comic book encased in a plastic protective sleeve. I freeze. I wouldn't call it vintage, nor is it worth more than a few bucks, but I couldn't ever bring myself to part with that comic. To me, it meant too much. Mommy, it's Brizio, she says, her face lit up with excitement. Look! I see, I say when she holds it up to show me. Can we read it, please? Uh, sure, I say, moving one hand from behind my back to take the comic book from her. But first, back into the bathtub. She groans, making a face. Go on, I nod my head toward the doorway. I'll be there in a minute to wash your hair. Turning, she trudges back to the bathroom. I wait until she's gone to set the comic book down and pull the picture out from behind my back. I stare at it for a second, letting myself feel those things once again before crumbling it up into a ball and discarding it on the floor with all of the other memories. Pulling out my cell phone, I scroll through it, dialing a number as I stroll down the hall, hearing it ring a few times before voicemail clicks on. It's Andrew. Can't make it to the phone. Leave a message and I'll give you a call. Beep. Hey, Drew. It's, a uh, Kennedy. Look, I'm going to have to take a rain check on tomorrow night. Something came up and, well, you know how it is. 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 You know how... Two. Jonathan. The limo slows as it nears 8th Avenue, the traffic thick at 7 o'clock in the morning, just south of sunrise as the world heads to work. Friday. I'm sure the detours don't help people get where they're going, but it's New York. They ought to be used to it. Never a day goes by that something isn't going on here. They're some of the most adaptable people on the planet, New Yorkers, but they're also some of the most no-nonsense. They don't have time for bullshit. And this morning, it feels like we're all knee-deep in it. People line the streets as we near the metal barricades. Out-of-towners, I'm assuming, because locals aren't usually the type to give a shit when filming happens in their territory. We're more of a nuisance than anything. Blocking off streets and shutting down neighborhoods, disrupting lives. I have nothing to do with any of that. I don't pick the place, I just show up when they tell me to. But more than once, I've had the blame thrown my way. Smug bastard, who does he think he is, shutting down part of Midtown during rush hour? Word must have leaked, the flippant voice says from the seat in front of me, unfazed as usual. Clifford Caldwell, powerhouse talent manager. Nothing ever seems to bother him. 
Believe me, I've tested his limits, so I know. No PR is bad PR. He's typing away on his beloved Blackberry, attention glued to the screen, but I know he's talking about the crowd packing the streets. You think? I mutter, glancing out the window as we crawl past at a snail's pace. Despite the fact that the tinting is pitch black, making it impossible for anyone to see inside, I keep my head lowered, an old black ball cap pulled down low, the battered brim shielding my eyes. Production is running under a fake name to keep people away, so prying eyes won't spoil things they might see on the set. But somebody must have already leaked that information for so many people to show up here this morning. I'll talk to them about tightening security around you, Cliff says. See if we can work with the location department to shake up your schedule. Don't bother, I say. They'll always be a few steps ahead. Cliff laughs under his breath. Your optimism is astounding. Tell me about it. A lithe voice chimes in from the seat beside me. Something about this movie turns him into a moody prick. I cut my eyes at Serena as she musses her freshly dyed hair, deep brown now, instead of her usual blonde. Gotta get in character. I can sense her gaze even though she's wearing sunglasses. It's a damn harsh glare. She isn't happy with me this morning, or any morning. Not a morning person. Across from her sits her longtime assistant, Amanda, ignoring us all as she busies herself filtering Serena's email, like every morning, weeding out anything that might trigger a tantrum. That true, Johnny? Cliff asks. Because as your manager, I want you to be happy, and as her manager, it's my job to make sure her co-stars aren't being moody pricks. I'm fine, I say. It's just been a long week. The metal barrier is moved out of the way as the limo approaches it, and we drive into the quartered-off area, past a wall of security. There's a slight commotion outside, a few fans screaming, as the limo slips past into a small alley and comes to a stop just out of view. Cliff helps Serena out, taking her hand while I let Amanda go before stepping out of the limo. Serena doesn't hesitate, waltzing out of the alley and straight to the crowd, a smile suddenly plastered to her face. There are a few more screams, some shrieks as the fans freak out. No hiding now. I leave her to it. She loves that part and eats it right up. The limelight does her wonders, the adoring fans, the camera. Serena was always destined to be a star. Me? I wanted to be an actor. I head straight for the row of trailers set up along the backside of the alley, fanning out into the lot of a massive warehouse. Mostly interior shots today, with some filming in the street as they coordinated a mock explosion, according to the call sheet that Cliff shoves at me before disappearing. Somewhere. Sets are always chaos. I'm greeted with a genuine smile as soon as I step into the first trailer. Hair and makeup. Jazz, with her warm brown skin and bright red lips, is a welcoming sight. It's not always easy finding a friendly face at this hour, Everyone's so focused on business. This trailer is the busiest, one of the biggest, half a dozen makeup artists scattered around at brightly lit stations. But I go straight to Jazz. Hey, superstar, she says, patting the seat of a chair in front of a big mirror, motioning for me to sit down. Looks like I've got my work cut out for me. You always do, I say, dropping down in the chair and taking my hat off, setting it aside before running my hands through my thick hair. It's Jazz's job to make me look good, and that isn't always easy, especially when I've been sleeping like shit for over a week, dark bags under my bloodshot eyes. She gets to work doing what she does, babbling away about something. I'm vaguely listening, my mind drifting to some damn dangerous thoughts I keep having. Thoughts of a life I could have had but threw away like a fucking idiot. It always happens when I find myself back in New York. A magnetic pull that's hard to ignore, but I do whatever I can to resist it. It's even harder this time, though. I'm dragged back to reality when Jazz says, So, I read something scandalous the other day. One of those kinky whips and chains books? She laughs. Not this time. No, I picked up a copy of Hollywood Chronicles. I groan, closing my eyes and leaning my head back covering my face with my hands when she says that. 
I'm fucking up whatever progress she's made in making me look human again. But I'd rather rip my own balls off and juggle them like a trained monkey than even acknowledge that piece of shit tabloid exists. They've been the bane of my existence for far too long, insisting on putting my face on the cover all the time. Why do you hate me, Jazz? I mutter. Please tell me you didn't give those assholes your money. What? Psh, of course not, she says with a laugh, snatching my hands away from my face to get back to work. I said I picked it up, not that I bought it. I was in the checkout line at the store. Yeah, well, whatever it said, I don't want to know. It said you and Miss Markson got married. I groan again. I just said I didn't want to know. Well, I told you anyway, she says. So, what do you think about that? I think you shouldn't waste your brain cells on trashy tabloids. You're better off sticking to the kinky books. She shoots me a look but drops the subject. I know what she's asking. She's hinting around, trying to get me to spill what's been happening in my life since we filmed the last movie. She wants to know if there's any truth to that story, but I'm not in the mood to get into it. Once the makeup is done, I switch over to hair before I bid Jazz goodbye and head to the wardrobe trailer to get my costume on. My stunt double is there, already rocking the slick light blue and white suit. I slip mine on, or, well, I get shoved into it like they're stuffing fucking sausage into its casing, the material showing every goddamn ripple, so they poke and prod and tape down and tuck. Mesh and chrome and layers of foam covered in tweaked, flexible material made to look like simple spandex without, you know, being spandex. It's as uncomfortable as you're imagining. Congratulations, buddy. My stunt double says, slapping me on the back. Heard you got hitched. Lucky man. I cringe. Who told you that? Jasmine. Jazz. I'm going to strangle that woman. It takes damn near 30 minutes to get me situated in the suit, to get my junk looking right and my muscles padded up, since I'm nowhere near superhero strong. I walk out when I'm done, running right into Serena with her assistant at her heels. Well, 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 Serena says, grinning as she looks me over. It's good to see you back in that suit. I glance down at myself, stretching to try to loosen up the material. I look ridiculous. She laughs. You do not. You should wear it all the time. I'm talking all day, every day. Even at night. Keep dreaming, Sarah. Oh, I will. She slips past me, biting down on her bottom lip as she ogles me from the backside. It's fucking embarrassing. I damn near blush, as ridiculous as it is, watching as her assistant steers her to wardrobe so we're not late to start today. Hey, I call out. You should know that Jazz is telling everyone that we're married. I know. Serena rolls her eyes and laughs it off. Apparently we made the cover of Chronicles again. Yeah, apparently. I say as she goes inside the trailer, heading on to set once she's gone. It's a long day. Take after take after take. I'm sweaty from running and tired from standing, my head pounding from the loud bangs and booms, the pyrotechnics rocking the neighborhood. There's a breach of security around mid-afternoon, a woman slipping past the barrier after the shots move to the exterior, but they catch her. I try to not think about it, try to not think about any of them. I try to not think about her when I feel eyes watching me, but it's hard pushing her from my mind. We're filming a sequence where Marianne, the love of Brizio's life, had been kidnapped. Serena's tied up with a bomb about to go off, and it's my job to save her from imminent death. I do it, and I do it well, pouring my soul into every moment. It's nearing the end of the story, even though we're still at the beginning of filming. It takes everything out of me, because endings are hard. Endings are fucking impossible, especially endings that remind me of a girl I'm trying damn hard not to think about. I breathe a sigh of relief when we wrap for the day, my shoulders slumping as I run a hand through my hair. I try to walk away when Serena throws herself at me. The sun is setting, darkness creeping in, but the shuddering flash of cameras lights up the area as she jumps into my arms. 
That was amazing, she says. Like, wow, you acted your ass off, Johnny. You made me believe every word. She kisses me before I can respond. More camera flashes going off. It's just a peck, but I imagine some paparazzo will be making a pretty penny on those pictures tonight. I can see it now. Caption, Johnny fucks Serena in front of everyone. She pulls away when Cliff approaches. Great job, you two, he says, his voice devoid of excitement, his gaze fixed on his Blackberry, as usual. They're going to stick to the current schedule, so you'll be back here in the morning, Johnny. You too, Serena, her assistant says. Sounds great to me. Serena grins as she backs away, her gaze lingering on me. Get changed, Johnny. We're celebrating. Don't stay out too late, Cliff calls out. Car will pick you both up tomorrow at six sharp. Serena makes a face at him, but doesn't argue, heading for the lingering crowd to greet everyone again. You did good, moody prick. Cliff jokes, smacking me on the back. Go get out of the suit. I know it has to be uncomfortable. I do just that, changing into my jeans and plain white t-shirt, putting my hat on. With filming done for the night, security has gone lax, the crowd moving closer onto set, close enough that some of them surround me when I step out of the trailer. Shit. Cameras flash, a barrage of questions pelting me. Johnny, can I have a picture? An autograph, Johnny? Can I have a hug? Those I don't mind. And I would do it all damn day long if it weren't for the others. The vultures. How long have you and Serena been together? Is it true you two got married? What's your father up to these days? Have you forgiven him? Have you seen him? When was the last time you even went home to visit? I hate the personal questions and never answer them. I hate the prying. I hate the rumors. I hate it all, and for good reason. There are too many skeletons in my closet, too many secrets I've been concealing, too many things I can't let them taint in a world so pure that I'm no longer welcome in it. Serena appears at my side, ready to go. She smiles, playing it up for the cameras, charming everyone as she's answering what she can, answering what I won't. We have dinner at some exclusive private club in the Upper East Side, Serena, having started her career modeling here in Manhattan, always seems to know everybody everywhere she goes. Some of her friends are hanging out, laughing and chatting, socialites and trust fund assholes, sharing bottles of vintage wine and doing a few lines. Cocaine. As soon as the white powder surfaces, I'm making my excuse to go. These people used to be my people too, friends, but Serena's the only one who seems to be concerned about my hasty exit. She grabs my hand, trying to stop me when I stand, her green eyes eerily dark. Please, stay, celebrate. We never get to hang out anymore like this. I would. You know I would. If I could. I say, nudging her chin as she stares up at me. Don't party too hard, okay? I leave before she can try to stop me again keeping my head down, avoiding eye contact. Instead of taking the awaiting limo and heading straight back to the hotel, I stroll a few blocks, slipping into a small bar. It's quiet, not very busy, despite it being Friday night. I find an empty stool along the edge of the bar and as the bartender approaches. It doesn't take long, just a few seconds, before recognition happens, his eyes widening, but he doesn't announce my presence. What can I get for you? He asks, not calling me by name. Whatever's on tap. He pours me a beer. I don't ask what it is. I sit in silence after he slides it in front of me, wrapping my hands around the cold glass. I can smell it. It's cheap. Not the cheapest shit, but still. Cheap. My mouth waters and I can damn near taste the golden liquid, my tongue tingling from anticipation as I stare at it. Something wrong? The bartender asks after a few minutes, motioning to the beer I'm not drinking. Would you like something different instead? No, it's fine. I just... I haven't had a drink in a while. How long? Twelve months? It's been a long year, longer since I touched anything harder. I'm stuck between steps eight and nine of AA, between admitting I've wronged people and making up for what I've done. 
You see, there's a catch to those steps, one nobody mentions until you get there. It isn't so cut and dry. There's a bit of fine print to making amends that says, except when doing so would cause further harm. So, I know it's none of my business, the bartender says, but twelve months is one hell of a streak. You sure you want to ruin that? No, I admit. Not sure about much these days. He doesn't wait for me to say anything else. The beer in my hand is snatched away and replaced with Coke. The soda, not the drug. Been a while since I've had one of these, too, I tell him, but I don't hesitate to sip this drink. It's heaven in a plastic pint glass. Soda does hell on the body, though, with the empty calories, the bloating. Or, well, at least that's what the nutritionist says that the studio hired to make sure I stay in shape. You want to talk about it? The bartender asks. About what? About whatever has you almost breaking a twelve-month streak of sobriety tonight? I shake my head. I would if I could. It's been eating me up inside, but what's bothering me isn't something I can talk about, because unlike most of what Hollywood Chronicles peddles, this is a real scandal. I appreciate it, I say, taking another sip of the soda before standing up. I toss a few dollars down out of gratitude and turn to leave before I'm tempted to spill my guts and tell the guy a story that could earn him retirement-level money. Using my phone, I order a car and step out of the bar as it connects me with a driver. Three minutes away. The second the warm night air greets me, something else does, too. A small crowd. A couple girls, just teenagers. Nobody ever gives teenage girls enough credit. They're smart. They probably aren't even old enough to hang out at a bar, but they knew how to track me down. No paparazzi yet, but they won't be far. They never are. The requests fly at me, autographs, pictures, hugs. This time I stop for them. I've got three minutes to spare. The least I can do is give back to a few of the fans that have probably been looking for me all day. Hell, I'd be nothing without them. I scribble my name in Sharpie on whatever they shove my way, pictures, t-shirts, even an arm, and take a few photos, putting on a smile that would make Cliff proud. Can you sign this, please? A blonde girl asks, shoving a DVD of the first Brizio movie at me. And make it out to Bethany? Bethany, I mumble, jotting down her name, earning a squeal when I say it out loud. How you doing tonight? Amazing, she says, sounding like she means it. My friends and I drove the whole way down here to see you when we found out you were filming. Yeah? How'd you find out? It was all over the gossip blogs, she says. There was even a video of Serena talking about it. Serena. No matter how many times she's warned, she always slips up and says shit she shouldn't. So you drove down here? From where? Bennett Landing. She says, my stomach sinks. You're from Bennett Landing? Yep. Nice place. I lie, or maybe I'm not lying, but as everything gets fuzzy, it sure as hell feels that way. I've been there a few times. I know, she says, or, well, I mean, I've heard stories. Stories, huh? What kind of stories? I heard you got arrested once for running around naked in Landing Park. She blushes as she spits out those words, while I laugh. Genuinely laughing. I haven't done that in a while. Damn, didn't think anybody knew about that. They do. They talk about it all the time. They say you got drunk and went streaking. Not quite, I say. I wasn't streaking, I was with a girl. Her eyes light up. Really? Really, I say. She was hiding when the police showed up. The charges were dropped the next morning, but it's nice to know my moment of indecent exposure lives on in infamy. She laughs. I laugh. It's a nice moment. I almost forget myself because of it, letting my thoughts slip back to that time, letting myself think about that world again. Guilt eats me up inside. I take a photo with Bethany and sign a few more autographs before my car shows up to whisk me away. Six o'clock will come early without a doubt, and I have a feeling I won't be getting much sleep tonight. Previously, Tragic Hero in the Making 
A few minutes outside the Albany city limits sits an elite private high school, Fulton Edge Academy. Fulton Edge has the distinction of having taught more government officials than any other school in the nation, an honor they carry with pride, evident in the fact that it's displayed everywhere. Seriously. Everywhere. There's even an unsightly banner hanging in the main corridor. College preparatory, with an emphasis on political science, it's the perfect place for a high-profile congressman to send his rebellious teenage son. A fact you know well, considering that's how you ended up here, drowning in a cesspool of blue and white uniforms for your fourth year in a row. Classes have already started. First day of your last year, but you're wandering around, in no hurry to get where you're going. American politics. Not to be confused with comparative politics, of course, which you'll have later in the afternoon, bookending the oh-so-exciting subjects of literature, political literature between the world wars, and math, mathematical methods in political science. The only thing in your schedule unscathed is P.E., likely because they haven't figured out how to incorporate the government. Fifteen minutes late, you open the classroom door and walk in, disrupting the teacher already invested in a lecture. Your footsteps stall for a fraction of a second, like your feet can't bear to go on, before you shut the door and commit to being here. You're a walking, talking dress code violation, with your tie hanging loose, your white button down not tucked in, a bit of chaos in the midst of manufactured perfection throwing off the whole political prep school aesthetic. Mr. Cunningham, the teacher says, casting you a narrowed look. Nice of you to grace us with your presence this morning. Pleasure's all mine, you say, your voice dripping with sarcasm as you head to the back of the classroom to the lone empty desk. Would have shown up sooner, but, well, I didn't really care to be here. There's an awkward stirring, a throat clearing, a long pause of nobody talking as you settle into your seat. You don't just throw off the aesthetic, you alter their whole image. It makes them uncomfortable. As I was saying, the teacher says, the founding fathers. The man talks. He talks a lot. You rock your chair on its hind legs. Your gaze scans the classroom, surveying your classmates, faces you know well, but not ones you care to look at. Until you glance to your right, to the desk beside you, and see... her. A face you've never seen before. She's just a girl. Nothing special about her. Brown hair falls halfway down her back, hanging loose. Her skin isn't sun-kissed like the other girls here. There are only three of them in the entire twelfth grade. Three out of a class of thirty. A mere tenth of the senior population is female. Maybe that's why you stare. Why you can't seem to tear your eyes away. Girls are like unicorns in this place. Even the most common ones. They can't all be royalty. Or maybe there's another reason. Maybe it's something else that sets her apart. Your gaze? It's not easy to ignore, although the girl tries. Her skin prickles as if you're touching her. A shiver flows down her spine. She's fidgeting, toying with a cheap black ink pen on top of a notebook that she hasn't yet written in. Nervous, she lets go of the pen and balls her hands into fists as she shoves them beneath the desk. Your gaze lifts blue eyes meeting hers for a moment before she looks away, acting as if she's paying close attention to the lesson, but nobody cares that much about the formation of the first cabinet. The class drags on for forever and a day. The teacher starts asking questions, and nearly everyone raises their hands. She keeps hers hidden beneath the desk, while you continue to rock your chair without a care. Despite not volunteering, the teacher calls on you, over and over. Cunningham. You rattle off answers, rather bored with it all. The others stumble, but you don't even have to pause. 
You know your stuff. It feels a bit like a circus act, like a lion jumping through hoops. If they poke you too much, making you perform, might you start ripping heads off? Hmm. When class is over, everyone packs up their things. You drop your chair down, making a loud screech as you shove to your feet. You didn't bring anything with you. No books, no paper, not even a pencil. You stall between the desks, leaning closer to the new girl. I like your nail polish, you say, your voice playful as she picks up her yet untouched notebook. She looks up, meeting your eyes. You're amused, the first hint of anything beyond boredom. Her gaze shifts to her nails then, to the chipped blue glittery polish coating them. You walk away. Be on time tomorrow, Cunningham, the teacher calls out. You don't even look at him when you say, No promises. The day drags on and on and on. You sleep through most of literature and don't do a single math problem. Comparative politics is repetitious as you again spew out answers to questions. The girl sits near you in every class, close enough that your attention drifts to her whenever there's a lull. You watch her as she fidgets. You watch her as she struggles. You watch her fumble her way through wrong answers. Others watch, too, whispering to each other like they're trying to figure out how a commoner weaseled her way onto their court, but you watch her like she's the least boring thing you've encountered. When P.E. arrives at the end of the day, you're more interested. It's mindless, running lap after lap, and you're fast. So fast, it annoys the others. They don't like you being better than them. On top of ruining their image, you're putting a dent in their self-confidence. When class is over, everyone heads to the locker rooms. You're soaked with sweat, but don't bother to change, standing right outside when the girl exits. But she barely makes it a step before an administrator's voice calls out, Garfield! She stalls, turning to look at the man as he lurks in the hallway. Sir? I know you're new to the school, he says. Have you had the opportunity to read the handbook? Yes, sir, she says. Then you know you're in violation of school policy, he says. Nails are to be natural, which means no polish. Rectify that by tomorrow. He walks away. She looks at her nails. You laugh. You, who have been in violation of that policy all day long without anybody saying a word about it. There's a small parking lot beside the school for the students who drive, but you head around to the front, to a circular driveway for pickup. She goes that way, too, lingering in the back of the crowd, sitting down on the ground and leaning against the building, pulling out her notebook. Opening it, she starts writing. Black sedan after black sedan swings through, the crowd whittling down. After a half hour, only a handful of kids remain. After 45 minutes, it's just you and her. You're pacing around, your gaze flickering to her. Guess I'm not the only one stranded. My dad works until four, she says, pausing her writing to look up. He should be here soon. Yeah, well, my father's an asshole, you say. He enjoys making me suffer. Why don't you drive? I could ask you the same thing. I don't have a car. I do, you say but my father's an asshole. He thinks if I have my car, I'll skip my classes. Would you? Yes. She laughs, and you give her a smile as a black car approaches the school. A limo. So, Garfield, huh? You say. Like the cat. More like the former president. You got a first name to go with it? Kennedy? You give her the strangest look. You're kidding. My middle name's Reagan, you know, to bring it all full circle. Ah, oh, man, that's fucking rough. Here I thought I had it bad being a Cunningham. Like the current Speaker of the House? Also known as the asshole who took my car keys, you say. 
You can call me Jonathan. Jonathan. You smile when she says your name. The limo pulls up and you look at it, hesitating, like maybe some part of you doesn't want to leave her alone there. Or maybe your reluctance has more to do with who awaits you. Speaker Grant Cunningham. The back window rolls down, and there the man is, his attention on something in his hands as he says, Get in the car, John, I have things to do. His voice carries not an ounce of warmth. He doesn't even look at you. You glance back at the girl before getting in the limo, while she turns back to her notebook. And you don't know this, but that girl, the one left outside of that school alone, she's sitting there, writing about you. You have all the makings of a modern-day tragic hero, and she's never felt so compelled to explore somebody's story before. Even if that's kind of creepy. Ugh. 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 Three. Kennedy. Kennedy! Oh my God, you won't believe the night I had. Those are the first words Bethany says when she strolls in the store 20 minutes late Saturday morning as I scan somebody's groceries on her register, doing her job instead of my own. I stopped by on my day off to finish up some paperwork for Marcus and want nothing more than to get the heck back out, but no such luck. What happened? I ask. Did you sneak on set? No, she says. Got close to it, though. Real close. I even got to see him in the suit. That's nice, I mumble, although it doesn't feel nice to me. No, it's making my stomach gurgle, my insides clenching and doing horrible things. It was... Wow. Bethany lets out a squeal as I finish ringing up Mrs. McCleskey's groceries and take her money. The woman shops here every single day. Today's purchase? chocolate cream pie ingredients. We stood around all day, but it was so worth it. Serena came out to see us. She was so nice. Oh, my God. I expected her to be super bitchy. You know, because people talk, but she took pictures and was joking around. That's nice, I say again. And once more, it doesn't feel that way. I'm feeling a bit sick in the stomach about it all, as absurd as that is. I'm glad she made your trip worthwhile. Oh, it wasn't her. It was totally him, she says. We found Johnny Cunning coming out of some bar later. He actually talked to us. Oh my God, he was nicer than I expected him to be, and talk about dreamy. Bethany shoves her phone in my face, forcing me to look at the screen, at a picture she took of the two of them, a cheap hole-in-the-wall bar visible in the background. I can tell he'd been trying to go unnoticed, but he smiles for the camera. It doesn't look like he's drunk, but, well, he's at a bar. He asked where I was from, she says, and he laughed when I told him they tell stories about him here. He wanted to know what people say, so I told him about the naked one. You know, at the park. You know that story, right? Vaguely, I mumble. Well, get this. Not only is it true, he really got arrested, but he said he'd been there with a girl. Can you believe that? I give Mrs. McCleskey her change and offer her a smile when I see the knowing look in her eyes. She says nothing. Thank God. As she leaves... There are a few people in town to which these aren't just stories. They're memories. It was only a few years ago, but life moves on. Bethany would have been just a kid when these things happened, not old enough to know anything about the troubled son of a politician. She only knows the actor he came to be, the one who has nothing to do with his family. That's nice. I say for the third time, and this time I know, without a doubt, I don't mean it. There's nothing nice about how I'm feeling. You're already 30 minutes late, so I need you to clock in. 
Flustered, she rambles out an apology, but I jet away without listening to it. I find a quiet place to hide in the stockroom in the back, sitting down on a box and lowering my head, taking deep breaths to ease the turmoil brewing inside of me. Too close for comfort. I do a few things, not much, before telling Marcus I'm leaving. He laughs, waving me off. Good, you're not even supposed to be here. I head to the front of the store, where Bethany is finally working her register. I'm glad you had a good trip, I tell her, genuinely meaning that. I'm glad he didn't disappoint you. With that, I leave. I drive to my father's house, parking my car in his driveway. He's on the couch in front of the television, snuggling up with my half-asleep daughter, and I groan when I realize what they're watching. Breezio. Transparent. Seriously? What happened to Saturday morning cartoons? That hasn't been a thing in a while, my father says. But this was on, and she wanted to watch it. It's the first movie. I've seen it before. It's impossible to have not seen it since Cable plays it on regular rotation these days. It's where he learns to adapt, an illness triggering something in his DNA that makes him fade away. Invisibility. He becomes the wind. He earns his name because he's like a soft breeze. You know he's around. You can feel him ghosting across your skin, but unless he shows himself to you, you can't see him, looking right through him like he's not even there. I know. It sounds like some crazy sci-fi nonsense, but it's more of a coming-of-age story. More of a love story. It's about selflessness. About sacrificing your own happiness for others. About being there for them, even when they don't know you're around. You've got mail on the kitchen table, my father says, before I start spiraling. Don't forget to grab it. Strolling into the kitchen, I snatch up the small stack of mail, mostly junk left over from me never changing my address after I moved out ages ago. I sort through it, throwing the junk away, and stall when I reach the last envelope. It's not unusual, I've seen dozens like it, but every time one shows up, it makes me hesitate, my gaze flickering along the return address to the name. Cunningham, care of Caldwell Talents. I don't open the envelope, although I used to out of curiosity. Every single time a check would be inside, the amounts steadily increasing. You going to cash that one? My father asks, stepping into the kitchen behind me. I cut my eyes at him, tossing it straight into the trash can. I don't need his money. I know, but what you should do is save the checks and cash them all at once. Wipe out his account, then go riding off into the sunset in your brand new Ferrari. I don't want a Ferrari. I do, he says. You could buy me one. Nice try, but no. Although, I might be able to squeeze enough out of my next check to buy you the Hot Wheels version. Hey, I've gotten enough overtime this week, you might get two. Well, you know, if you wouldn't throw away that check, you wouldn't need to work overtime. I'm not interested in taking a payoff. That's not what it is. That's sure what it feels like, I say. He can't even be bothered to send the checks himself, you know. His manager does it all. It's hush money. Oh, cut him some slack. Cut him some slack? I look at my father with disbelief. You've never even liked him. But he's Madison's father. I roll my eyes. It's probably childish, but if there's ever a reason to roll my eyes, this moment is it. Yeah, well... Somebody ought to tell him that. He knows. Hell, you've got the check right there to prove it. And I know, I know. Before you say, but his manager sends those, I'll point out that he's shown up here a few times to see her. Drunk, I say. He was drunk every single time. Half the time he was so high that I doubt he remembers coming. 
I'm sorry, but I don't hand out participation trophies to addicts who don't make an effort to get clean. I'll cut him some slack when he gives me a reason. He lets out a long, dramatic sigh and says nothing for a moment, like he's figuring out how to reframe his argument. You can cash it, if you want, I say, pulling the check back out of the trash can and setting it on the table. I mean, we still owe you from that one time. It's not about the money. Not even about him. Then what is it? Madison's growing up and you... What about me? You're giving up, he says. And if you're losing hope, well, we're screwed because we can't both hate the guy. Someone's gotta care for her sake. I don't hate him, I say, my stomach doing that twisting and turning again. I'm just... Tired. She'll be six soon, and I have to wonder at what point am I just making it worse? Because six years is a long time for her to not know about him. This is why we still need your mother around, he says. She was always the optimistic one. Yeah, well, what would mom say? He motions toward the living room, where the movie still plays on the television. She'd say if that's the only way Madison will ever have the chance to know the guy, so be it. I don't argue with that. I've never been sure how to handle it all. Maddie hasn't asked many questions, so up until now it's been swept under the rug. But I know that won't fly when she gets older. I just have no idea how to explain any of it. We should go. I say, dropping the subject. I promised I'd take her to the library today. We head back to the living room, where Maddie is now wide awake, captivated by the movie as Brizio makes his big move and saves the day. I sit down on the arm of the couch beside her, watching. It's still so strange. After all these years, seeing that familiar face on the screen. Jonathan Cunningham. Johnny Cunning. Six books. That's how many Maddie picks up at the library to bring home. But yet, as soon as we walk in the door, before we even settle in, she pops up in front of me clutching the comic book wrapped in plastic that she swiped from my bedroom. Can we read Brizio now, Mommy? Please? Sure, I say, taking it from her. But it's not the whole story, sweetheart. It's just the very end the last volume in the ghosted storyline. That's okay, she says, climbing up into my lap on the couch. I like the ends the best. Sighing, I pull the comic from its protective sleeve and open it. I start to read, filling in the blanks, narrating the pictures. It picks up with the big warehouse explosion as Brizio saves his lover, Marianne, from death. Who are you? she asks afterward, standing in the street as the warehouse burns, unable to see him, but she can feel him. She doesn't know who Brizio is. She doesn't know it's the man she gave her heart to so long ago. Elliot Embers. She thinks he died in Shadow Dancer from the illness that has been turning him into nothing, so he's spent ghosted in isolation. Please, show yourself. Tell me. I need to know. He considers it, standing right in front of her. It would be so easy. He could use what energy he had left to show himself. But doing so would change everything. It would change her perception of reality. Would change her memories of him. It would alter their story in irreparable ways, and knowing the truth might put her life in further danger. He couldn't do that to her. He couldn't destroy the life that she'd built for a single moment of acknowledgement, only to have to disappear again. It would be too cruel, appearing only to leave her once more when she'd finally had the courage to say goodbye. So he leans closer, softly kissing her mouth. It's barely a breath against her lips. She feels a tingle, followed by a breeze that rustles her dark hair. And then nothing. He leaves. He leaves and never looks back, giving her a life of freedom, a life where she can live a quiet existence and be happy without him. 
He's destined to do bigger things, and staying would be selfish. So as much as he wishes he could be with her forever, he has to let her go because that's what love means. It's loving someone enough to set them free. Tears sting my eyes. Ugh, this freaking story. Maddie glares at the comic. I think she expected a happy ending. Does he come back, Mommy? She asks. Well, I guess it's possible, I say. There's really no such thing as the end in comics. People come back all the time. Okay, then, she says, accepting it just like that as she hops off of my lap to snatch up one of the library books. This one now. This one now. This one now. This one now. Four. Jonathan. Let's take a break. The first AD, assistant director, yells, his voice edged with annoyance. Everyone back in 20 minutes. Markson, please pull yourself together. I'm trying. Serena mutters, squeezing her eyes shut and clutching the sides of her head. I'm just a little under the weather. Under the weather, my ass. She got maybe two hours of sleep rolling into the hotel close to four o'clock in the morning. I know because she insisted on waking me up by trying to crawl into bed with me. But I wasn't interested. She's probably still somewhat drunk probably having one hell of a comedown off of coke. I used to show up on set like that every morning and barely survived filming. I was killing myself. The moment Shadow Dancer wrapped, Cliff sent me straight to rehab, putting me in a program. It wasn't my first stint in rehab, not by a long shot, but it was the first time I stayed the full 90 days. Every other time, I walked out within a month and relapsed before Cliff even realized I'd given up. But sobriety gripped a hold of me last year and I worked the program as reality sunk in. And reality, it turns out, is a bitch to an addict. Here, drink some water. I tell Serena, handing her a bottle. It'll help you feel better. What will help is a pick-me-up, she mutters, chugging some water before looking at me. You don't have anything, do you? You know I don't. She scowls, chugging more water before stomping away. The crowd around set seems bigger now. If people didn't know we were out here yesterday, they do today. The missus seems a little testy, Jazz says, strolling over to blot the sweat from my forehead. Honeymoon over, superstar? I stare at her. She thinks she's slick, but it couldn't be more obvious what she's doing. If you're referring to Serena, she's just not feeling well. Uh-huh, she says, not convinced, as I take a sip from a bottle of water, not wanting to get into Serena's business. She's not knocked up, is she? You'd make a good daddy. I choke. I seriously choke. The water pours down my windpipe and I start fucking heaving, losing my breath, turning colors. People rush to intervene, smacking my back and forcing my hands up, trying to get air in my lungs as I violently cough. Inhaling sharply, my chest on fire, I wave everyone away and glare at Jazz. Don't even fucking say that. What? She asks, acting innocent as she presses her hands to her chest. It was just a question. She isn't pregnant, I say. It's not possible. Jazz brushes it off with a laugh, but now she's got me frazzled. You'd make a good daddy. My chest is tight, burning from the inside, the knot barely loosening by the time we're due back on set. Serena returns a lot more chipper, her pupils like fucking saucers. It's obvious she's high, but nobody says a word. I notice Cliff is watching her, though. Serena's on point now, wide awake and feeling beautiful, while I keep fucking up, take after take after take. It's a mess. The movie's going to be a goddamn disaster if we can't get our shit together. Cunning, your timing is off, the AD says. What did you two do, switch places? I'm getting it together, I say, stretching. I just need to clear my head. Serena steps closer, whispering, I got more if you want it. Do I want it? Fucking right I do. I want it all day, every day. But I don't need it. 
and I sure as hell shouldn't have it, so I shake my head. I can't do that anymore, sir. You know that. And you shouldn't be doing it either. Whatever. She rolls her eyes. You're not the boss of me, you know. I know, but I am. Quiet on set. A voice shouts, cutting off our conversation. Let's try this again. Give us a good one this time. We do. We give them a good one. Hell, we give them a few. But after nightfall, shit starts deteriorating again. Serena runs out of coke while I run out of patience for her attitude. Ah, uh, this sucks, she growls, messing up her hair as she clutches her head. I feel like shit. You're more cocaine than woman at this point, I say, frustrated that we're not through yet. I'm surprised you can feel anything anymore. You're such a prick, she snaps, shoving me. Oh, whoa, whoa. Cliff gets between us as she clenches a fist like she's about to swing at me. This is not happening. You're frustrated? Fine. Get a room and screw each other's brains out. But this? Oh, no, no, no. Not going down. What needs to go down is some detox, I say. Some counseling. Shove your judgment up your ass, Johnny, Serena says. Just because you went full-blown junkie doesn't mean the rest of us will, too. I'm fine. So why don't you worry about how much of a fuck-up you are and leave me alone? She storms off set, crying, and the shoot is postponed. Officially, because Serena Markson is under the weather. Unofficially? Turns out I'm an unsympathetic asshole. I run my hands down my face. Could this day get any worse? Never say that, Cliff says, because as soon as you say that, it'll get worse. I don't think that's possible. Look, give her time to calm down, he says. Give her time to calm down. We'll come back tomorrow with a clear head. I go to wardrobe getting out of the suit, grateful to be back in jeans and a t-shirt. I don't wait around after I'm changed, because I'm damn sure not riding in the limo back to the hotel with Serena. So I order a car and skirt past the lingering crowd to meet it on the corner, not wanting to wait for it to pass through security. A few folks catch up to me. I sign a few autographs, but turn down requests for photos, enough cameras flashing in my face. I hate the fucking paparazzi. I'm standing on the corner waiting. The car's a minute away. They're pelting me with personal questions that I do my best to ignore, although I want to sucker punch one of them when he asks about my father. Fuck him, I mutter under my breath. What did you say? The paparazzo asks. I said fuck him. Ah, that's going to be one hell of a soundbite. Before I can say anything else, they're screeching nearby, a group of fans rushing toward me. Shit. People are pushing, shoving as the crowd closes in around me, fans trying to get past the assholes with cameras who keep drowning them out with their inconsiderate questions. Nobody's watching what they're doing, and I'm losing my cool. Fast. I can't even meet my damn car on the street without this chaos. I sign some more stuff that's shoved in my face and I try to calm myself down, but these assholes do everything imaginable to antagonize me. Footage is worth more when I lose my temper. The same guy who asked about my father tries to get closer, to get a better angle, mowing a young girl over. She stumbles and I catch her, grabbing her by the arm. She can't be more than thirteen or fourteen. It pisses me off. Back the fuck off before you get someone hurt. I say, shoving the guy away, just to get some goddamn space. But it seems to trigger panic in the crowd. Some try to disperse, and that young girl dodges forward, out into the street, because there's nowhere else she can go. Shit. She doesn't even look. Headlights swallow her up, a horn blares. I can see the horror in her eyes. The girl fucking freezes. No. It's instinctual. I don't even think. She freezes and my feet move. I dart out into the street and grab the girl again, shoving her back to the sidewalk. She knocks into the crowd, losing her footing, but I have no chance to make sure she doesn't get trampled. I turn and the car is right there. Tires squealing, brakes screeching, bam. Everything feels like it's in slow motion. My brain doesn't register it right away. Flashes surround me as I fly backwards and then, holy fuck, pain. It's like a shock, every nerve ending in my body screaming as I slam into the asphalt. 
blackness. I'm blinking, but I can't make out much. People are yelling all around me, my head is pounding, their words are vibrating inside my skull and I want them all to shut the fuck up. Police lights and sirens, paparazzi cameras flashing, panicked screams from someone. I try to sit up, but something warm runs down my face, soaking my white shirt. I look down at it. Blood. The sight makes me woozy. Whoa. My vision goes black and then Cliff is there. I hear him before I see him, hear his warbled voice before his face greets me. Take it easy, Johnny. Don't move, we've got help coming. He looks worried. I wasn't worried. I wasn't, until I looked at him. Is she okay? I ask, my chest aching. Who? He asks. The girl, I say. She was in the street. There was a car coming. I don't know. Is she? Everyone's fine, he says, glancing around before turning back to me. They're freaked out, but nobody else is bleeding. What were you thinking? That she was going to get hit by a car. So you took her place? Jesus, Johnny. You're taking this superhero business way too personal. I laugh at that. It hurts. I close my eyes and grip my teeth. Where is that goddamn help? You're lucky. That's what the doctor said to me. It's your lucky day. But as I lay in the stark white hospital bed in the dim private room surrounded by people I don't care to look at, with security posted at every corner as phones ring and ring and fucking ring, I don't feel very lucky. This day has become unimaginably worse. Severe concussion, laceration to the temple, broken right wrist, bruised ribs, besides an array of cuts and scrapes, swelling in places that aren't happy about this shit. That's all that seems to be wrong with me. So, maybe I am lucky, but the voices all around me right now don't think so. My manager, a studio exec, the movie director, and a shitload of PR cram into the room, hashing out details of how to handle this nightmare. My lawyer is here, somewhere. I remember seeing him earlier. They're worried about lawsuits and insurance quotes and how this is going to impact the production, but I'm more worried about this sensation flowing through my veins at the moment. Fuck. It's the middle of the night and my head is swimming, my stomach queasy. I'm uneasy. My legs keep tingling and I feel like I'm starting to float outside of my body. Whatever drug they're pumping into my IV is strong. Too strong. I'm going numb. It's been a long time since I felt nothing. I press the call button over and over until the nurse bursts in, shoving her way past the crowd of suits to reach the bed. Cliff slips away from the others, approaching. Whatever this is, I say, motioning to the IV bags, I need taken off of it. The morphine? The nurse asks with confusion, setting her hand on my shoulder. Honey, you're going to want that. You'll be hurting without it. I can handle the pain, I say. Not so sure about the drugs. She looks even more confused now, so Cliff chimes in. Mr. Cunning is in recovery, so anything feel-good is problematic, if you get my drift. Oh, well, I'll speak to the doctor, she says. We'll see what we can do. I close my eyes as she rushes away. Regret hits me, gripping tight a voice in my mind saying, tell her you've made a mistake. But that's the addict in me screaming out, the pathetic son of a bitch that gets off on the numbness, that gets off on forgetting. But goddamn, the sensation feels good. Maybe I'll enjoy it for just a little while. I open my eyes again when Cliff nudges me, holding his Blackberry out, and I glance at the screen, reading the headline of a news article. When Fiction Meets Reality, Superhero Actor Saves Girl. I don't read any further. You'll be down for a while, Cliff says. They'll rearrange the shoots, do what they can do without you there. Production hopes to pick back up with you sometime before summer. Summer? It's barely spring right now. What am I supposed to do until then? Go easy on this superhero nonsense, for starters. Take a vacation. Go sit on a beach somewhere surrounded by beautiful women. The point is to rest, relax, recover. When's the last time you even had any fun? Fun? I consider that. Does jumping in front of a car count?
Previously. F your clubs, club meeting. There isn't much fun to be found at Fulton Edge, unless your idea of fun is politics. But once a week, on Friday afternoons, they have club meetings, which sucks slightly less than sitting in classes. Drama club. That's where you always go. They gather in the school auditorium, a mere two dozen people in a room meant for hundreds. The meeting has already started today when you stroll in. Not that it matters, since they're doing nothing but arguing. You stall in the aisle, staring at them scattered along the stage. The debate is what production to put on this year, Macbeth or Julius Caesar. You turn away from them, about to leave, when you catch sight of someone lurking in the back of the auditorium. It's her. The new girl. She's not paying attention to the meeting. Instead, she's reading. You're a few weeks into the school year, but this is the first time she's appeared in the auditorium. Curious, you stroll over, sliding into a nearby seat, leaving the one between you empty. She's reading a comic book. That takes you by surprise. Around Fulton Edge, you sort of expect to see copies of Atlas Shrugged. I haven't seen you in here before, you say. Hastings recruit you so he has enough people for his annual Shakespearean wank? She laughs, looking at you. You can probably count on your fingers the number of times you've seen the girl smile. Laughter has been even more rare. She shows up every day, keeps her head down, and she does whatever is necessary, always the first one here and the last one gone. But you can tell she's not happy, maybe even unhappier than you are, when you hate being here so much that if there's a chance for you not to be here, you take it and run. You've already missed six days of school in a little over a month. They find your father for your truancy, but otherwise they let you slide. I've tried all the others, she says. I suck at chess. Debate team was a disaster. Book club was reading something written by a fascist, and it turns out writing club is writing letters to Congress, so... So here you are. Here I am, she says, holding up her comic. Making my own club. Ah, the good old fuck-your-clubs club, you say. I'm tempted to start that one every year when these idiots start bickering. You're welcome to join me, she says. Might not be much fun, but it can't really be any worse, can it? No, it can't, you say, motioning to the stage. If this whole acting thing doesn't work out, I might take you up on that. Always need a fallback plan. The drama club settles on Julius Caesar for the fourth year in a row. And the argument shifts to who gets which role. Hastings, the self-appointed leader of the club, insists on being Caesar. He's a typical rich kid, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed grandson of a Watergate attorney. He wants to be the hero. He scowls as some of the others disagree, instead suggesting you do it. You're awfully popular with the drama crowd, she says, pausing when Hastings calls you, at best, an amateur. Well, with most of them. I played Caesar three years in a row, you say. Besides, I'm the only one here with an IMDb page. Her eyes are glued to your face. You're a real actor. At best, an amateur, you joke. I've had a few minor roles. Played a dead kid once on Law and Order. Wow, she says. Remind me to get your autograph later. You laugh at her deadpan. Mostly, I've done local theater. Started taking acting classes as soon as I was old enough. Haven't done anything lately, though, unless this counts. The words seem to be just falling from your lips, like talking to her comes natural. It counts, she says. Does it? You ask, and you're serious about that. Am I still an actor if I don't have an audience? Is a writer still a writer if nobody reads what they wrote? You consider that. 
The arguing on stage is growing louder, almost to the point of coming to blows. It amuses you on one hand, but mostly it fills you with a sense of sadness that this is what you look forward to. Your art is belittled down to a fight over who gets to be the hero in a high school production. Your dreams were always much bigger than that. I should intervene, you say, standing up, before somebody does something stupid and gets us shut down. Well, if that happens, the F Your Clubs Club is here. Make sure you hold my spot, you tell her, before heading up on stage to say, You know, I'd much rather be Brutus this year. Is that right? Hastings asks. Absolutely. You poke him dead center of the chest with your pointer finger, hard enough that he takes a step back. It would be my pleasure to be the one who takes you down. The others divide up the rest of the parts. They took so long making decisions that there's no time to get the scripts today. You have the entire thing memorized, though. So does Hastings. The two of you spit lines back and forth for a bit, things growing heated. The girl remains seated in the back of the auditorium, no longer reading her comic book. She watches your every move, absorbing every syllable. You have an audience today as you act your heart out, and she's captivated. When the day ends, people leave, but you're in no hurry. You stroll down the aisle to where the girl still sits. She watches you approach and says, If what I just witnessed is any indication, you might have been the best dead kid law and order has ever seen. You sit down with her, laughing. There's no space between the two of you now. It was a parents are monsters behind closed doors storyline. I had a handful of lines. I was five. Wow, she says. When I was five, I couldn't even remember how to spell my own name, and you were already memorizing dialogue. Ah, uh, well, I have a good memory, you say. Besides, it's easier when things are relatable. You don't elaborate. She doesn't ask you what you mean by that. She's fidgeting with her comic book, thumbing through pages. Silence surrounds you, but it isn't awkward. She's nervous, though. Nervous, sitting so close to you. So, you like comic books. You pluck the one from her hand. Breezio. Breezio. Ghosted. Issue four of five. Have you read it? She asks. Never heard of it, you say, flipping through the thing. Looks shitty. She snatches the comic right back. How dare you! Blasphemous! Okay, fine, I retract that. Laughing, you grab the comic book again. She reluctantly releases it. So, what? He's some kind of superhero? Something like that, she says. He was a normal guy, but he caught an experimental virus that's making him disappear. Like a ghost, you say, glancing at the pictures. Yeah, so he's just doing what he can to save the girl he loves while he has the chance. Huh, let me guess. They find a cure and live happily ever after? It's not over yet. There's still one more issue left. But you have the others. Yes. Bring them to me, you say. Let me read them. She gives you a horrified look. Why in the world would I do that? Because we're in Fuck Your Clubs Club together. You didn't join. I still might. She rolls her eyes as she gets up to leave. You walk her to the front of the school. Nearly everyone is gone, just a handful of students remaining. A maroon-colored Honda is parked along the right-hand side of the circular driveway, a man approaching the building. She tenses, feet stalling when she notices him. Dad! You're early. Figured you'd appreciate not having to hang out here on a Friday, the man says, smiling until his gaze shifts to you, standing awfully close to his daughter. His eyes narrow as he holds his hand out to introduce himself. Michael Garfield. Jonathan, you say, shaking his hand, leaving it at that, but it's a pointless omission. Cunningham, her dad says. 
I know who you are. I work for your father. Wasn't aware you knew my daughter, though. She hasn't mentioned it. Disapproval is evident in every syllable of those words. You have a reputation with the people who work for your father, and it's not a good one. You knew he went here, Dad, she grumbles, face reddening with embarrassment that he's making this a thing. It's a small school. You don't say anything as she drags her father away. She's about to climb into the passenger seat of his car when you step forward, calling out to her. Hey, Garfield. She stalls, turning to you. Her father glares from behind the wheel. You forgot this, you say, holding up her comic book. She grabs it, but you don't let go right away, hesitating as she says, Please don't call me that. Call me anything but that. You release your hold, and she gives you a smile before climbing into the car and leaving, taking her comic book. You don't know this, but that girl? She gathers up her Breezio comics as soon as she gets home. All 14 issues in all three storylines, Transparent, Shadow Dancer, and Ghosted. She spends the weekend rereading them just so they're still fresh in her mind, so when she brings them to school for you to borrow, she remembers every single line. 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 Five. Kennedy. In entertainment news, Breezio star Johnny Cunning was involved in an accident last night in Manhattan. I'm halfway to the kitchen when those words strike me, my footsteps stopping. I turn around, looking at the television across the living room, thinking I must have heard them wrong. But no. There he is, stock footage playing from some red carpet, his smiling face on the screen, bloodshot eyes staring right through me. The 28-year-old actor was struck by a car near the set of his latest film. Eyewitnesses say Cunning stepped into traffic during an altercation with the paparazzi. I approach the TV as the image on the screen changes, a video of the aftermath playing. The first thing I see is blood streaming down his face. He's alert, though. He's alive. The relief that floods my body nearly buckles my knees. A spokesman for the actor says he's currently stable and in good spirits. Filming for the movie has been temporarily suspended as Cunning heals from his injuries. Mommy? The second that I hear Maddie's voice, I press the button to turn off the TV, hoping she hadn't seen it. I turn to her, my hopes dashed right away. Oh, crap. She looks shocked. Yes, sweetheart? Is Breezio okay? Sure, I say, giving her a smile. He had a little accident, but he'll be okay. You mean, like he's sick? Something like that, I say. Her expression shifts as she thinks about that, her face lighting up. I can make him a card. Uh, yeah, you can, I say, not letting my smile falter. I'm sure we can find an address to send it to. His agency accepts fan mail for him. I'm pretty sure he doesn't personally open it, so there's no harm sending something if it'll make her feel better. Maddie runs off to her bedroom to get to work on some art while I get busy making dinner, booting up my old piece-of-crap laptop while a frozen pizza cooks. For the first time in well over a year, I type his pseudonym into the search bar. I take a deep breath when the results pop up. Pictures and pictures. Whoa. So many pictures, along with a video of the accident. My heart drops as I stare at it. I press play and watch. Thirty seconds. I hold my breath, expecting the worst from him. Drunken, staggering into traffic with no regard for his life, maybe. But instead, I see him shove a man, telling him to back off when a girl gets caught between them. The girl goes into the road, and his reflexes are fast. So fast as he grabs her and shoves her back onto the sidewalk before... Cringing, 
I slam the laptop closed the second the car strikes him. He saved that girl from being hit. I sit there in silence, stunned. My nose starts twitching, the smell of something burning tickling my nostrils. It takes a moment, too long of a moment, before my eyes start to burn and it strikes me. Dinner. I run for the oven, turning it off and open the door. The smoke detector starts blaring and I make a face, fanning the smoke away. The pizza is charred. Mommy, what's stinky? Maddie asks, strolling into the kitchen with a stack of paper and her box of crayons, her nose scrunched up. Had a bit of a mishap, I say, glaring at the burnt pizza. Maybe we'll just order some pizza for delivery. And chickens, she declares, climbing onto a chair at the table. And the breads, too. Pizza, wings, and garlic bread. Got it. I pick up the phone and call the closest pizza place, ordering the whole gauntlet. Can't afford to splurge, but what the hell, right? After hanging up, I sit down with her, staring at her paper as she draws Brizio. She's good. Talented. She could be an artist. She could be anything she wanted. I know, because she's not just my daughter. His blood flows through her veins, too. He was the dreamer, the doer, the believer. When he wasn't high, when he wasn't drunk, when he wasn't so utterly screwed up, I saw something in him, something I see when I look at Maddie. The two of them? They have the same soul. They live with the same heart. And that scares the daylights out of me. Mommy, what kind of sick is Brizio? Where does it hurt? Uh, I'm not sure, I say. All over, maybe. Johnny, you know, the real guy that plays Brizio, got hurt by a car when he was helping a girl. But he'll get better. She looks at me, her eyes guarded. She's worried about her hero. I've tried to explain the difference between reality and the movies, to prepare her just in case. But I'm not sure if she gets it. He'll get better, I tell her. Don't worry, sweetheart. I just... I can't believe this, Bethany says, standing beside me in the aisle as I restock canned goods. She leans against the shelf, nose buried in the latest edition of Hollywood Chronicles. The entire thing is dedicated to Jonathan. Story after story, speculation and theories, drugs alcohol? Maybe he was feeling suicidal. I have no interest in reading any of that nonsense, but Bethany insists on spilling every nitty-gritty detail while on her lunch break. You know, you're supposed to pay for that before you read it, I tell her. This isn't a library. She rolls her eyes, flipping the page. You sound like my mother when you say that. I make a face. I'm... Not that old. You sound it. Whatever, I mumble. I'm just saying. You're saying either put up or shut up. She closes the magazine as she pretend gags. I've already read about as much as I can take anyway. Who even buys this junk? She does, I think. I've seen her buying copies. She's quiet for a moment as I work before she asks... You don't believe any of it, do you? Believe what? Any of this, she says, waving the paper around. I believe my opinion doesn't really matter. But where Johnny Cunning is concerned, anything is possible, right? I cut my eyes at her when she tosses my own words at me. Right. She frowns, defeated, and goes back to her register. I finish what I'm doing, trying to shove all of it out of my mind. When three o'clock comes, I clock out, grabbing a few groceries and heading to checkout. I have to be back here in an hour for inventory, giving me just enough time to see Maddie after school and get her settled at my father's. I pay, and am about to leave when I notice the Hollywood Chronicles paper tucked beside Bethany's register, meaning she bought it. Look, 
you met Johnny Cunning, right? I ask. And he was nice to you? Yes. Then that's all that matters, isn't it? Whatever that trash says about him being horrible, you felt different. Don't let some guy sitting behind a computer spinning sensational stories change what you believe. She smiles. I don't linger. I cringe, honestly. As if to make the moment worse for me, Cher's Believe starts playing on the supermarket radio, and I figure that's my cue to leave. The soundtrack to my life needs a serious update. Getting into my car, I drive to my father's house, pulling into his driveway as the school bus arrives. My father's sitting on the front porch in his rocking chair as he stares out at the neighborhood. Ah, there's my girl, he says, shoving to his feet, holding his arms open. Maddie runs to him for a hug, dragging her backpack along the ground. Guess what, Grandpa? She says, not giving him time to guess before she continues. I seen that Breezio got sick in an accident, so Mommy told me I could draw him a picture. My father's eyes go wide as he shoots me a look. I told her we'd find an address and mail it to him. I explain. You know, like fan mail. Makes sense. You want to draw one, Grandpa? Maddie asks. I bet mine would be better, but you can try too. He scowls at her. What makes you think yours would be better? Because I'm best at drawing, she says. You're good too, but Mommy can't draw. Hey, I say defensively. I can draw some seriously cool stars. Maddie dramatically rolls her eyes, making sure I see it, announcing, That don't count, before making her way inside. You heard the girl, my father says, grinning and nudging me when I join him on the porch. Your stars don't count, kiddo. After I get Maddie settled in, sandwiches made for her and my father as they hunker down at the kitchen table with paper and crayons, a fresh chocolate cream pie sitting on the counter. Don't think I didn't notice. I press a kiss to the top of her head. I've got to go back to work, sweetheart. I'll see you tonight. It's starting to drizzle when I head outside. Ugh, <sighs> what is it with all this rain lately? Pulling out my keys, I start off the porch when I sense movement. I turn in the direction of my car, my footsteps coming to an abrupt stop. My heart drops right to my toes, my stomach nodding. I lose my breath in that instant, caught by surprise when I see the familiar face. Oh, God. Everything in me says, run, 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 get away while you have the chance but I can't even move. He's wearing jeans and a black t-shirt, a hat on his head. A black leather jacket is draped over his shoulders, his right arm tucked into a sling. His skin is battered and bruised, but it's him. Jonathan Cunningham. He's wearing sunglasses, so I can't see his eyes, but I can feel his gaze clawing at my skin. He doesn't speak, looking about as tense at the moment as I feel. My insides are wound tight. My chest hurts as I inhale sharply. Hey, he says after a moment of strained silence. That simple word, enough to make me woozy. What do you want? I ask, sparing a greeting, my tone harsher than I mean it to be. I just thought, he glances past me at the house. I thought maybe. No, I say, that word flying from my lips. He sighs, his chest rising and falling as he lowers his head. Can we at least talk? You want to talk? Just a conversation, he says. That's all I'm asking for. Just a minute of your time. To talk? Yes. So much of me wants to say no again. The bitterness that has rooted deep inside of me yearns to shut him down. But I can't. As much as I might think I want to, I can't say no without at least listening to him. Because this isn't about me, regardless of how personal it all feels. It's about that little girl inside the house, pouring her soul into a picture for a man she still thinks is a hero. 
Please, he asks, encouraged by my silence, by the fact that I haven't told him to leave yet. Take pity on a banged-up guy? You want my pity? I want anything you're willing to offer me. Look, I can't do this right now, I say, stepping off the porch and onto the walkway. I'm going to be late. Then, afterward, he says, or tomorrow, or the next day, whenever you decide, whenever is good for you, I'll be there. I'll be there. How many times have I yearned to hear those words? I don't even know if he means them. I slowly approach, pausing beside my car, a mere few feet separating the two of us. I get off work tonight at nine. If you've got something to say to me, you can say it then, but for now... He takes a step back, nodding. You need me to leave. Please. I slip past him, climbing into the driver's seat of my car, watching in the rearview mirror as he hesitates before walking away. He leaves on foot, his steps slow. I don't know where he came from. I don't know where he's going. I don't know what he expects from me. I don't know why my heart's racing. I don't know why I feel like crying. I drive to work after he's gone and get there a few minutes late, but nobody says anything about it. I'm lost in my head, distracted, wondering what he's doing and what he could be planning to say. I'm not sure words exist that can make any of this better, but there are a few that could make things worse. Kennedy! I flinch and turn toward the sound of Bethany's voice in the doorway to the stock room. What? I've been standing here talking to you for like five minutes and you weren't even listening, she laughs. Anyway, I just wanted to say goodnight. Leaving early tonight. More like late. I thought you got off at nine. I did, she says, glancing at her phone as it starts ringing. Well, my ride is here, so I'm out. Confused, I glance at the clock. It's almost 9.30. I lost track of time. Shoving everything aside, I clock out, avoiding conversation with Marcus. I need to get back to my father's house before Jonathan shows up. Halfway to my car, my footsteps falter when I spot him. He's here. Jonathan is perched on the hood of my car in the darkened parking lot, his head lowered, the hat shielding his face from view. He hasn't seen me yet. I approach, studying him as I do. If you want to see someone's true colors, take a peek at who they are when they think they're alone. He's fidgety, can't seem to sit still. Nervous, I think. Anxious? Or maybe he's just high. I'm almost right in front of him when he finally notices. He tenses as he stands up. No sunglasses this time, but he's not meeting my gaze. How do you know where I work? His eyes lower, like he's ogling my chest, so I glance down and roll my eyes at myself. Work uniform. Duh. I'm a walking advertisement for the Piggly Q. I probably shouldn't have shown up here, but I was worried you might try to avoid me, he admits, that you'd blow me off. So you weren't going to give me the chance? He laughs awkwardly. Guess you can say that. Yeah, well, that's not me. I told you we could talk, so here I am. I appreciate it, he says, still fidgeting, his attention on the parking lot. I, uh, I didn't really think I'd make it this far. I figured you'd shut me down right away. Run me out of town with my tail tucked between my legs like every other time. Don't do that, I say as I cross my arms over my chest. Don't act like I'm the bad guy here. No, you're right. I didn't mean... He sighs as he trails off, rubbing the back of his neck with his left hand. Silence festers between us for a moment. It's so quiet I can hear crickets chirping in the distance. Do you... Think we could go somewhere? Sit down for a bit, somewhere more private. Look at me. 
I say, ignoring his question, because he hasn't made eye contact with me yet. I need you to look at me, Jonathan. He doesn't. Instead, he sits back down on the hood of my car, mumbling, Jonathan, it's been a long time since anybody has called me that. Oh, right, I say, unlocking the driver's side door, because I don't have it in me to stand here and play games with him. Johnny Cunning. Almost forgot that's who you are now. I'm still the same person, he says quietly. And who exactly is that? I ask. Are we talking about Speaker Cunningham's son? The dreamer, the believer, the one who never let anything hold him back. Or maybe we're talking about the alcoholic. You know, the cokehead. I don't do that anymore. Why should I believe you? Because it's the truth. His left hand slips into his pocket to pull something out. It reflects the parking lot lights as he holds it up. A shiny bronze coin, not much bigger than a quarter. A sobriety chip. I don't know what to say. Everything gets quiet again. My fingertips brushing against his when I take it from him. It's solid metal, a triangle etched in the face of it the Roman numeral one in the center with recovery written along the bottom. One year sober. People saw you coming out of a bar last week. That doesn't mean I drank. I wanted to, but I didn't. I won't. He pauses, his voice quieter when he says, I can't. I want to believe him. I wish I could. Once upon a time, I believed everything that flowed from this man's lips, but it's hard to give his words any weight after what we went through. Then why won't you look at me? I ask. You say that. You want me to believe it, yet you won't even look me in the eyes. Because I've fucked things up with you, he says. Do you know how hard it is to face you right now? I know nothing can erase what I've done, but I need you to know how sorry I am. Sorry. It isn't the first time he's apologized. He does it every single time. But he was messed up then. Always. And I'm not sure if he is right now, because the sobriety chip weighs heavy in my hand, but his eyes still won't meet mine. I'm sorry for the way I hurt you, he says. Sorry for everything I did that led us to this point, and I get it, you know, if you hate me wouldn't blame you at all. But I just need to tell you, I need you to know, that even when I was completely fucked up, I never once stopped loving you. Those words, they rip the air from my lungs. I clench my hands into fists, the bronze coin digging into my palm. I don't expect you'll believe that. He shoves up from my car, his eyes finally meeting mine, and they're bright blue and so clear. But it only lasts a few seconds before his gaze returns to the ground. But that's not the point. Point is, I'm not perfect, but I'm doing the best I can. I don't know shit about being a father, but I hope you'll give me the chance to try. Tomorrow, the next day, someday, whenever it is, I'll be there. He starts to walk away with that, like he said all he can and he has nothing more to offer. Jonathan, I call out. Your chip. Keep it. What? I know how I'm doing. I don't need a token to tell me, but maybe you do, so keep it. I stare down at the coin in the glow of the streetlight. I don't know what to think. I don't know what to say. I don't know where he's going or how long he really plans to stay. At the moment, I don't know much of anything except that he's here in front of me, telling me everything I've yearned to hear for a long, long time, and I'm letting him walk away like it all means nothing. Jonathan, I call out again. He pauses and glances over his shoulder at me. I, uh... I'm glad you're okay, I say. I saw about the accident, about what you did, helping that girl, and I just... I'm glad you're okay. 
He smiles slightly. A familiar smile, one that's filled with so much sadness. I'm going to stick around for a while. Lay low in town. I'm staying over at the Landing Inn. Mrs. McCleskey's place, I ask. She rented to you? A light laugh escapes him. She wasn't thrilled about it, but I needed somewhere private. It took some convincing and one hell of a security deposit to get her to go along with it. I bet, I say, imagining how the woman must have looked when he showed up seeking out sanctuary. So, that's where I'll be, he says, if you're looking for me. He doesn't wait around for a response, limping away. It's a little over a mile from where I work to where he's going. Memories of my mother's voice nag at me. The angel on my shoulder telling me I should have offered him a ride. But instead, I listen to the devil, sounding a hell of a lot like my father when he says, Never get in a car with a stranger. I'm still not sure who he is right now. Maddie's asleep when I get to my father's house, sprawled out on her back on the couch. My father is sitting at the kitchen table, sipping a cup of coffee. Decaf. He looks up when I walk in, eyes following me until I drop down in a chair across from him. Crayons and papers are scattered along the tabletop, an envelope dead center of it all addressed to Brizio in bright red. The return address says, Maddie at Grandpa's. It's not sealed, but I can tell she tried, a stamp crookedly slapped in the corner upside down. I pick the envelope up and pull out the sloppily folded paper, gazing at it. It's a get well card, the words written in capitals up top, a frowny face drawing of Brizio below it. She drew herself beside him smiling, handing him what looks like a bunch of yellow flowers, a short message written below that. I saw you got sick in an accident. You should get better, and you should come back, because Mommy says nobody always is gone. It will make you happy and me too. Love, Maddie. Sighing, I fold the paper back up, shoving it away, setting the envelope down on the table. My father's watching me, still sipping his coffee. Waiting me out, I can tell. He probably spent all evening helping her make that, telling her how to spell all the words. Jonathan showed up tonight, I say. Wanted to talk. And did you? I reach into my pocket for the coin he gave me, sliding it across the table to my father. He picks it up, letting out a low whistle, a peculiar look flickering across his face as he stands up. Pride. That probably shouldn't surprise me. I shouldn't be surprised about any of this, but I am. Strolling across the kitchen, he sets his coffee cup in the sink before leaning back against the counter, staring at the coin. Not far from where he stands, a set of keys hang on a hook, a similar coin affixed to them, converted into a keychain. Twenty years sober. My father spent the first few years of my life struggling with alcohol. I only have vague memories of that time. He got clean before it was too late to be a dad, he always said, and I know that's what he's thinking about right now. You're looking lost again, kiddo, he says, as I start cleaning up the mess on the table, shoving the crayons back into the box. I'm feeling it. I admit. He doesn't offer me any advice. I've never been good at listening to it. Had I taken his advice years ago, I would have never ended up in this situation. But I have no regrets, despite everything, and he knows that. Regardless of what happened, Maddie came out of it, and she's worth every moment of heartache. We all do what we have to, my father says setting the coin down on the table in front of me. I'm heading to bed. Thank you, I say, for watching Maddie. Anytime, he says. My girls are my everything. Wouldn't have it any other way, but any other way, but any other way, but any other way, but any other way.
but any other way, but any other. Six, Jonathan. There's this thing about paparazzi. They're everywhere. Airports, stores, sitting outside of houses, lurking around hotel hallways and scoping out sets. I've caught them climbing trees to look in windows and digging through bags of trash. For what? Who knows? But it's a fact of life for someone like me. They're always around, always watching. And nine times out of ten, they're fucking mean. I've been in Bennett Landing for 24 hours now. It's the first time in a long time I've gone an entire day without being ambushed. But as I step through the door of landing in after ten o'clock in the evening, I get that intuitive feeling that eyes are watching. Glancing through the foyer, I see McCleskey coming out of the kitchen. Her stern expression aims my way. Mr. Cunningham? I nod in greeting, warding off a cringe when she calls me that. Ma'am? It's late, she says. Have you eaten dinner? I shake my head. Well, don't expect me to cook for you, she says. You want to eat? Show up at a decent hour. Yes, ma'am. I say quietly as she stalks off to do whatever it is she does when she's not tending to guests, since I'm her only one. Convincing her to let me stay here had been hard enough. When she realized I was renting the entire inn, indefinitely, meaning she wouldn't have anybody else, she nearly threw me out of my ass. Only reason she didn't was because I looked pathetic. And keep the noise down, she hollers. I'm heading to bed. Yes, ma'am. I say again, strolling to the kitchen. I don't flick on the light. There's enough of a glow from a few night lights for me to see where I'm going. I haven't eaten much since the accident. Hell, if I'm being honest, I haven't had an appetite in years. Opening the fridge door, I see a small platter on the top shelf holding a few sandwiches covered in plastic wrap. A scrap of paper rests on top. The words, You're welcome, scribbled on it. Grabbing a sandwich, I head upstairs, taking a bite as I go. Hearing McCluskey shout from her room, You get crumbs on the carpet, you're vacuuming. Yes, ma'am. I mumble as I shake my head, still chewing. I've never been one to worry about things like karma, but I have a damn funny feeling I'm being hit with a hefty dose of it here. It's morning. The sun is shining. Bright light spills through the open blinds covering the windows, streaming through the thin white curtains, warming the room. I haven't slept more than a few minutes here or there, short bursts that felt like mere seconds as my eyes fell closed, before reality shook me back awake. The reality of being back in this town. The reality of having seen her again. There's a knock on the bedroom door, but I ignore it. It's just shy of 8 a.m., too early for me to deal with whatever bullshit is on today's agenda. Another knock, and then the door flings open. I drape my left arm over my eyes and let out a groan when McCleskey barges in. You've got a visitor, she says. Nobody even knows I'm here. Somebody does or they wouldn't be here to see you, huh? She walks out, leaving the door open. I lay in silence for a moment before moving my arm. Visitor? Only one person knows I'm in town. Kennedy. Shoving to my feet, I stagger from the room and make my way downstairs. She's standing in the foyer, dressed in a work uniform, looking nervous. She glances up at me when she notices I'm here, a look on her face that makes my chest feel so fucking heavy. Distrust shines from her eyes, always guarded now, like she's just waiting. Waiting for me to fuck up, waiting for me to hurt her. Hey, I say, pausing in the foyer in front of her. I didn't expect to see you again so soon. Yeah, well, you know. She mumbles, not finishing her thought, averting her gaze and looking all around me, like she's searching for some sort of out. Do you want to sit down? I offer, motioning toward the den area, pretty sure McCleskey wouldn't mind. No, I can't stay. I just have something to give you. Okay. She stands there, quiet for a moment, biting the inside of her cheek like she used to do when we were kids. Kids. I still think of us that way sometimes. Or, well, me, anyway. She grew up way too fast, but me. Never quite made it past being that stupid 18-year-old with little morals and big dreams. Reaching into her back pocket, she pulls out an envelope. Red crayon scribbled along the outside. My stomach drops. Is that? 
She nods. I don't even have to finish the question. Carefully, she holds the envelope out, her voice soft when she says, I told her we'd mail it, but since you're here... Thank you, I say, staring down at it. It's addressed to Brizio. Does she... No, she says, picking up what I can't bring myself to finish. She doesn't know you're her father. She, um... She thinks heroes are real. No matter how many times I explain, they're just people. And she looks at you like you're one of them. She's too young to see you any other way, which is why... She trails off. I know where it's going, which is why it's so hard for her to give me that chance. Because if I turn out to be anything but that hero, it's going to crush her. And I know she doesn't mean that in a theatrical sense. Nobody expects me to wear the suit and turn fucking invisible but I've got one hell of a track record when it comes to disappointing people. I get it, I say, and I know it's a lot, asking for your trust. But you're not going away this time? No. I figure that might piss her off, me pushing for this, but she lets out a deep breath, her posture relaxing. Well, I should get to work. I just wanted to drop that off. Oh, yeah, okay. After she's gone, I open the envelope and pull out the piece of paper, looking at it. She drew me a picture. I read her words and can feel my chest tightening, my eyes burning. But God damn it, I'm grinning like a fool. I can't help it. You look like the cat that caught the canary, McCleskey says, popping up in the foyer, eavesdropping. Yeah, she dropped this off, I say, waving the paper at her. It's from Madison. Ah, little Maddie, she says. A bit of a handful, that kid. But what do you expect? Look at her parents. Previously. The field trip trouble. She gives you the comic books on a Wednesday afternoon. It's after school and you're standing out front, waiting to be picked up when she pulls the thick stack of comics from her bag. She's been carrying them around with her for three days, gathering the nerve to approach you. You're different this week. She senses it. You're quieter, withdrawn, yet somehow your presence feels larger than ever. There's anger in your eyes and tension in your jaw. You've barely even looked at her. You barely look at anyone. She shoves the comics at you, and you stare at them, confused. A moment passes before there's recognition. You mumble, Thanks. That's it. You're gone a minute later. You don't come to school the next day. Friday afternoon, you show up at lunchtime. You walk right through the front door of the school, not bothering to check in at the office. You stroll through the halls, bypassing the cafeteria, instead heading for the library where she is. She always spends her lunch hour among the tall stacks of books, never eating or being with other people. She's sitting alone at a long wooden table, nose buried in her notebook. You approach her, asking, What are you writing? Right away, she slams the notebook closed, dropping her pen on top of it. She stares at you, not answering that question. You drop the stack of comic books on the table. Her attention turns to them as she asks, did you even read any of them? Read all of them, you say, pulling the chair out beside her, but you don't sit down in it. No. Instead, you slide up onto the table, sitting there with your sneaker-clad feet planted on the chair. You're not wearing the black shoes that go with your uniform. They were better than I expected. I'm kind of pissed I have to wait to see how it ends. Now you know how I feel, she says, fiddling with the comics, putting them in order. I'm surprised you read them. I told you I wanted to. I thought you were just humoring me. Why would I do that? Because that's what everyone does, she says. I don't know if you've noticed, but I don't fit in around here. People aren't mean, but they aren't nice, either. They just tolerate my presence. Well... I don't know if you've noticed, you counter. But I'm not their favorite person either. Some of them hate me. 
most ignore me. Used to be they humored me, but now? Hell, look at me. I could sit here like this all day and nobody would say a word, like I'm invisible. Like Brizio, she says. You've disappeared. You nod. That's how it feels. She smiles. I don't know if it makes a difference, but I see you. Silence falls between the two of you. It isn't awkward. It almost feels comfortable. She starts tinkering with the pen on top of her notebook. You stare at it for a moment. Are you not going to tell me what you were writing? She shakes her head. You write in that notebook all the time. It isn't a question, but she answers anyway. Almost every day. What, is it a journal? Like a diary or something? You ask, and her cheeks turn pink as she lowers her head. Ha, <laughs> it is, isn't it? Have you written anything about me? You reach for the notebook, but she snatches it away. The pink on her cheeks is full-blown red now. It's not a diary. It's a story. A story, you say. What kind of story? The kind you write, she says. Or, well, the kind I do because I am. I'm writing a story. She fumbles her way through that explanation. You laugh. Yeah, but what kind? Drama? Action? Mystery? All of that, she says. It's a bit of everything. Does that include romance? She doesn't answer, throwing a question back instead. Why are you so interested? Because I am, you say. Would you rather I just humored you? No. She's quick with that answer. She's blushing again. There's noise outside the library. Students roam the halls. Lunchtime is coming to an end. You shove off of the table, getting to your feet. Looking around, you sigh deeply before your eyes meet hers. You want to get out of here? Her brow furrows. Get out of the library. No, I mean, get out of this hellhole, you say. My car is parked outside if you want to go. She gives you a look, one that says she thinks you're joking, but once you pull a set of keys from your pocket, she realizes you're serious. Club meetings are starting, you say. It's not like you're missing anything. Besides, what's life without a little adventure? Might give you some inspiration for your story. We'll call it a fuck your club's field trip. You walk away. She hesitates, just a moment before grabbing her things and following, falling in step beside you. Her eyes dart around the parking lot. We won't get in trouble, will we? No promises, you say. Despite your answer, she doesn't waver. You drive a blue Porsche. It's not as flashy as some of the other cars, but it's enough to make her pause. Wow. She's fidgeting as she gets in the car. You don't waste time driving away. You head into Albany, going through a drive through to grab some lunch. You buy her a sandwich and a chocolate milkshake, although she insists you don't have to. She has no money. Food in hand, you head to a theater in town. You lead her inside, slipping through a back door. People are everywhere. A dress rehearsal is in progress. Looks are cast your way, a few people greeting you as they rush past. This isn't your first time coming here. They're confused, though, when they look at her. Like her presence is something they can't fathom. She hesitates, so you grab her hand and pull her through, letting go once you're clear of the crowd. She stares at her hand as the two of you take seats out in the empty theater. You eat and chat and watch the rehearsal. A Dr. Seuss musical. She sips her milkshake, laughing at the cat in the hat, causing chaos on stage, and you get so lost in the moment that time slips away. We need to go, you tell her. It's three o'clock. Even rushing, you barely make it back to the school before the day is over. You park your car, but you don't get very far. An administrator is lurking. Hastings saw you leaving together and tattled.
Cunningham, Garfield. The man looks between you. My office, now. Twenty minutes later, the two of you are sitting in that office when both fathers show up. They walk in together, neither man smiling as the administrator explains the situation. Your father says nothing. He just stands there, listening. Her father, on the other hand, is fuming. His nostrils flare as he yells, What the hell were you thinking? Skipping? Do you know what it costs me to send you here? And how many times do I have to tell you never to get in a car with a stranger? Are you crazy? She stares down at her hands, biting her cheek, not answering his questions. Three days of detention. That's the punishment. You all walk out together. It's sudden, out of nowhere, as your father's calm mask slips. Right in front of the school, he says not a word, but he swings, hitting you in the chest with a closed fist. It's hard enough that the girl hears it from a few feet in front of you, hard enough that her father hears it, too. They both turn to look. The blow knocks the air from your lungs. You fight to catch your breath, grabbing your chest, but you're not surprised at all. This isn't some fluke. Go straight home, your father says, his voice calm, even as he gets right in your face. I hope you know this isn't over. We'll deal with it later. With that, he walks away. You linger a moment, your gaze drifting to her before you leave. You don't know this, but that girl, she cries the entire way home from school. She isn't crying because she got in trouble. It isn't out of guilt or shame. Her tears have nothing to do with herself. She cries for you because of the look she saw on your face when you walked away. There's anger in your eyes again and tension in your jaw. And now she knows what that means. What that means, what that means, what that means, what that. Seven. Kennedy. Surprise! I'm caught off guard as that word rings out behind me, startlingly close in the aisle. Spinning around, eyes wide, I nearly slam right into a lurking body. All six foot three of him wearing a straight black suit, looking the epitome of tall, dark, and handsome. Whoa. It didn't scare you, did I? He asks. You looked like you were in your own little world. Almost didn't want to interrupt. Oh, no, I'm just... Surprised to see you, I admit. Gazing at him. Drew. What are you doing here? Came to see you, he says. Haven't heard from you since you canceled our last date. I tried calling, but figured you were busy with work, so I thought I'd stop by. Maybe buy you lunch. I frown. I just took a break. Pity, he says. Maybe dinner. Maybe, I say. I'll see if I can get somebody to watch Maddie. Or you could bring her he suggests, holding his hands up defensively when I cut my eyes at him. Or not. I'm sure my dad won't mind, I say. If he's busy, I know Megan will be happy to do it. Megan, he says, making a face at the mention of her. Oh, don't be that way, I nudge him, laughing. She's been a lifesaver. I don't know what I'd do without her. I do, he says. I know what I'd do without her. Be nice. He mock salutes me. Drew is... Well, what can I say about him? He isn't the easiest person to warm up to, but once you get to know him, he can be kind of charming. Sarcastic. A bit rash, but unshakably determined. We've been acquainted for years, but it wasn't until recently when I ran into him while out somewhere with Megan that I opened myself up to the possibility of anything happening between us. It makes sense, you know? I'm busy. He's busy. He's one of the few people that I don't feel compelled to hide my secrets from. He hates my best friend, though, so that's a big strike against him, and the feeling is mutual— 
that might have something to do with the fact that Megan's as protective as bulletproof armor. I'll call you, I tell him, as soon as I know. Good. Reaching over, he nudges my chin. I'll see you. I wait until he's gone before pulling out my phone, shooting a text to Megan quickly, since I'm on the clock. Any chance you're free to watch Maddie tonight so I can steal some adult time? The bubble pops up, her response coming through. I can be there by six. Who's the lucky prick? Laughing, I type, who do you think? Before shoving my phone back in my pocket, not bothering to look at it when it vibrates with a message, knowing it'll be a stream of disgruntled emojis with a few choice curse words thrown in. You know, for emphasis. There's a knock at the apartment door, but before I can answer it, the door flings right open and in waltzes Megan. She's nearly six feet tall in her shiny red stilettos, at odds with a drab gray dress suit she wears, like she's not sure if she's going to work or heading out to a party. And that's Megan for you. Bright red lips and perfectly messy blonde hair, the kind that looks like she doesn't care, but I know she spent an hour in the bathroom getting it that way. Her blue eyes narrow, pointed right at me. She's trying hard to look mad, but she doesn't have it in her, cracking right away as she makes a face. Really? Andrew? Could be worse, I say. Could also be better, she counters. Wouldn't be hard, you know. Few people are worse than Andrew. Before I can argue, Maddie runs out of her bedroom. Aunt Megan! Hey, Candy Doodle Pumpkin Bread! she says, scooping Maddie up and swinging her around in circles as she slathers kisses all over her face. How's my favorite little munchkin doing today? Maddie giggles, trying to ward off the kisses. Guess what, Aunt Megan? What? she asks as she stops twirling, now swaying. Dizzy. Bricio got in an accident, so I made him a card and Mommy says she got it to him. Is that right? Megan asks, raising her eyebrows as she regards me, setting Maddie back down. Mommy gave it to Brizio, did she? Yep. Maddie turns to me. Right, Mommy? Right, I say, giving her a smile, knowing I'm about to have to explain in a few seconds, so it's best she gets out of here. Why don't you go draw Megan a picture? I'm sure she'd love one. Wouldn't want her getting jealous. After Maddie runs off, I head for the kitchen, Megan tromping along behind me. You gonna spill, or do I have to call for a special prosecutor? I think she summed it up nicely, I say, scouring through the fridge and the cabinets, pulling out stuff to throw together a quick dinner. She drew him a picture. I gave it to him. How? I cut my eyes at her and continue what I'm doing. Son of a bitch, she growls, dropping down into a chair at the kitchen table. He showed up again, didn't he? He actually had the balls to show his face. He said he wanted to talk. So you talked to him? Yes. Megan covers her face with her hands. You're right. It could be worse. Could be much worse. So go and enjoy your night. Because compared to that, Andrew is perfect. I wouldn't say all that, I mumble. She shakes her head, eyeing me warily as I preheat the oven. What are you doing? Throwing something together for dinner? Why? Don't you have a date? Yeah, but Maddie hasn't eaten yet, and Drew won't be here for an hour, so... So that gives you just enough time to get ready, she says. I can handle dinner. No big deal. Are you sure? Positive, she says. Go put on something that'll make him want to ravish you. You know, if you're into all that. Gag. Laughing, I head to my bedroom to change, throwing on a pair of jeans and a pink blouse before taking it right back off. Ugh, 
I changed three times before settling on a pair of black leggings and a purple tunic, heading back out to the kitchen to Megan. How's this look? She casts a glance my way before saying, Unless he's taking you to Planet Fitness for some Pilates, it's a no for me. Rolling my eyes, I head back to the bedroom to try again, putting on some flared khakis and a flowery flowing top. The second that Megan sees me, she makes a face. Time traveling to Woodstock? Funny, I mutter. Going back to my bedroom yet again, putting on skinny jeans and a black top. Now you're not even trying, Megan glares at me. Don't you have that dress still? You know, that black one with the lace? This isn't a big thing, Megan. He's taking me to dinner. Yeah, well, if you wear the black dress, you might end up being dessert. I stare at her for a moment before shrugging. What the heck? Heading into the bedroom, I pull the dress out from the back of my closet, not giving it too much thought before yanking it on. I run my fingers through my hair, letting it do whatever it wants, and am in the bathroom putting on a bit of makeup when Maddie pops up in the doorway. You look pretty, Mommy. Thank you, sweetheart, I say, gazing at her in the reflection of the mirror as she watches me, her expression curious. I pat the counter beside the sink, inviting her to join me, and she climbs up to sit on it as I grab a tube of lip gloss, strawberry flavored. She puckers up, and I put some on her, smiling as I do it. You know I love you, right, pretty girl? I love you more than everything, more than the trees and the birds in the sky, more than even pepperoni pizza and harlequin novels. What's a Harley Quinn novel? Nothing you'll need to know about for a long, long time, I say, putting the lip gloss away. Just know that I don't love them nearly as much as I love you. She kicks her feet, grinning. I love you too. More than chocolate ice cream and Saturday mornings? Uh-huh, she says. More than colors and money? No way. And the Yoo-Hoo drinks and Happy Meal toys. Whoa. And even more than Breezio. Eyes wide, I look at her. That's some serious commitment coming from my superhero-loving girl. You know, you can love us the same. Nah, she says, shaking her head. You're my mommy, so I love you more. I press my pointer finger to the tip of her nose. Well, I sure appreciate it, but remember that it's okay if you ever do. Pulling her off the counter, I set her on her feet and glance at the time. Five minutes until six. I've got to get going soon, sweetheart. Can I come? Not tonight, I tell her. But maybe next time. You get to hang out with Aunt Megan instead. She pouts her lips, the sight of her expression making me want to call Drew and cancel because screw doing anything that makes her look so disappointed. But she recovers, wrapping her arms around me in a hug before running off. I make it out to the kitchen just as there's a knock on the door. Seven o'clock on the dot. I'm still barefoot. Here, Megan says, kicking her shoes off in my direction. Nothing says, fuck me, quite like red stilettos. I slip them on, almost tripping as I scurry to the door. I pull it open when he again starts to knock, coming face to face with Drew, still in that black suit from earlier. Hey, I say. You're right on time. Always am, he says, offering me the faintest hint of a smile before he glances over my shoulder into the apartment. Hello, Megan. Nice to see you. Her voice is curt as she responds. Andrew? You ready? He asks, looking back at me. I thought we could try that new Mexican place in Poughkeepsie. Chipotle? Megan calls out. That place isn't new, but I totally wouldn't mind if you brought me back a burrito bowl. His face flickers with annoyance. I'm referring to the restaurant on Main. Ah, uh, 
isn't the one with all the margaritas, she says with a laugh. You know what they say about tequila. I shoved Drew further outside, joining him, shouting goodbye to Megan before she can say anything about getting naked. Drew starts to walk away, glancing over his shoulder to make sure I'm following. You want me to drive, I offer. He laughs at that. Yeah, he laughs. I think I can handle it. Drew drives a brand new Audi, shiny black with pristine leather. Quiet indie rock plays from the speakers as he fills the silence, talking about work. He finished up an internship somewhere and was hired to... do something. I don't know. I'm not really listening. Something to do with politics and the law. It's not that long of a drive across the river. The restaurant is busy, but we're able to get a table without having to wait. Drew pulls out my chair, pushing it back in when I sit down, being a chivalrous gentleman. I laugh when I think about that. What's so funny? he asks, sitting down across from me. Just remembering how much of a jerk you were when we first met. I wasn't that bad, was I? You never spoke to me. The waiter approaches, and I ask for water while Drew orders a beer. Once the waiter walks away, Drew says, Pretty sure you didn't speak to me either. Because you were a jerk, he laughs. Then he starts talking again. I do my best to pay attention, chiming in at all the right places. I know the conversation like the back of my hand. Politics. It makes things easy, though. But Drew's already easy. Things feel simple around him. Familiar. He's easy. And he's kind. And I keep thinking that he's handsome. But beyond that, nothing. No tingles. No butterflies. No goofy grins. He doesn't make me feel like I'm in a tailspin. We eat. Drew drinks. I stick to water. Come on, let's get out of here, he says after he pays the check, refusing my money when I offer to pay my share. Thank God, because I couldn't afford it. He takes my hand, and I let him. He leads me out to the parking lot, and I don't put up a fight, but the moment he tries to get me in the car, I resist. I wouldn't say he's drunk, but he's been drinking, and that'll never be something I risk. It's late, I lie. It's barely nine o'clock. I can take a taxi home and save you the trip. He looks confused, not sure how to react. I know he was hoping for more out of this night, and I could go along with it, but... Go home, I tell him. But drive safe. I'll never forgive you if you wrap your car around a tree. You sure about this? He asks, looking conflicted. I can take you home. Positive. Leaning over, I kiss him, the tiniest peck. Don't worry about me. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. 8. Jonathan How does that make you feel? The million-dollar question, one I've heard countless times this past year. I get asked some infuriating shit day after day, night after night, but nothing gets under my skin quite like that one. How do you think it makes me feel? Deflection helps no one, you know, he says. It's a defense mechanism that keeps us from acknowledging our problems. Don't shrink me, Jack, I say. If I wanted to be psychoanalyzed, I'd be talking to my actual fucking shrink right now. Yeah, okay, so you feel like shit, he says. Less than shit. Your dog shit on the bottom of a shoe that's being scraped off on a curb because nobody wants anything to do with shit on their shoe. Pretty much. That sucks. I laugh at the casual way he says that. Remind me again why I called you? Because you'd give your left nut for a drink right now and you need someone to call you on your bullshit. Sighing, I run my left hand down my face. How right he is. It's a quiet night in Bennett Landing. Most nights seem to be. 
The sun goes down and the town gets dark and I'm left with nothing but my thoughts, which is a damn dangerous place to be. Last time I felt this isolated was back in rehab when I was struggling to get clean. I'd like to think I've made some big strides since then, but some nights test me. I've been wandering around outside for the past hour, strolling toward the waterfront, through Landing Park beside the inn, spilling my secrets through the phone to a jackass that sums them up as sucking. We all have bad nights, man. You know that, Jack says. Try to remember why you're there. Drinking sure as hell won't help you make amends. He's right. Of course he is. But Jesus Christ, I would give my left nut to drown in a bottle of whiskey right now. I'm trying, I say, walking along, glancing up when I reach the small picnic area. My footsteps stall when I catch sight of movement, someone sitting on top of one of the picnic tables, staring out at the water. I blink, getting a glimpse of her face in the moonlight as Jack starts rambling, telling me to go find a meeting. I didn't expect anybody to be out here at this hour, but certainly not her. Kennedy? She turns my way. She doesn't look as surprised as I expect her to be, her eyes guarded as they watch me, but her posture is relaxed, so I guess that's something. You listening to me, Cunning? Jack asks. Or am I wasting my breath? I hear you, I tell him. I'll see what I can do. Good, he says. I know it's not easy trusting people, but I think it'll help you. Yeah, I mumble. Look, I gotta go. You sure? You okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Call me back if you need anything. I will. I end the call. Kennedy is watching me, but she's said nothing yet, so I'm not sure if I should stick around. I'm not sure why she's out here or what she's doing, if she's even alone. I don't see anybody else, but that doesn't mean she's not waiting for someone to show up. Let me guess, she says after a moment. Your manager? No. I shove the phone in my pocket. My sponsor. That's nice, I think. She pauses before adding, Not really sure what to say to that. It is what it is. I take a few steps closer, gauging her reaction. He's a good guy. Doesn't treat me like I'm a star, which I appreciate. He actually thinks my movies are shitty. She laughs at that, genuinely laughs. Sorry, I don't mean to laugh at you, but, well, that's kind of funny, she says. I mean, you have to admit, they can be a little hokey at times. Hokey? I've only really watched the first Brizio, but come on, some of the dialogue they added? I think there's something wrong with my eyes because I can't take them off of you. What kind of cheesy crap? Yeah, that one was pretty bad. And what was it Marianne said to him in the hospital when he first got sick and they were looking for the cure? Our love will make you better. That's it, she rolls her eyes. Because it's the most powerful thing in the world. I liked that one, I admit, taking a chance and climbing up on the picnic table, sitting down beside her. There's some space between us, so we're not touching, but she's so close I can feel her warmth and smell a hint of her perfume. Their love didn't save him, but it did make him a better person. It doesn't matter, she says. He was laying in a damn hospital bed. He thought he was dying, and that's what she says? I smile at the cynical tone in her voice, letting her have that one. She has a point. It grows quiet. She's staring out at the water, arms wrapped around her chest like she's holding herself together. She's shivering, so maybe she's cold, or she might be shaking because I'm here. I don't know. Do you want me to leave? I ask. She doesn't answer, eyes flickering to the ground in front of us. It's not a no, but it isn't a yes either. I know I should probably leave her alone, not risk pushing her too far or too quickly, but I've missed the fuck out of her these past few years. I don't deserve her time, not in the least, but I'm so desperate for some part of this woman back that I'll steal every second that I can get. What are you doing out here anyway? She asks quietly. You don't really have a good streak being in this park after dark? With you, no less. She smiles at that. Just needed some air, I say. Couldn't keep sitting in that house staring at those walls with that woman always there. Needed to take a break. It's late, so I figured I'd be alone out here. 
Sorry about that. Don't apologize to me, I say, shaking my head. So, you still hang out here? Sometimes, she says. Not usually after dark, though. Maddie likes it here, likes playing on the swings, hanging out by the river. Maddie. This makes twice in one day she's talked to me about her. Twice she's brought up our daughter. I'm trying to not get my hopes up, but after years of slamming face first into a brick wall, I feel like I might finally be headed in the right direction. So she likes the water? I seem to remember you hated it. I never hated it, she says. I'm just not a fan of bugs. And ducks. And ducks, she agrees with a shudder. Which is funny because Maddie loves them. She loves coming down here and feeding the ducks every chance she gets. She always worries they're not eating enough. She's, uh... She sounds perfect. Yeah, she whispers. She is. I don't know what to say, afraid to push her, so I just sit here, my eyes scanning her in the darkness. She's wearing a little black dress, a pair of red heels kicked off on the ground by the picnic table. You look nice, I tell her. She glances down at herself, making a face. I had a date. A date? That word is a thump to the chest. I'm not a fool, I know she probably moved on, and I'd be the worst hypocrite to be upset by that after some of the shit I did these past few years in an attempt to numb my feelings for her. She has an entire life outside of me, without me, a world she built for herself where I don't even exist, and I don't blame her for it, not a bit. It's not like I could expect her to sit around and wait. I never asked her to, never gave her a reason. I haven't just been a shitty father... I was also a terrible boyfriend. But still, there's a flare of jealousy burning in my gut, my shame dousing it like gasoline on a fire. You do a lot of that now? I ask. Dating? She cuts her eyes at me. Not as much as you seem to do? Touché. You've had, what, six, seven girlfriends? Hell, they say you've even got a wife now. They say, do they? Yes. Tell me you don't read that shit, Kennedy. Tell me you don't actually believe. I don't know what to believe, she says. Not that it matters. Your life, it's yours. You'll do whatever it is you want to do. You made that clear a long time ago. But Maddie? She's what matters. And I can't have you around her if... I'm not going to hurt her, I say when she trails off. I know that's what you're afraid of. Yeah, well, didn't think you'd hurt me either, but the moment I became an inconvenience... I want to tell her it's different now. I want to tell her that I've learned my lesson, that I've grown up. I want to tell her that I'll never make those same mistakes again. I want to tell her she's never been an inconvenience. I want to tell her a lot of shit, but none of it will make a difference. They're just words, and I've said a lot of words over the years, including a few that have hurt her. I'm here, I say. I'm sober. And for the record, I'm not married. I'm not sure where they even got that story, but there was no wedding. Most of what they print is bullshit. It doesn't matter. It does, I argue. You're never going to let me see Madison if that's the kind of man you think I became, if you believe the shit they say about me is real. I mean, I don't even know what she looks like now. I could pass my daughter on the street and I wouldn't even recognize her. And that's my fault. But the shit they print, if that's what I'm up against, I'm fucked. Closing my eyes, I run a hand through my hair, gripping onto the locks as I let out a long exhale. She says nothing, and after a moment I reopen my eyes, seeing the glow of her cell phone lighting up her face. I start to say something to tell her I'll stop bothering her tonight when her eyes meet mine. She holds the phone out to me. My gaze flickers to the screen. My heart nearly stops. It's a picture of a little girl with big blue eyes, dark hair and chubby cheeks, flashing the brightest smile I've ever seen. She's posing, hands on her hips, head cocked to the side. She's a spitting image of her mother. Fuck. But those eyes are all mine. She looks just like you, I say. Yeah, well, she acts like you. I smile at that, grabbing her phone. 
There are a few more pictures on there, she says, if you want to look at them. You sure? She nods. A few more turns out to be one hell of an understatement. It feels like hundreds as I scan through them. I'm getting a brief glimpse of the time I lost. Birthdays, holidays, the first day of school. A flipbook of memories I'll never have. The what could have been, the what should have been. The time I would have had if I hadn't been so fucked up. She looks happy. They look happy. Both of them. I flip to another picture and pause, stumbling upon another familiar face. Megan. You see Megan? I ask, surprised, although I shouldn't be. If anybody would be there throughout the years, loyalty unwavering, it would be Megan. All the time, she says. She's babysitting right now. Megan babysitting. You sure the kid's still alive? She laughs and snatches the phone back, pressing a button so the screen goes dark. I'll have you know your sister's great with children. My sister, I mumble. Don't let her hear you call her that. My sister, another amend I have to make. She won't make it easy. On a scale of one to ten, I say, how pissed off at me would you say she still is? One to ten? I'd say she's about a seventy-three. I cringe. Figures. Anyway, I should get going, she says, standing up from the picnic table. Need to get home before it gets too late. Did you drive? I ask, realizing I haven't seen a car anywhere out here. I got dropped off. Figured I'd walk. She hesitates, looking at me, like she isn't sure she wants to continue. I have an apartment. It's just a few blocks. Oh. Oh. That's all I say like a fucking idiot as she grabs the shoes from the ground, not bothering to put them on. She takes a few steps away, barefoot, eyes still guarded. Can I walk with you? I ask. I can make it there myself. I don't doubt that, but... I hesitate. Do you mind? I'd like to walk with you. Not to be some misogynistic asshole, but I just... It's fine, she says, but you don't have to, I know. We're dancing around the fact that I want to, that she's doing me the favor here and not the other way around, but she motions with her head for me to come along, so I shove to my feet and fall in place at her side. So, this sponsor of yours, she says as we start to walk, Jack. Jack, she repeats, must be one hell of a guy if he's kept you clean. That should probably offend me, but I laugh. I wouldn't say he's kept me clean. He helps, but he's not why I'm sober. You are. Me? And Madison? I say. This. That's what has kept me clean, not some 25-year-old recovering addict. She's quiet, her face twisted in concentration, like she's considering my words, but she doesn't seem to be buying it. After a moment, her footsteps stall. We haven't even made it out of the park and she's already stopping. What did it? She asks. What do you mean? What makes this time different? I, um... Uh... Most of the stories they print about you might be lies, but I know you've been to rehab a few times. I know they've held interventions and detoxed you, but you went right back to it. And we were here. We've been here. That hasn't changed, so what did? I don't know, I admit. The last time I came here, last year, when your mom died, I wanted to be there for you, but I showed up drunk and I knew you were grieving and you looked at me like... Like what? Like nothing had ever hurt you as much as me being there did, I say. Up until then, I only saw your anger. But that day I saw your fear, like you were afraid of how much more pain I was going to cause you, when I wanted nothing more than to make it all better. She starts walking again, her voice quiet when she says, I wish I could believe you. Yeah, I mumble. Me too. I'm glad, though, she says. Whatever did it, I'm glad you're sober, and I hope you stay that way. For Maddie's sake, yeah, because she deserves to know her dad. But for your sake, too. I know I was never enough for you, Jonathan. But I hope you find something that is. Previously, hitting it out of the park.
You're back in drama club. You've been back at it for a month. This is the fourth week in a row you've shown up and participated. Julius Caesar bores you, but it's better than nothing. An addict will take whatever hit he can get. Besides, you find becoming someone else for a while therapeutic. Maybe that's why you love acting so much. Maybe you're tired of being yourself. The girl still sits in the auditorium every week. Sometimes she writes. Mostly she watches. When she's not watching you, you find yourself watching her. Your eyes meet on occasion in the middle, and she always smiles. Always. Somewhere within the past month, things changed. The two of you grew closer. She kissed you for the first time last week. In the library, during lunch, she just leaned over and did it, making the first move. It was unexpected. You've stolen kisses from her every day since then. Well, except today. You're having a bad day. You mess up a few lines. You're distracted. You've had this look about you all afternoon like you're not quite there. Christ, Cunningham, get it together, Hastings says, running his hands down his face. If you can't handle being Brutus, fuck you, you cut him off. Don't act like you're perfect. I don't make rookie mistakes, Hastings says. Maybe if you weren't so preoccupied with trying to screw the new girl, you might... Bam. You shut him up mid-sentence with a punch to the face, your fist connecting hard, nearly knocking him off his feet. He stumbles, stunned as you go at him again, grabbing the collar of his uniform shirt and yanking him to you. Shut your fucking mouth! People come between the two of you, forcing you apart. Hastings storms out, shouting, I can't deal with him. Drama Club comes to a screeching halt. You stand there for a moment, fists clenched at your side, calming down. You flex your hands, loosening them as you approach the girl. She's watching you in silence, expression guarded. You sit down near her. There's an empty seat between you today. It's the first time you've not sat right beside her in weeks. You're giving her space. It doesn't take long before Hastings returns, but he isn't alone. The administrator waltzes in behind him. The man heads for you, expression stern. Cunningham, give me one good reason why I shouldn't expel you. Because my father gives you a lot of money? That's what you have to say. Is that not a good reason? You punched a fellow student. We were just acting, you say. I'm Brutus. He's Caesar. It's to be expected. Brutus stabs him. He doesn't throw punches. I was improvising. The girl laughs when you say that. She tries to stop herself, but the sound comes out, and the administrator hears it, his attention shifting to her. Look, it won't happen again, you say, drawing the focus back to you. Next time, I'll stab him and be done with it. You better watch yourself, the administrator says, pointing his finger in your face. One more incident and you're gone for good. Understand? Yes, sir. And rest assured, your father will be hearing about this. The administrator's attention shifts back to the girl. Garfield, some advice? If you want to be successful here, find yourself a new friend. Someone with their priorities in check. Someone more like Hastings. Hastings stands in the aisle, rubbing his jaw. Despite the fact that it's going to bruise, he's grinning. Gloating. Because Cunningham will cause you nothing but trouble, the administrator continues. And you can do better. The man walks away. Hastings follows suit. He's afraid to be near you without backup. The two of you have some long-standing rivalry, like Batman and the Joker. Or Brizio and Nightmare. Which one are you, though? The hero? The girl shakes her head, doodling on the front of her notebook. That was awfully rude of him. Yeah, well, it's true, you say. Is it? I've already gotten you in trouble once you remind her. 
I can pretty much guarantee it won't be the last time it happens. Huh. And what about the other part? She asks. Is that true, too? Which part? The part where you might be trying to get the new girl naked? You just look at her. She's still doodling. Because if you are, she says, you're doing a pretty crappy job of it. I mean, you haven't even tried yet, so... She's avoiding looking at you, her cheeks pink. Her doodling is more like absent-minded scribbling, anything to distract herself. She's biting her cheek. Reaching over, you cover her hand with yours, stopping her before the pen tears a hole through the notebook. She anxiously cuts her eyes at you. You say nothing right away, holding her gaze before you lean over, closing the distance, and you kiss her. It's soft and sweet, and it's right there, in front of the entire drama club, but you don't care who watches. You want to hang out? You ask, your voice quiet. Spend some time together outside of this hellhole? She nods. How about this weekend? Tearing a piece of paper from the back of her notebook, she scribbles her phone number down for you to call her after school. You don't, though. Not right away. Your life descends into chaos that afternoon. You don't even have a chance. Your father confronts you about the incident at school, and when you finally get away from him, you have something important to do. But later that night, long after the sun goes down, you send her a text, asking if there's any way possible you can see her right now. You tell her it's important. It's so late, there's a chance she's already in bed, but you get a message back a few minutes later with the location of a park near her house. I can meet you in 30 minutes. It takes you about that long to drive there. She's sitting on top of a picnic table when you arrive, staring out at the water, the park edging the bank of the Hudson River. It's the first time you've ever seen her out of her school uniform, so used to the knee-length skirts with the thick tights. She's wearing pajama pants tonight. It's dark where she's sitting, the glow of the moonlight surrounding her. You approach, your hands hidden behind your back. I have a surprise. Is it the answers to Monday's math test? Because if so, you're going to at least get to third base for that. You laugh, standing in front of her. Which base is third base? Pretty sure it's dry humping? Shame, you say. Could use a dry hump. But no, that's not it. Although, you could always copy my answers. Just mark a few wrong on purpose, since they might get suspicious if you get a perfect score. Right, since you never miss any. She playfully rolls her eyes. So, if it's not the answers, what is it? You pull your hands out from behind your back. It's a comic book, tucked in a plastic sleeve. Her expression changes as she takes it. Brizio, ghosted. Issue five of five. Is this... Oh my God, is this what it says it is? The last issue of Brizio. But how? Her eyes meet yours. This isn't even out yet. Uh, well, I knew a person who knew a person who knew a person, you say. You know how it is. Pay enough money and you can get anything. You must have really hated waiting, she says. Oh, my God, Jonathan. I seriously can't believe this. Is it good? Have you read it? No, I didn't read it. I got it for you. Figured you might let me borrow it later, if I'm good to you. This is for me, she asks, holding it against her chest. Like, for real. It's mine? Yes, you say. It's yours. As soon as you confirm that, she flings herself at you, a full-blown flying leap right off of the picnic table into your arms. You don't expect it, and she nearly tackles you to the ground. You manage to stay on your feet as she wraps herself around you, legs around your waist, arms around your neck. She kisses you. 
You kiss her back as you take a few steps over to set her down on the edge of the picnic table, but she doesn't let go of you. If anything, she's more encouraged. She drops the comic onto the table and runs her fingers through your hair as she grinds against you. You groan, pressing into her. You're so hard she can feel it. Guess I hit third after all. That? You knocked that one right out of the park. You laugh against her lips, still kissing her. Yeah, you already giving me a home run? It's worth it, she whispers. You can slide home anytime you want. It's all yours. The baseball metaphors. Yeah, they're stupid, but the meaning behind them gets you worked up. She's given you the green light to go all the way, and, well, what hormone-driven teenage boy is going to say no to that invitation? Your hand slips down the front of her pants and she gasps, throwing her head back. Your mouth goes to her neck as you drive her wild with your fingertips, asking, How do you like it? She stammers. I, uh, I don't know. You want it just like this? You ask, whispering in her ear as she grinds against you, making her own friction, nearly getting herself off. You help her, rubbing harder where she needs it. I could bend you over the table, hit it from behind, or we could go to my car if you want. Maybe have you ride me in the passenger seat? Tell me how to make you feel good. You're a dirty talker. It makes her blush. I don't know she says again. I, uh, I haven't ever. You mean you've never? She shakes her head. Seriously? This is your first time? That catches you off guard. You pause what you're doing. You didn't realize she was a virgin. She groans, shifting her hips. Oh, God, don't stop, please. You start rubbing again. She's close. So close, it would be cruel to stop. Just a few more seconds before she gasps, an orgasm sweeping through her. You don't stop until she relaxes again, but once you try to pull away, she won't let you. I want to, she says. I know you've done this before, and I haven't, but I want to. With you. Your first time can't be out here, you say. It can't be bent over a damn picnic table. The car, then. It's not going to be that either, you say. Not with me. It needs to be in a bed. Nobody's first time should be a ten-minute quickie in a park. What was your first time? It was a fucking quickie in a park, you say, and she laughs. So I know what I'm talking about. It lasted, like, two minutes in my case, but still... Sounds rough, she says, still laughing, but her amusement fades when she presses her palms to your cheeks. She looks at your face in the moonlight. The faint beginning of a bruise paints your jawline with discolored hues. She runs her fingers lightly along it. Are you okay? I'm fine, you say, pulling her hands away. Nothing to worry about. Does that happen a lot? What? You know what, she says. Your father hits you. You laugh, but it's not a happy sound. I can take care of myself. I'm not a little kid. But you're still his kid, she says. And you're only 17. Besides, I'm guessing this isn't something that just started. You don't say anything right away. You don't want to talk about it. She's not going to drop it, though. So you sit down beside her on the picnic table and say, I turn 18 tomorrow. Seriously? Yeah. And you're right, you say. It isn't new. So you tell her. You tell her how he's always been hard on you because you were a mama's boy. Your mother had been an aspiring actress, and that's how you got involved at such a young age but your father never liked it. You were supposed to follow in his footsteps. It was a source of contention between your parents, and as your father rose in political ranks, your mother stepped away from her dream. 
the first time he hit you, you were 12. But it didn't become a regular thing until a year later when your mother swallowed a bottle of pills and never woke up from a nap. Your father blamed her career for killing her, but you blamed him. That's why you can answer any question thrown at you in class. He drills it into you every chance he gets. He seems to think he can beat your mother out of you and fill the hollowness left behind with more of him. She sits beside you as you talk, her head on your shoulder. Afterward, you're both quiet, before she says she needs to get home. Her parents don't know she's gone. Tomorrow night, she says as she picks up the comic book. If you've got nothing better to do, come hang out with me. What time? Eight o'clock, she says. My house. Your house, huh? I'm starting to think you might like trouble. She grins as she kisses you, just a soft peck before saying... I'll see you tomorrow, Jonathan. I'll be there, you say as she walks away. You don't know this, but that girl, she's always been a bit of a plotter, and at the moment, she's devising a plan. You see, her parents are going out of town tomorrow night. She's supposed to go along, but she's starting to feel like she might be coming down with something. Cough, cough. Cough, 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 cough. Nine. Kennedy. Before I can take even one more step, I'm yanked to a stop, a hand grasping hold of my wrist. Turning, caught off guard, I look at him. Jonathan. We're still in the park, not far from where we started. There's a look on his battered face. I'm not sure how to read it. Not sure what he's thinking or how he's feeling. That's the thing with him, though. He's an actor. His talent comes natural. He's never had to work very hard at it. He can switch moods in a moment, change scenes in an instant, flip the script without anybody even realizing it's happening. It's hard to tell if he's just playing a character or if you can trust that he means things. Don't, he says, his voice low but pointed. Don't do that. Don't do what? Don't act like you weren't enough for me. I wasn't. He shakes his head, his expression flickering with something else. Anger? Hurt? Frustration? I don't know how you can say that, how you can even think that. Because it's true, I whisper, glancing down at where his hand is wrapped around my wrist. He isn't letting go. I'm not saying that to be spiteful, but it's obvious I wasn't enough for you. How is it obvious? I can't believe he's asking that, that he's pretending to not understand what I mean. Is he pretending? I don't know. Either that or he's spent way too long ignoring reality. You wanted so much more than you ever had with me, I say. I couldn't keep up. I tried, but I couldn't. The late nights, the parties, all those different places and faces. I got lost somewhere in the middle of it all, but you never stopped to look to make sure I was still with you. And then with the drinking, the drugs, the women... He cringes when I say that. I never cheated. He's told me that before, but it's not the point. Good for him for keeping his pants on, for keeping his hands to himself. But still, time and again, he chose them. He left me behind all alone in a city where I only had him so he could be with them. Actors, models, socialites. I fought so hard for him and his dream. I gave up everything. But by the end, he wouldn't even give me a minute. A minute was all I asked for. It doesn't matter, I say. It's over now anyway. He lets go of my wrist, and I start to walk again. He strolls along beside me, 
I can tell he wants to argue his point, and every so often his lips will part, like he's found the words he needs to convince me, but he stops himself. When we reach my building, I come to a stop in the parking lot not far from my door. Thanks, I mumble, awkwardly not knowing what to say in this moment. You're wrong, he says when I turn away, his voice just loud enough for me to hear. Should have known he wouldn't let it go. I shake my head. I'm not. You are, he says again. And I hate that I ever made you think otherwise, Kennedy. He walks away. I watch him go, ignoring the tiny sliver of me that doesn't want him to leave. Maddie's already tucked into bed when I go inside, but Megan's on the couch, flipping through channels so fast, I'm not sure how she can tell what's on. She looks at me, pausing as she sits up. Wow, you look... She starts, waving toward me. I look what? I don't know, she says. But you look something. I feel something. I mumble, plopping down on the couch beside her, dropping her shoes on her lap as I kick my feet up on the coffee table. My dress is tugged up damn near to my waist. I'm probably flashing her my underwear, but I don't care. What a night. Oh, God, was it that bad? She asks, her voice dropping low as she clutches her chest. Is it little? Does he have a needle nose plier dick? Oh, God. This is gold. Please tell me Andrew's packing a pinky in his pants. No, I say with a laugh, pausing before adding, Well, I don't know. I've never seen it, but I doubt that's the case. What do you mean you've never seen it? I mean, I've never seen it. We've never, you know. What? She looks at me with shock. You've gone out a few times and you haven't even played with it? What the hell? I mean, I don't blame you because gross, but why do you keep going if he's not sticking it to you? What's the point? Maybe because he's nice. Nice? You know who else is nice? Don't even start. Mr. Rogers, she says. He wants you to be his neighbor. Bob Ross, he's nice too. He'll paint you a happy little cloud. Hell, how about one of the cleavers? Why not go out with one of them? Pretty sure they're all dead. Yeah, well, so is your vagina at this rate. Laughing, I shove her, nearly pushing her off the couch. It is not. Fine, whatever. So Andrew's nice, she pretends to gag. If you didn't get naked, what did you do tonight? Went to dinner? Dinner, she says, eyeing me. You've been gone for four hours. How much did you eat? Why are you asking so many questions? Just making sure you didn't run off and do something stupid, like get naked with someone else? Of course not, I say. My dress stayed on all night long. But you ran off, didn't you? I didn't do anything. She waves her finger in my face. You saw him. Guilty. I don't have to say anything. She knows. Jesus Christ, Kennedy. I know. I know. You don't even have to say it. Oh, but I will, she says. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I mean, I want to. I want to tell you to get a restraining order, but I won't. I know he's her father. He's also your brother. She shoves her hand in my face, pushing my head away. Ugh, don't remind me. Standing, she slips her shoes on, smoothing the creases from her clothes. You can stay, you know, I tell her. You don't have to rush off. I know, she says, playfully roughing up my hair until I smack her hand. But the universe demands balance. You didn't give it up tonight, which means it's up to me, so I'm off to do my civic duty. Ah, to be young again. She flips me off. Truth is, Megan's got me beat by a few years. She's on the cusp of turning 30 and isn't anywhere close to settling down. 
She's so carefree that she makes me feel like an old fogey. Love you, she says. You too, Megan. Love you, cinnamon sugar apple fritter, she yells as she opens the front door, her voice carrying through the apartment. I don't expect her to get a response, but a sleepy voice calls from the bedroom. Love you! Megan looks at me, trying to appear serious, pointing to her eyes before pointing at me, warning me she'll be watching. Before I can respond, she's gone. I didn't really know Megan until Maddie came into the world. We'd spoken a few times, saw each other in passing, but she had a life pretty far removed from her brother. She wanted to know her niece, though, and we grew close after that. Sighing, I turn off the television, locking up before heading for bed. I stall outside Maddie's bedroom, lurking in the doorway, those blue eyes shining out at me. Hey, sweetheart. You have fun tonight with Aunt Megan. She nods. Did you have fun with your date? Sure, I say. It was nice. Did he say you were pretty in your dress? Uh, no. I glance down at myself. I don't think he noticed. Why not? Sometimes people just don't notice things like that. I did, she says. I don't think you should like them as a date if they don't notice pretty dresses. Because you can see it, but if they don't see it, then they don't look. And they should look at you on dates when you're pretty. You're right. I say. She's too smart for her own good. That's some really great advice. She smiles as I stroll over, leaning down to kiss her forehead. Get some sleep, I tell her. Maybe we can do something special tomorrow. Ducks, 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 ducks. I shake my head as Maddie snatches the prepackaged bags of kale off of the platform beside the cash register, excitedly chanting that word, hardly giving Bethany a chance to even scan them, much less toss them in bags with the rest of our stuff. You going to see the ducks today? Bethany asks with a laugh, taking my money when I pay. Yep, Maddie says. Picnic with the ducks, right, Mommy? Right, I say. If Lunchables with juice boxes count as a picnic, which I like to think it does. Bethany dramatically frowns in Maddie's direction. Lucky girl, I'm stuck working all day, unlike your mama, so no feeding ducks for me. The ducks eat all the time, Maddie tells her. Every day, too, so you can feed them when you're not working. You know, you're totally right, Bethany says. I'll have to remember that. Maddie smiles, satisfied, as she starts dancing around like she's playing hopscotch, jumping from square to square on the checkered floor. Bethany counts out my change as she switches topics, rambling about schedules and days off and blah, blah, blah. Precisely everything I don't want to talk about, but I humor her before making my escape. I look around for Maddie, spotting her at the end cap of the checkout lane, looking right at the exact thing she shouldn't be seeing. Hollywood Chronicles. That's about enough of that, I say, pressing my hand to her back, steering her away from it. She doesn't fight me on it, and I'm instantly grateful she's just now learning how to read, because that means she didn't understand half of what I saw on that cover. Johnny Cunning Rehab Shocker. Alcohol, drugs, and a sex addiction tearing Breezy O'Star's life apart. Friends concerned he's knocking on death's door. I lead her out of the store, carrying our picnic stuff as she drags along the bags of kale. I'm digging my car keys from my pocket, trying to keep an eye on her when she digs her heels in, dropping one of the bags. I nearly step on it, hearing her as she whispers, Frizio. I know, sweetheart, I mumble, snatching up the bag of kale, about to hand it back to her when she yanks away from me. Frizio, she says again, a little louder this time, gone from my side in a blink. Running. Madison, I call out, darting after her. Stop. Maddie doesn't stop, but I damn sure do. 
She's barely 10 feet away, heading for someone approaching the grocery store. She runs right up, blocking the path as she says it again. Brizio! Oh, God. Oh, no. No, no, no. Brizio. Jonathan stands there, blinking down at her, confusion clouding his face. I'm not sure how she recognized him, with scruff covering his jaw, still all banged up. He looks like a battered version of the actor, not the character. My chest tightens as I hold my breath. He doesn't recognize her right away, but I can tell the moment it kicks in. There's a flicker of shock he can't conceal before his expression straightens out. He might be panicking, but he isn't showing it. Not that I can see. Yet, he says nothing. He stares at her in silence. I've imagined this moment so many times in so many different ways, none of which I'm even remotely ready for. But it was never like this. I have no idea how he's going to react, no idea what he'll do. It's so far out of my control that I want to just grab her and run. Jonathan's eyes meet mine, widening, pleading. There's the panic. Carefully, I step toward them. Brizio? Maddie says again, standing right in front of him, drawing his attention back to her. She sounds hesitant now, conflicted by how he's acting, a fact that seems to spur him into action. Hey there, he says as he kneels down, eye level with her. Don't say that too loud. People might hear. Mommy says she got my drawing to you, she says excitedly, whisper shouting. Did you see? He smiles slightly. I did. I can barely hear his voice. He stares at her like he's committing her face to memory, like he fears this may be the only time he ever sees it. Did you like it? She asks. Did it make you better? I loved it, he says. And it made me feel a lot better. Thank you. You're welcome, Brizio. His gaze meets mine. He cocks an eyebrow. He's waiting for me to do something. But what? Maddie, sweetheart, we've talked about this, I say. He's not really Brizio, remember? I know that. She rolls her eyes dramatically, like I'm being crazy. He's Johnny, like on the TV and the papers and stuff, but he's still Brizio too, right? Right, I think. Sounds about right to me, he says, holding his left hand out to her. My name's Jonathan, though. It's a pleasure to meet you. She grabs his hand, shaking it wildly. Mommy calls me Maddie. You can call me Maddie, too. Maddie, he repeats. It's a sweet moment. Or, well, it should be sweet. Tears sting my eyes that I blink away, a lump in my throat that I force down, not wanting to confuse Maddie with my reaction. What are you doing here? I ask quietly when Jonathan stands back up. McCleskey sent me to get milk, he says. She told me to make myself useful. Yeah, uh, I glance toward the store. You're not going to want to do that. The cashier that's working, well, she's a bit of a Brizio fangirl. Me too, Maddie says. I grasp Maddie's shoulder, pulling her back to me. Yes, but you, little one, know how to keep a secret. I do, she says, smiling widely as she looks up at me. Like that one time when you told me that secret that you didn't like? I don't even know where she's going with this, but I don't let her finish, clamping my hand down around her mouth to muffle her words, hissing, Secret, remember? Jonathan laughs. Well, then, I guess no milk for McCleskey today. Maddie yanks my hand away from her mouth, too excited to stay quiet. I can get her milk. No, I, uh, crap. I can do it. It'll only take a second, just crap. Uh, how did I get myself into this? Just wait here. Do you think you can... Crap, crap, crap. I wave between him and Maddie. 
for just a second. His eyes widen when he realizes what I'm asking, like he can't believe his ears, which is funny because I can't believe it came from my own freaking lips. Did I seriously ask him to watch her for me? Sure, he says hesitantly, like he expects me to change my mind, and I want to, but I can't, not when I've already said it. If you're sure, I nod. I'll be right back. I try to be calm about it, to not raise any alarms, my footsteps determined as I head back into the store. I make my way to the back, grabbing a gallon of milk before heading for the register with it, my heart racing the whole time. I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't believe I just did that. I left her with him. Just left her there. With him. Just like that. He could take her. He could run. For all I know, that was his plan all along. Maybe he doesn't even need milk. Forget something? Bethany asks when I set the milk in front of her. Yeah, I mumble. Stupid me. She rings it up, and I pay for it, snatching up the gallon of milk before she can make conversation. Stepping out of the store, I exhale shakily, spotting them still standing there together. Maddie is talking nonstop while he's grinning down at her like he's mesmerized. His smile dims a bit when I approach. He almost looks disappointed that I'm back. I try to brush that off as I shove the milk at him, but my stomach knots. Thanks, he says. Maddie was telling me all about the ducks. Is that right? I glance at her. We should probably get over there. I told him we got kale, she says, squeezing the bags. He says that's crazy because they eat bread. But he's the crazy one because bread is bad for the ducks, but he doesn't believe they eat the kale. Well then, I say when she pauses to take a breath. Guess he doesn't know much about ducks. Guess not, he agrees, lingering there like he doesn't want to leave. He should come, Maddie declares, looking at him with wide eyes. You can feed the ducks. I'm not sure about that, sweetheart, I say. Why not? She asks. Why not? It's a good question. One I've got no answer for. At least no answer she'll understand. I'm sure he's busy. Too busy for ducks? She asks incredulously, looking at him with disbelief. You don't want to feed them with me? I'm screwed. That's it. I know it instantly. The way she asked that, the way she worded it. There's no way he can say no. He mumbles something, not answering her question, and looks to me for help. It's strange, seeing him so vulnerable. He's drowning right now. We'll be over at the park, I tell him. If you want to come by after you drop the milk off. Are you sure? He's asking me, but Maddie answers. Duh! He laughs. Well, then, I guess I'll see you. After a moment of hesitation, a moment of staring at Maddie again, he finally leaves. Maddie watches until he slips out of sight. Turning to me, she grins. Mommy! It's Brizio! He's here! She's got stars in her eyes, my dreamer girl and I return her smile, even though I'm terrified that all this is going to inevitably crush her. He's here, and he's trying, but how long can that last? How long until he blows out of town again and goes back to his life, leaving everything behind? How long until my lovesick little girl becomes an inconvenience to him, too? To him, too. To him, too. To him, too. To him, too. To him. 10. Jonathan. The park is quiet this early in the afternoon, a few families hanging out, minding their own business. Nobody pays me any attention as I stroll toward the picnic tables, hat pulled down low, sunglasses on to avoid eye contact. I've done live press conferences and walked red carpets, sat through depositions with high powered attorneys who never hesitated to tear me apart. I went to rehab once, twice, okay, more like five times, 
Sat through countless AA meetings and spilled my soul to the best goddamn shrink over on the West Coast. Audition after audition, meetings and negotiations, interviews on press junkets where reporters seemed to not understand what no personal questions meant. I've been around some important people in my life. Even met the president once. But never, through all that, was I ever as nervous as I am at this moment. My palms are sweaty, my arm is itching, my wrist hurts like a son of a bitch. I can feel it throbbing along to the beat of my heart. I think I'm going to be sick. But I suck it up as I head toward the water, where Kennedy lingers with our daughter. I feel like shit, yeah, but nothing's going to get in the way of this. Whatever it is. I'll take anything I can get. You're here. Madison's voice is loud, excited, as she runs up to me, still lugging around bags of kale. Her dark hair falls into her face, her braid coming undone. She blows it away, shoving it out of her eyes, smiling up at me. Of course, I say. Couldn't miss seeing these ducks. She shoves one of the bags at me, damn near punching me with it. I wince when she hits a bruised rib. It hurts like hell, but I make not a sound as she says... You can feed them that one, cause I got this one. I take the bag, hesitating before pulling the sling off my arm. I'm supposed to keep wearing it for a few more days, but fuck it. Can't do this one-handed. I toss it on the grass, watching as Madison rips her bag open, splitting it down the side and damn near losing all her kale. It starts to spill and instinct kicks in. My hand darts out and I grab a hold of it, wincing again as pain stabs up my forearm. Careful. I gots it, she says, matter of fact, although she doesn't, leaving a trail of kale around us like Hansel and Gretel with breadcrumbs. None will make it to the ducks at the rate we're going. Here, I say, struggling as I open the second bag. Let's trade. She shrugs like she doesn't see what the big deal is, but she trades bags with me before heading toward the water. Come on, I'll show you. Met her less than an hour ago, and she's already bossing me around. I follow her to the riverbank, where a family of ducks swims in the water. What about your mom? I ask, feeling guilty, like I'm stealing Kennedy's morning. Mommy doesn't like the ducks. She says I can feed them, but I gotta keep them over here, cause they might eat her. I laugh at that, my gaze seeking out Kennedy as she sits at a picnic table, watching us. Guess some things never change. Like what? I look at Madison. Huh? What things never change? People, I say. Or some people, anyway. Your mom hasn't changed much. Still the beautiful, savvy woman she always was. Even at 17, when she first came into my life, she felt so much more put together than everyone else. But her quirks are still there. You know my mommy? Madison asks, her brow furrowing. Yeah, I say. We used to know each other well. Madison seems to mull that over as she closes the rest of the distance to the river, grabbing a handful of kale from her bag and launching it overhead into the water. The ducks don't hesitate, rushing right for it. It's gone in an instant, and she throws another handful as they flood up onto the riverbank, making a ruckus. Jesus Christ, I say when the ducks surround us, trying to rip the bag out of my hand as Madison giggles, throwing handful after handful, not bothered in the slightest. Panicked, I turn the bag over and fucking dump it out, right on the ground, taking a few steps back. Madison does the same, watching me, sprinkling her kale on top of them. You're right, I say. They like it. Told you so, she says, crumbling the bag up into a ball as she looks for somewhere to put it. I take it. I can throw it away. Thank you, Breezio. That's all she says before darting away, running around, playing as some ducks follow her, even though she doesn't have the kale. I grab my sling and toss the empty bags into a trash can before approaching Kennedy. She doesn't look at me, doesn't say a word, sipping juice as she watches Madison from afar. Crazy, I mumble. It's like she's just this tiny person. She is, Kennedy says, were you expecting something different? I don't know that I expected anything. I just... I know. She cuts me off before I can finish. Does she know? Maybe. 
but there's sharpness to her voice that tells me she doesn't want to talk about it, so I don't finish that sentence. Thank you for inviting me, I say. I know this isn't easy for you. It doesn't matter how I feel, she says. You and I are long over, Jonathan. All that matters is Maddie. The way she says that stings. Well, still, thank you. She nods, whispering, Don't make me regret it. I hope like hell I don't. Madison runs over, breathing heavily, waving her hands all around as she stammers out some half-sentences. Kennedy grabs a juice box, poking a straw in it before handing it to her. The girl sucks it down in one gulp. Do you have your suit? She asks suddenly as she squeezes the empty box, crushing it. The question catches me off guard. What? Fabrizio, do you have the suit or no? Uh, no, I say, not with me. Where is it at? In a wardrobe trailer somewhere, I imagine. Why? She shrugs, giving the juice box to her mother. Does it work? Does it go all invisible for real? No, it's a normal costume. And you don't go all invisible? No, I say. I'm normal too. She scowls. I feel like I'm telling the kids Santa isn't real. But you're a hero, she says. I seen it on the TV, so maybe you don't gotta disappear, so then you can stay and don't have to go away now. Those words are a punch to the chest. I blink at her, not sure if she means that how it sounds, but I'm verbally getting my ass kicked this afternoon. We read part of Ghosted the other day. Kennedy chimes in. She isn't happy that Brizio leaves at the end. The explanation doesn't make it much better. Sighing, I sit down on the edge of the picnic table. Yeah, I always thought that sucked. Sure, he thought it was for the best, but I figured they would have given him a happy ending. He should come back, Madison says. Then he can get better and they'll be happy. She's hitting way too close to home with this shit, and she doesn't even know it. Huh, maybe you should have written the story. Madison's eyes widen, her face lighting up with a smile. Her expression makes my goddamn heart act up. She's beautiful, this kid, even more beautiful than I ever could have dreamed of. There's a spark inside of her, one that echoes inside of me, the kind of spark I haven't felt in a long time. I can do that, she says. I can fix it. Kennedy laughs. I'm sure you can. Madison is off again, running around. I sit there in silence, watching her play. A few minutes pass before my phone rings in my pocket. I dig it out. Cliff. Yeah, I answer flippantly. Hey, Cliff says, sounding way too enthusiastic. How's our hero feeling this afternoon? Depends. On what? On what you want. Just checking in to see how you're holding up. In that case, I'm doing fine. Good, he says. Any less of a moody prick? Maybe a bit. Well, every little bit counts, he laughs. Cliff doesn't laugh. Anyway, I didn't get the chance to check in with you after you got discharged, he says. You back home in L.A. now? No, I decided to, you know, stick around. Stick around, he says. You're still here in the city? Uh, close to it. It doesn't take him long to realize what I mean. You didn't. Seriously tell me you aren't where I think you are right now? I am. He huffs. We go through this every time you go there, every single time. We do. Usually I spiral after showing up in Bennett Landing. I'd go on a bender and binge my heart out and not stop until I was so fucking numb someone could have shot me and I wouldn't have felt it. And after I pulled myself together, the lecture would come. I'm playing with fire, it's a PR nightmare, imagine what will happen if word gets out. Imagine if the paparazzi show up there. Imagine if they invade her life the way they do yours. Imagine them stalking your daughter at school. Imagine the stories they'll print about the kid you abandoned. Imagine what it'll do to you when they call you a deadbeat father. It's fine, I say. Nobody knows I'm here. You're supposed to be taking it easy. Stop worrying. I'm not going to do anything stupid. You better not, he says. Serena's causing enough trouble right now. I sigh, lowering my head. What now? She checked into rehab. 
That isn't what I expected him to say, but I'm not surprised. Was it voluntary? Sure, he says, if you consider all those times you went to be voluntary. Not even close. She was getting out of hand, he says. Figured it was a good time for her to get some help. Good, I say. Hope it works out. You and me both. So that's it? Nothing else? No, he says. Unless you have anything to share. I end the call without humoring that and shove the phone in my pocket, looking over at Madison. I'm not going to jinx myself. Today was a happy accident. I'm not sure what happens next. Let me guess, Kennedy says. Your wife? I told you I don't have one of those. I bet you tell people you don't have a daughter too, huh? I cut my eyes at her. Bitterness drips from every one of those words. Nobody ever asks. But you don't offer the information up either. I would, I say. I will if you want me to. I'll call up a reporter right now and give them an exclusive. But just know by tomorrow morning they'll be banging down your door. They'll be hiding in the bushes, climbing trees, looking through windows, clamoring to get pictures. Hollywood Chronicles will have you on the front page by next week. Is that what you want? She doesn't answer. Of course it's not. It's inevitable. Someday they'll find out. I just hope we have time to figure things out before that happens. Time for me to get to know my daughter and earn Kennedy's trust before the vultures swoop in and try to fuck it all up. Maddie? She hollers, standing up. We need to get going, sweetheart. Don't, I say right away. Please don't leave. I have things to do, she says. Just twenty more minutes, I say. Ten minutes. I would, but... Kennedy trails off as Madison runs up to us, her hair wild now. Do we have to leave, Mommy? We have to go to Grandpa's, remember? We told him we'd come over. Can he come, too? Madison asks her before turning to me. Will you come? To your grandfather's house? Yep. Grandpa will like you because he watches Brizio too. Kennedy laughs under her breath as she gathers their stuff. I don't think that's a good idea, I say. Maybe another time. She looks disappointed, pouting. I want to take it back. I want to tell her I'll go anywhere she wants me to go, even if that means visiting a man who once said he'd cut off my nuts if I ever stepped foot in his house again. I've shown up a few times since then, never brave enough to go inside. But I'd do it for her. I'd grow big enough balls to risk him taking them. Snip, snip. Oh, don't even try those puppy dog eyes on him, Kennedy says, playfully grasping Madison's chin, her fingers squeezing her chubby cheeks. He's way too smart to fall for it. But he can come next time? She asks. Maybe, Kennedy says. We'll see. I open my mouth to say goodbye, but Madison lunges at me before I can. She wraps her arms around my neck and my heart fucking aches as I hug her. It's over quickly, way too quickly, as she pulls away. Thank you, Brizio. Jonathan, Kennedy corrects her. Jonathan, Madison says, but still Brizio, too. You're welcome, Maddie, I say. Thank you for letting me feed the ducks. Kennedy grabs Madison's hand, lingering there for a moment. I can tell she wants to say something. Her lips part, but all that comes out is a sigh before she walks off. Previously, birthday presents. On Saturday evening, at a few minutes past eight o'clock, you pull your blue Porsche into the driveway of the modest two-story house. The girl meets you out on the porch. She's barefoot, wearing a simple gray dress, the kind that looks like a long T-shirt. You step onto the porch in front of her. You aren't sure what to expect. Your gaze scans her. It's blatant you're checking her out, your eyes lingering on her smooth, bare legs. So, my parents aren't home, she says. I swore I wouldn't leave the house while they were gone. She's nervous as she tells you that, fidgeting with the hem of her dress. It distracts you. Your eyes keep darting to it as the material inches up further and further. How long will they be gone? Until tomorrow, she says. 
So it's just me, home alone, all night long. Whatever shall I do with my night? You meet her gaze. You smile. You don't have to say a word. She pulls you into the house. She's bold, again making the first move, kissing you as soon as you're inside. Her lips express confidence, but her hands are shaking. You grab them, holding them, and kiss her back. Happy birthday, she whispers. I have something to show you. Can't wait to see it. She takes you upstairs. She takes you to her bedroom. It's dimly lit from a small lamp and looks like the typical room of a teenage girl. Cluttered, a lot of color, flowery comforter. There's a Breezio ghosted poster on the wall above her bed. There's a candle lit on a nearby desk. It smells like vanilla. You sure about this? You ask when she kisses you again, but there's no doubt that she's sure. I figured you'd want to watch a movie or something first. Do you? Do I what? Do you want to watch a movie? She asks, kissing along your bruised jawline. I mean, I guess we can if that's what you want. Fuck that, you say as you move her to the bed. What I want is to find out what it feels like to be inside of you. She blushes and laughs, the sound morphing to moans as you kiss her neck. You waste no time pulling off her dress, leaving her in front of you in a lacy black thong with a matching bra. Fuck, you're beautiful, Kay, you say as your gaze scans her. So goddamn beautiful. She dramatically rolls her eyes. I'm serious, you say, tugging her down onto the bed. Don't you ever doubt that. You're the queen, baby. I'm just a commoner. Did you just... She stares at you as you push her onto her back and hover over her. Oh my god, you seriously just quoted Breezio to me. Foreplay, you say. Besides, it's a good line. She's speechless. You yank off your shirt and kick off your shoes. You only have one condom stashed in your wallet, not thinking you'd actually get this far, and who knows how old the thing is. But she's on the pill, so you roll with it. No stopping now. The rest of the clothes disappear. You move slowly, your touch gentle, giving her time to adjust. Your fingers are inside of her, and your mouth is on her, as orgasm rips through her. You go easy as you take her virginity, pushing in carefully and pausing. She's trusting you, giving herself to you. You don't want to hurt her. You make her feel good. Over and over, you stay all night long. It's nearing dawn when you finally slip your clothes back on. She's laying there, the blanket wrapped around her, watching as you sit down on the edge of the bed to put your shoes on. As you tie them, she sits up, wrapping her arms around you from behind. She hugs you, her head resting against your back. She stays that way for a few minutes before she pushes away from you. Crap, almost forgot to show you that thing for your birthday. I thought that thing was you. What? No, she laughs, blankets still wrapped around her. She almost trips on it as she drags you downstairs, forcing you onto the couch in the living room. Sit. She sits beside you and turns on the TV. You think maybe she's trying to watch a movie now, but no. She goes to something that she recorded. Law and order. No way, you say when she presses play. It's your episode. It was on a few days ago, she tells you. Luckily, Cable plays the same things over and over, and I caught it on a rerun. You laugh, putting your arm around her. The two of you sit together and watch it. Not just your parts. You watch the whole thing. When it's over, she looks at you and says, I don't care what else you do in the future. Even when you're the biggest movie star in the world, the dead kid on Law & Order will always be my favorite part you've played. You leave not long after that. It's seven o'clock in the morning, and you don't know this, but that girl, 
She realizes as your car speeds away that she's desperately falling in love with you. Her body's sore and her chest aches, her heart pounding wildly. She hasn't had a moment of sleep, but that matters not a bit. She's sky high, and nothing can bring her down from this euphoria. Not even when a nosy neighbor tells her father all about the blue Porsche that spent the night parked in the driveway. Not even when he notices the love bites around her neck from your frantic lips. Not even when he threatens to take your manhood and tells her she's grounded for the rest of her life. Because the night that girl just spent with you? Worth it. Worth it. Worth it. Worth it. Worth it. 11. Kennedy. Grandpa! Grandpa, guess who I saw? Maddie starts yelling the second she's out of the car, running up onto the porch of the house. My father sits in his rocking chair, stalling his movement. Who? Brizio! She says, stopping on the porch in front of him, flailing her arms as she launches into her story. He was at the store, and then he didn't believe that the ducks like kale, so he came to the park to see, and he fed the ducks, too. But I think he got scared, because he didn't feed them good, but they ate it anyway. My father blinks at her as he absorbs those words. Brizio. She nods. But not real Brizio, because he's not real, so he's Jonathan. Jonathan? Another nod. I told him he should come here, too, because you like Brizio, and he said maybe he would the next time. My father lets out a laugh of disbelief. Ha! <laughs> I'd like to see him come here. Dad, I warn. Me, too, Maddie says, not realizing that's a borderline threat. She runs inside, leaving me alone with my father. He says nothing, but yet his expression says it all. It kind of snowballed, I say, sitting down on the porch beside him. We need to have the stranger danger talk because she took to him right away. Like mother, like daughter, he says. I'm guessing you didn't tell her who he is to her? Yeah. No. Not sure how to explain it. You just tell her. I don't think it's that simple. But it is he says. She's a smart girl. Besides, do you really think she'll take the news bad? No. I think she's going to be the happiest kid on the planet, which is half the problem. Because what happens if he lets her down? Hate to break it to you, but that's not something you can control. Will she ever be disappointed? Probably. But he'll love her. Because who wouldn't? And if he's making an effort, she deserves a chance to love him in return. He's right, of course, but he makes it sound so simple when it feels anything but at the moment. You realize we're talking about the same guy that you once called the worst thing that could ever happen to anyone's daughter? He laughs. Grandpa, can I have this? Maddie asks, bursting out onto the porch, holding a banana popsicle. She licks it, not waiting for permission, a bite already taken off the top. What? You want my popsicle? He scrunches up his face. No way. I was saving that for later. She freezes, wide eyes flickering between the popsicle and him. Uh-oh. I'm kidding, he says, nudging her. Of course you can have it, kiddo. It's after dark when we make it home. Maddie's fast asleep, so I pick her up and manage to carry her into the apartment. Her shoes are already off, abandoned in the car, so I set her in bed as she is, covering her up and kissing her forehead. Love you, sweetheart. She sleepily mumbles something back that sounds like crazy ducks. Exhaustion weighs me down, so heavy in my bones that my insides feel brittle, pieces of me already broken. I take a hot bath, trying to relax, but nothing can shut off my thoughts. They're a jumbled mess. I don't know how I'm supposed to feel anymore. Getting out of the tub, I throw on my robe and settle in my bedroom. 
Reaching into my bedside stand, I pull out the old business card and lay down in bed with my cell phone. Johnny Cunning. Beneath his name is his contact information, along with his management on the other side. The cards are tucked into the envelopes that show up with the grotesque checks. I never accepted a single penny of his money, but once, long ago, I kept one of the cards. Just in case. Opening my text messages, I type his number in, hesitating as I stare at the blank screen. What to say? Hey, it's Kennedy. I hit send without letting myself think too much about it, knowing if I give myself time to second-guess this, I'll never go through with it. A response pops up within seconds. Hey, everything okay? Is everything okay? No. Everything feels so out of control. Just wondering if you're busy tomorrow. No, what's up? What's up is... I don't know what the hell I'm doing, but I do it. Whatever this is, while I still have the nerve. Thought we could get together to tell Maddie the truth. His response isn't as quick this time. A minute, maybe two, before a message pops up. The truth. Is that a problem? A few more minutes pass of nothing. I'm starting to wonder if I'm making a mistake when my phone rings, the California number flashing across the screen. He's calling. My stomach churns. Hello? There's a moment of hesitation before he says, I didn't think you'd actually answer. Yeah, well, I did, I mumble, thinking I should have let it go to voicemail. So? Is there a problem? No, I'm just wondering what the truth means to you. My brow furrows as I stare up at my ceiling. What? You said you want to tell her the truth, he says. All of it? I'm not sure how to answer. How much do I want to tell her? How much does he need to prepare for? I wonder how much he's even faced himself. I don't know, I admit. It grows eerily quiet, but I know he's still on the line. I can sense him, faintly detecting his breathing. After a moment, he lets out a deep sigh. What time? Noon. The sun is shining outside, light streaming through the open apartment windows, warming the place with a soft glow. A breeze flows through the screens, ruffling the thin white curtains as some current pop boy band plays on the radio in the living room. Maddie dances around, wearing her Sunday best, meaning she's dressed like some sort of rambunctious little superhero with a tutu and rainbow-striped tights, a too-big black breezy o t t-shirt, complete with a fuzzy purple blanket flung around her like a cape. She's all over the place, a ball of energy this morning, while I'm, well, I'm a mess. My eyes burn. I didn't get much sleep, staring at the ceiling in the darkness, conjuring up hypothetical conversations, playing out years' worth of what-ifs. This morning, my hands are shaking as I busy myself cleaning, trying to distract myself from reality, but it isn't working. No matter how much I sweep and mop and scrub, I keep thinking about how big of a disaster this could become. The song on the radio changes, a girl band this time, as a soft knock sounds from the apartment door. I got it, Maddie shouts, heading for the door as I tense, in the middle of wiping down the kitchen counters for the third time. No, wait, hold on a second, I say, but she isn't paying me any attention. The clock on the wall reads 12.01. I told him to come by any time in the afternoon, and it's after noon now, which means... Brizio! she announces, flinging the door open, excitedly spinning around to look for me. Mommy, look, it's... Jonathan, I say, stepping out of the kitchen, nervously rubbing my palms on the thighs of my jeans. Jonathan, she repeats, standing in the doorway in front of him. 
He stares down at her, smiling. Maddie? Come in, Maddie says, grabbing his arm, the injured one, to tug him into the apartment. He grimaces, not resisting, but his smile wavers when his eyes meet mine. Sighing, I close the door behind them, my back pressing against it. Maddie's rambling away, about what, I don't know. I feel like I'm slipping underwater, my heart feverishly racing, but Jonathan seems to understand. He's smiling at her again, listening, as she seems to give him a quick tour of the apartment. He pauses near the small hallway that leads to the bedrooms, his gaze meeting mine again. I know what he's thinking. I'm not sure how, or even why, but the moment our eyes connect, it's like being shoved back in time. To another place. A different apartment. One somehow even smaller, but it was our home for a while. We can go play in my room, Maddie says, trying to pull him that direction. Oh, whoa, whoa, I say, coming out of my stupor as I shove away from the door. He comes around and, stranger danger, seriously goes right out the window. I know he's her father and all, but she doesn't know that. Not yet. Slow your roll for a second, little girl. We need to have a conversation. Her eyes widen. I glance between her and Jonathan, their expressions nearly identical. Worried. I didn't do nothing, Maddie says, shaking her head. I know, I say, pointing to the couch. Sit. She sits, finally letting go of Jonathan. He carefully sits down on the edge of the couch beside her. I linger a moment before perching myself on the coffee table in front of her. I, uh, I have no idea how to even begin. I mean, we, maybe I should... Jonathan starts, pausing before saying, You know, it's fine, I say. I got it. Got what, Mommy? Maddie asks. We wanted to talk to you about something, I tell her. About why Jonathan is here. To play with me, she asks. No, I say, shaking my head. Well, I mean, maybe, but that's not really it. You see, I've known him for a long time, since before you came into my life, sweetheart. Oh, she stares at me. So he's going to play with you, then? What? No, I scoff, making a face. Oh, I can feel my cheeks heating. It's nothing like that. It's just... Look, you know your friend Jenny that lived beside Grandpa... You remember how she went away, and I explained that her parents decided not to live together anymore because some parents don't live together, so she had to go stay at a different house? Her eyes widen again. Do I have to go away? What? No, you don't have to go anywhere. You promise? I promise. It's not like that. I'm just saying, you know... Sometimes parents don't live together, and that's okay, and it doesn't make them any less of a family. Everyone has a mom and a dad. She shakes her head. Not everyone. Yes, sweetheart. Everyone. Nuh-uh. Noah at my school doesn't got a dad. He's got two moms. Oh, well, okay, but still, that's what I mean. Everyone has two parents. Jenny doesn't got two now. She's got three, because her dad got married, so she has another different kind of mommy, right? Right. Man, I'm screwing this all up. But she still has her dad, too, so what I'm saying is, I'm your dad. Jonathan's voice is quiet as he cuts in, but it still packs enough of a punch to make me inhale sharply. Maddie looks at him. You want to be my dad? I do, he says. I already am. Her mouth falls open in shock. Did you get married to mommy? He blinks rapidly, caught off guard, while I choke on thin air, coughing at that question. Oh, no, we didn't. 
His eyes cut my way before he continues. It's not like that. I've always been your dad. How? How? He repeats. Well, I just am. Your mother, she's your mom, and I'm your dad. But how? She asks again. He looks to me for help, like he's not sure what she's even asking. So I chime in again before he takes that how literal and starts spilling about the birds and the bees. Moms and dads aren't always together, remember? So he's still your dad, even if he wasn't around. But where was he at? She's asking me, not him. I know it's because she trusts me implicitly, and as much as she adores what she believes he is... She doesn't yet know Jonathan. But I don't know how to answer that, or if I even should. I don't know if I should be the one to explain his absence, to make his excuses. I wasn't where I should have been, he chimes in. I should have been with you, but I was... Sick, I say, when he struggles for words. Sick, he says. Did you have the tummy bug? she asks, looking at him. No, it was worse than that, he admits. And I'm to blame. Nobody else. I made some really bad choices. I... Did you disappear? she asks. I messed up, he says. I know I haven't been here for you, but I want to be here now if you'll let me. She sits in silence for a moment, thinking that over before shrugging. Okay. He looks stunned. Okay. Okay, she says again, standing up from the couch as she grabs his hand to pull him along with her again. But you have to sleep in Mommy's bed because mine can't fit you. Uh, he laughs awkwardly as he follows her. What? He's not going to live with us, I say. Remember Jenny's parents? She nods, looking at me. But can he play now, Mommy? Please? Of course, I say, giving her a smile. He can stay and play as long as he wants. She drags him away before I say anything else. I faintly hear her rambling about something from her bedroom as I try to busy myself again to keep from fixating on his presence. I clean some more. I listen to music. I watch a bit of television. Hours pass. Long, long hours. Some of the longest hours of my life. I don't know what they're doing, not wanting to interrupt, but I can hear Maddie laughing, and I can hear him talking, the two of them playing. It's near dusk, and I'm in the kitchen, cooking dinner when things grow quiet. I hear footsteps behind me, restrained on the wooden floor, heading my direction. Jonathan pauses right inside the doorway. She fell asleep. Not surprised, I say. She's been wide open all day long. I glare at the food on the stove. She ate breakfast and she ate lunch, but I know now dinner is a bust. Even when I wake her up, I doubt she'll eat much. Yeah, he says, leaning against the door frame. I wish I had even half of her energy bottle it up and take it with me for those late nights on set. Guess it beats Coke, huh? His expression falls when I say that. Right away, I feel like crap. Ugh. Sorry, I say. I shouldn't have said that. It's fine, he says. I deserve whatever you throw at me. Maybe so, but I told myself long ago that I wouldn't do that whole woman-scorned thing. I finish dinner, putting everything together, turning off the stove as he stands there. Are you hungry? I ask. I can make you a plate. You don't have to do that. I know, but I'm offering. Well, uh, okay. He strolls over to the table. If you don't mind. I fix two plates of food, spaghetti and garlic bread, Nothing fancy, but we get by. I'm not a good cook, frankly. The noodles are still sort of crunchy, and the sauce came out of a jar. We sit at the table across from each other, 
He waits until I take a bite before he even touches his fork. I pick at my food. Not hungry, but once he starts eating, he doesn't stop until the plate is empty. I wonder when he last ate a home-cooked meal. I wonder if he has a hired chef. I wonder if Serena cooks for him. Serena. He told me they weren't married, but beyond that, he's avoided the subject. Does she know? The question flies from my lips before I even give asking it much thought. His expression is guarded. Does who know what? Serena, I say. Does she know about our daughter? He hesitates, like he has to think about it. I'm pretty sure she does. Pretty sure. I vaguely remember telling her, he says. But we were both high at the time, so who knows if she believed me or if she even cared. Wow, I say. That's nice to know. We're not, he starts, scrubbing his hand over his face. Look, about that, it's not my business, I say. Not anymore. Whatever you do and whoever you do it with, that's on you. But if it starts affecting Maddie, it won't, he says. It's not serious. Look serious? Looks are deceiving. We're just friends. Friends, I say. So you're telling me you've never had sex with her? He hesitates. That's what I thought, I mutter, twirling the uneaten spaghetti around on my plate. It wasn't serious, he says. It was just a thing that happened. How long ago? I don't know he says. It was on and off. When was the first time? I know I'm asking a lot of questions for someone whose business this isn't, but the door is wide open and I can't stop myself from peeking inside for answers. He hesitates again. Forget I asked, I say, as I give up on eating, shoving out of my chair. Conversation over. I busy myself with putting the leftovers away and start cleaning up while he sits there. Can I help with that? He asks when I fill the sink with hot water. What, you're gonna wash dishes one-handed? Uh, I guess, he says. Don't you have a dishwasher? Nope, I say, glancing at the dishwasher. Well, I do, but it doesn't work. What's wrong with it? Who knows? Maintenance was supposed to fix it, but, well, like my dad always says, they're about as useful as Congress. They never fixed my washer and dryer, either. What's wrong with your washer and dryer? One leaks, the other doesn't heat. He grows eerily quiet as I start washing dishes. When I glance at him, I see he's looking around, his brow furrowed. Why do you live here? Why wouldn't I? It's not much. It's enough, I say. For us, anyway. I work in a grocery store, you know. This is what it pays for. Why? Maybe because I never went to college like I was supposed to, so I do whatever I have to do. But why? Turning, I look at him again. He's staring at me with confusion. I send money, he says. It should be enough. I don't want your money. Why? Why, Jonathan? You're seriously asking me why? Look, I'm just saying. I know what you're saying, but we do just fine without your money. Come on. Don't be that way, Kay. What way? That way. I want to help. So be a father, not a paycheck. He's quiet as I continue washing dishes. When I finish and start draining the water, he stands up to go. He takes a few steps before hesitating, saying, I never cheated on you. Drying my hands, I turn to him, leaning back against the counter. I'm serious, he says. The past few years are a blur, so I can't tell you what I don't remember, but I know we were over before anything ever happened with her. I nod looking down at my hands. I wasn't accusing you of cheating. I just wanted to know how long it took you to move on.
Oh, well, that's an easy one, he says. It hasn't happened. 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 12. Jonathan. Dim church basements aren't my favorite places, nor are they my idea of a good time. I tend to think of them as necessary evils, although Jack would flip out if he heard me say that. They're where we go to spill our souls, confessionals for the alcoholics of the world. Meetings. I fucking hate them. They're supposed to be safe, anonymous, but that isn't always the case. People tend to recognize my face and, well... Next thing you know, pictures leak and it turns into a clusterfuck. Metal folding chairs fill the basement of Hatfield Episcopal. I slip into a seat in the back, grateful that they're not arranged in a circle so I can keep to myself. New place, new faces, which means they'll want to hear my story. But I'm not planning to talk. I just need a reminder tonight. People filter in, about a dozen of them, men and women. Nobody I recognize until... Him. Son of a bitch. Michael Garfield. He heads straight for the front. I avert my gaze, keeping my head down, my hat on, but it's pointless. He pauses in front of everyone, eyes landing on me as he calls the meeting to order. Shit. Welcome. My name's Michael, and I'm an alcoholic. Hello, Michael. The chorus of voices echoes through the room, but I don't say a word sitting in silence and staring down at my lap as he continues. I've been sober now for over twenty years, he says, before going into the usual spiel. I've been through so many of these meetings, and they always start the same way, a rambling introduction before the floor is opened up to sharing. Nobody seems to be feeling chatty, so he suggests, Why don't we talk about forgiveness? I laugh under my breath. I can feel his gaze. They talk, I listen. The meeting lasts 90 minutes. It feels longer than those 90 days I spent in rehab. After it's over, I linger in my seat, letting everyone else filter out of the basement. Michael strolls toward the exit, his footsteps stalling beside my chair. He stares at me for a moment, his expression hard, before he walks away without saying anything. He's gone when I make it out of the church. They're all gone, the parking lot empty. I'm alone pulling out my phone to call Jack, to let him know I made it to that goddamn meeting like he asked, I notice I have a voicemail. Kennedy. She called an hour ago. I press the button to listen to it as I head through the parking lot, my footsteps faltering when the voice clicks on. No, not Kennedy. Madison. Mommy said I could call you because when I woke up you were gone. She said you ate Pescatis, but then you had to go. And I'm going to eat some now because it's my favorite other than cheese pizza with just cheese. Maybe we can have some tomorrow when I'm not at school. We could play again if my mommy says it's okay, but you should ask and not me because it's a school night. But she might say yes if you ask. Kennedy laughs in the background saying, I can hear you. Uh-oh, Madison whispers. I gotta go now. Smiling to myself after she hangs up, I open my texts and send one to Kennedy. Sorry I missed it, but thanks for letting her call. Her response comes right away. Of course. I consider it a moment before typing, Any chance we can do it again tomorrow? I'll supply the pizza if you'll supply the kid. As soon as I hit send, I type another. Completely my idea, of course. There isn't a response, not right away at least. I slip my phone in my pocket and make the trek to the inn, the neighborhood quiet. Reaching the place, I step up on the porch as my phone vibrates with a message. I look at it, my stomach dropping. I don't think so. Before I can put the phone away, I see she's typing again. It goes on and on and on as I stand here waiting, trying not to get my hopes up. It feels like a fucking century before the message comes through. I'm going to be busy at work, but Tuesday is better. Is that okay with you? Sounds good. I slip my phone away as the front door of the inn yanks open, McCleskey appearing in the doorway. You planning on coming in, or are you going to spend the night out here? There's a bite to her words, but it doesn't get under my skin. I step past her. 
Not sure which would be more comfortable. Porch, probably. I might even toss you a pillow. They always did say you were hospitable. And they always said you were a bit of a rascal. A rascal, I mumble. Indeed, she says. But if you ask me, I'd say that's putting it mildly. Well, good thing we're not asking you, huh? She laughs at that, patting me on the back. Certainly is, because if we were asking me, there's quite a bit I'd have to say. Like? I regret it the moment I ask that. This woman wouldn't hesitate to drag me to hell and back with venom of her words. Oh, no. I'm not playing that game. What game? The one where I give you more reason to mope around here with that poor me attitude? I'm not moping, he says in a mopey voice. I laugh as she mocks me. I'll have you know I've actually had a good day. Well, good for you, she says. If you're hungry, there's food in the kitchen, but I'm going to bed, so keep all the ruckus down. Yes, ma'am. Monday came and went. I almost spent the entire day in bed, but McCleskey wasn't having that shit. I woke up to pounding on the bedroom door sometime in the afternoon. A list of chores tossed at me. Things to do. Since you're staying here, she said, you might as well do something. I did it all, or at least what I could. Cleaning, hanging pictures, fixing a creaky door. It wasn't easy with my wrist fucked up, and I'm not used to manual labor, but I made it work. Keeping busy. Waiting for Tuesday. Tuesday. When five o'clock Tuesday evening comes, I approach the apartment, carrying two large pizzas. A cheese pizza with only cheese, like Madison requested, the other a monstrosity made with ham and pineapple. Hesitantly, I knock hearing a flurry of footsteps inside before the door yanks open, the little ball of energy in front of me, grinning. Madison, Jacqueline? Kennedy shouts, popping up in my line of sight. What did I say about answering the door like that? Oh! Her eyes widen, and before I can say a word, she swings the door shut, slamming it in my face. I stand here for a moment before the door cracks open again, her head peeking out as she whispers, You gots to knock! As soon as it shuts again, I tap on the door. Who's there? She yells. Jonathan? Jonathan who? I laugh, shifting the pizzas around when they start slipping from my grip. Before I can answer, the door opens once more, Kennedy standing there. Sorry, she mumbles, motioning for me to come in as she grasps Madison by the shoulders, steering her along. We're working on this stranger danger thing. She's way too trusting. But I know it was him, Madison protests. You can never be too sure, Kennedy says. It's always best to double check. I open my mouth to offer an opinion, but stop myself. Not sure if I'm at that place where my advice is welcome. I'm not trying to get kicked out before even eating any pizza. So, uh, where should I... I hold up the pizza boxes as I trail off. Oh, right. Kitchen table's fine. I'll show you, Madison announces, as if I don't know where it is, but I let her lead me there anyway. Kennedy shuts the door and follows behind us. I set the boxes on the table and Madison doesn't hesitate, popping the top one open. She makes a face, looking horrified. Gross. What in the world are you... Kennedy laughs as she glances at the pizza. Ham and pineapple. Why is that fruit on the pizza? Madison asks. Because it's good, Kennedy says, snatching the top box away before opening the other one. There, that one's for you. Madison shrugs it off, grabbing a slice of cheese pizza, eating straight from the box. I'm gathering this is normal, since Kennedy sits down beside her to do the same. You remembered, she says, plucking a piece of pineapple off a slice of pizza and popping it in her mouth. Of course, I say, grabbing a slice of cheese from the box Madison is hoarding. Pretty sure I'm scarred for life because of it. Not something I can forget. She laughs, the sound soft, as she gives me one of the most genuine smiles I've seen in a while. It fades as she averts her gaze. But God damn it, it happened. You should have got the breads, 
Madison says, standing on her chair as she leans closer, vying for my attention like she's afraid I might not see her. And the chickens! Uh, didn't know you liked those, I tell her, or I would have gotten them. Next time, she says just like that, no question about it. Next time, I say. And soda too, she says. No soda, Kennedy chimes in. Madison glances at her mother before leaning even closer, damn near right up on me, whisper shouting, Soda! I'm not so sure your mom will like that, I say. It's okay, Madison says. She tells Grandpa no soda too, but he lets me have it. That's because you emotionally blackmail him, Kennedy says. Nuh-uh, Madison says, looking at her mother. I don't blackmail him. Kennedy scoffs. How do you know? You don't even know what that means. So, Madison says, I don't mail him nothing. I'm trying not to laugh. I am. But Jesus Christ, it's almost like she's arguing with herself. Kennedy was always stubborn as hell, but I've never been any better. It's why, when the two of us fought, things got ugly. You give him those sad puppy dog eyes, Kennedy says, grabbing Madison by the chin, squeezing her chubby cheeks. And you tell him you'll love him the mostest if he gives you some Coca-Cola to drink. Cause I will, Madison says. That's emotional blackmail. Oh. Madison makes a face, turning to me when her mother lets go of her. How about root beer? I'm afraid not, I tell her. Sorry. Madison scowls, hopping down from the table to grab a juice box from the refrigerator. Silence surrounds the table but it only lasts a moment before Madison decides on something else she wants to talk about. The kid can ease even the most awkward situations, I'm realizing, as she chatters away, telling some story about something somebody at school did for show-and-tell today. Go wash up, Kennedy tells her when she's done eating, pizza sauce all over her hands and face. Finish your homework and then you can play. Madison jumps down from the table to run off. I hear water running in the distance as Kennedy puts the leftovers away. Homework in kindergarten? I say. It's just drawing stuff, she says, sitting back down across from me. Draw three things that start with the letter S. Not hard, but she loves art, so she never stops at three. It always ends up like an entire picture book. Sounds like someone else I know. Her mother, who drums her fingers along the table, looking anxious. She always was fidgety but she used to channel that energy into creating. Do you still write? I ask. No. Why not? She shrugs. I want her to look at me. I know that's hypocritical. It's selfish. I want a lot. I'm asking for a lot, more than I deserve after everything that happened. I hurt her, and I wish I could take it back, be the man she thought I was. I reach across the table, my fingertips barely grazing hers, before she pulls her hands away. They disappear beneath the table, clenched into fists, probably. Wouldn't doubt it. It does the trick, though, her gaze meeting mine. What can I do? I ask. I'll do it. I'm sounding fucking desperate, I know, but I am. My therapist would tell me it's unhealthy, that I'm being codependent. Jack would probably tell me to stop being a pathetic son of a bitch. Cliff, he'd likely remind me that I have the whole world at my fingertips, but that doesn't seem to matter. Not when the first person to ever truly believe in me looks at me like I'm the worst of the worst. She hesitates a moment, but before she can say anything, Madison waltzes in, slapping her paper down on the table between us. I need more, that's an S, she says, her paper filled with a dozen of them. Overachiever. Snowflake, Kennedy says, scanning the paper, her hands back on the table as she points to something. You spelled scissors wrong. There's a C after the first S. Madison scowls, grabbing the paper to run out. As soon as she's gone, I try again, reaching across the table for Kennedy's hands. She doesn't pull away this time when I touch her, my hands covering hers. Why are you doing this? She asks, her voice quiet. It's been six years, Jonathan. Six years. I know, but I just... You just what? Assume I still love you? Do you? She shakes her head, 
But it's not a denial. It's more exasperation that I have the nerve to ask her that question. Madison runs back in, and I pull my hands away, dropping it. How did you spell scissors? She asks, erasing the word on her paper. Kennedy spells it out, and she writes it before tossing her pencil down. Done. Good job, Kennedy says. You can play now. Madison turns to me. Do you want to play? Of course, I say, following her to her bedroom, figuring it best to give her mother some space, lest I push her too far and she punch me in the face. I'm secure in my manhood. I have no qualms playing with dolls. So when Madison shoves a Barbie at me, I don't even balk. I'll give her the best goddamn Barbie performance she ever saw, if that's what she wants. I stare at the Barbie, though, as Madison digs through a toy box. It looks different than the ones my sister played with growing up. This Barbie looks more like a scientist than a stripper, fully clothed, her hair still intact. Found it, Madison says, holding up another doll. I freeze when I look at it, seeing the familiar white and blue suit and the head of blonde hair. You've got to be kidding me. They made me into a doll. Or him, rather. Breezio. Not an action figure, no. A straight-up collector's edition Barbie doll. I'll be Breezio and Barbie can be Marianne for you, she says, sitting down on the floor and patting the wood beside her. Wait, shouldn't I be Breezio? You're him all the time, so it's my turn now. Well, can't argue with that logic. Barbie's got the wrong color hair, I say. Don't you have a Mary Ann doll? No, because it costs too many dollars, but you can pretend, right? Right, I say, although she suddenly looks skeptical, like she doubts my abilities. Don't worry, I've got this. She starts things off. I don't know what's happening, and she doesn't give me any direction, so I'm improvising. She switches things up on me, throwing in plot twists. We're on the run from some bad guys before suddenly we're in school. I graduate, we both become veterinarians to her stuffed animals, and next thing I know, I'm running for president of the world. It's funny. She's funny. The girl is quick on her feet. She gets distracted eventually, though, and puts down the doll to draw again. She's intense about it, in a trance, and I excuse myself, but I don't know if she notices. Picking up the Brizio doll, I stroll down the hallway, seeing movement in another room. Kennedy's bedroom. She's sitting on the edge of her bed, changed out of her work uniform, wearing sweats and a tank top, busy pulling her hair up. I stall when I reach the doorway, still lurking in the hall, not wanting to invade her space. She eyes me warily, her attention shifting to the doll I'm holding. She laughs. Yeah, she fucking laughs. Did she make you perform for her? She asks, nodding to the doll. No, she actually made me be Barbie, I say. I don't think she was that impressed with my skills because she gave up and went back to drawing. Another laugh. I could listen to that sound forever. Don't take it personal, she says, brushing past me out of the bedroom. I'm sure you did a better job than I do. I usually get demoted to an audience member. Kennedy heads to the living room. I follow her, curious, as she settles in on the couch, turning on the television. She curls up, flipping through channels in silence, the room dim. The sun is setting outside, which means they'll soon be going to bed. Do you work every day? I ask. Weekdays. So you have weekends off? Usually, she says. I work while Maddie's in school. And when you're not working, what do you do? She cuts her eyes at me like I'm stupid. I'm guessing this is it. I should probably get going, I say, strolling back to Madison's bedroom, finding her still drawing. Hey, Maddie. Huh? I'm gonna go now. She stops what she's doing. Why? Because it's getting late. But why can't you stay? Because I fucked up years ago and I don't know if I can ever make things right again. I just can't, I say. But I'll come back. Tomorrow? Uh, not tomorrow, but soon. When soon? First chance I get, I'll be here. Okay, she says, turning back to her drawing. Bye. Bye, Maddie. Kennedy eyes me warily when I walk back into the living room. I have to head back to the city in the morning, I say, hesitating near the front door. You're leaving already? She says, a sharpness to her words. 
It's almost accusatory. Should have known. I'm coming back, I'm sure you are. I don't think she believes me. As much as I want to stay and convince her, I know she won't believe me until I prove myself. So I leave the apartment, closing the door, and stand there until I hear her locking up. Well, if it isn't my favorite client, I stall in the doorway of McCleskey's kitchen the moment those words strike me. Cliff. Morning sunshine streams through the downstairs of the inn, already warming the place to uncomfortable levels, because the old broad doesn't believe in air conditioning. Cliff sits at the kitchen table, eating what looks like an omelet, eyes glued to the blackberry beside his plate. McCleskey is busy doing dishes across the room, scrubbing a pan she obviously used to cook for him this morning. What the hell? Are you talking to me? I ask, not entirely sure at this point. Who else would I be talking to? I don't know. I mumble, sitting down across from him. Could be anybody. He looks at me, eyes carefully scanning my face. I know what he's looking for. The signs. I'm pretty sure I look like hell. I haven't even bothered to shave. But he's not going to see them today. Not going to see the signs. I want to say fuck him for thinking he might, but I can't really blame him for the suspicion, can I? I've fucked up plenty of times. How are you? He asks. Sober? I mumble. I can see that, he says. Otherwise? Kind of tired? I glance at his plate. Kind of hungry? I'm sure your lovely hostess would be happy to whip you up some breakfast. No, McCleskey chimes in. I wouldn't. Or not, Cliff says, taking the last bite of his omelet, not even phased. It's fine, I say. I don't need anybody to take care of me. I can fend for myself. Cliff drops his fork. If that was true, I'd be out of a job. Whatever. What are you even doing here? How'd you figure out where I was staying? It's a small town, he says. There weren't many options. And I'm here because you haven't been answering your phone, so I wasn't sure if you remembered you had an appointment. Figured I'd tag along so you didn't have to go alone. I remembered, I say, and thanks. But for the record, if you'd finally hire a new assistant, I wouldn't have to concern myself with your schedule. It's been over a year since you've had anyone helping you. I still don't understand why you fired the last guy. He was a crackhead, and you were a cokehead. He stole from me. What did he steal, your drugs? I'm not going to dignify that with a response. It's true, but still, fuck that assumption. Can we go, I ask. I want to get this day over with. Huh. Thought you were less of a moody prick these days. I am. I'm just... I don't know. Sounds like you. Cliff grabs his Blackberry and shoves his chair back as McCleskey takes his empty plate. Breakfast was wonderful. Thank you. Anytime, McCleskey says, smiling. I enjoy cooking for those that appreciate things. I let that one slide. Cliff stands, motioning for me to follow him, waiting until we're outside before he says, Man, does that woman give you a hard time or what? Always has, I say. First time I ever got arrested, she was the one who called the police. Cliff laughs as we approach a sleek black sedan. Nice car, I say. I rented it, he says. Didn't want to call for a car service and give away your location. I appreciate that. Just doing my job he says. Come on, I'll drive. I climb in the passenger seat. I have a car. It's parked in a private garage in the city. I had it hauled in when filming started in case I needed it, but I'm not supposed to drive until the doctor clears me. Stick shift. It takes over two hours to get to the city. Another hour in traffic. Cliff valets the car when we reach the medical center. Wheel Cornell. Orthopedics. I lower my head as we pass dozens of people, making our way to the seventh floor, going straight to the orthopedic surgeon's office, where they are awaiting my arrival. Look, I get it. It's bullshit. Not just anybody can walk in and be seen right away bypassing the waiting rooms. It's a privilege I'm grateful for, especially today. I'm nervous enough being here, dealing with this. Anticipation and paranoia would make it insufferable. Mr. Cunning, how are you? the doctor asks, standing up and holding his hand out, expecting me to shake it, even wearing the sling. Okay, I say, ignoring his extended hand. 
Ready to get this over with? A man on a mission, he says. I like that. He doesn't waste any more time sending me straight for x-rays. It hurts like a son of a bitch when they examine my wrist, burning pain shooting up my arm and down to the tips of my fingers. Well, the good news is the bones haven't shifted, so it doesn't appear you'll need surgery, the doctor says. Bad news, of course, is you'll be in a cast for the next few weeks. Awesome, I mutter, flexing my fingers. How many weeks? Cliff asks, standing in the corner of the office on his Blackberry. Hard to say for sure. Four, I'd estimate. So another month, Cliff asks. Yes, the doctor says. He'll likely need some occupational therapy afterward. But he'll be out of the cast? Yes, good to know, Cliff says. Is there any way to speed up the healing process? Well, there's no miracle treatment, but some things might help. Vitamins, calcium, exercises. So get a stress ball and drink milk? Pretty much, the doctor says. Leafy greens are good. They talk back and forth about me like I'm not even here. I stare down at my swollen wrist in annoyance as I wiggle my fingers. Anyway, let's get you wrapped up, the doctor says. So you can be on your way. A white fiberglass cast. He doesn't bother with the frilly, colored bullshit, keeping it simple before sending me on my way. I climb into the passenger seat of Cliff's rental, and he immediately starts rambling. If you're out of the cast in the next few weeks, you can probably film again sooner than expected. You think so? I ask, watching him as he goes through his Blackberry, checking his calendar. You've got a stunt double to handle the action, so all they need is your voice. He cuts his eyes at me. And that pretty face of yours, of course? Of course, I mutter, trying like hell not to let that bruise my ego, but damn, acting is more than just reciting lines. What about Serena? What about her? She's in rehab. So? So how are we going to start filming again next month if she's gone for 90 days? He gives me a look, like I've lost my mind. You really think she'll last that long? You don't? You never lasted, he says. Not until you hit bottom. And you don't think she has? Not even close. The only reason she's there right now is because the studio demanded it, he says. But don't worry about that. I'll take care of her. You worry about getting better. Previously. Illegal Rendezvous. During the Revolutionary War... Aaron Burr had an illicit affair with the wife of a British officer. You tell the girl that story. You think it'll make her feel better. She asks you who Aaron Burr is. You laugh, because you can't understand how she's surviving at Fulton Edge when she doesn't even know the name of the man who killed Alexander Hamilton. But she is. She's surviving. Maybe even thriving. She works hard and she's passing. Meanwhile, you barely pay attention and still ace every test. But you show up to class now, every single day. Maybe you do it because you don't want to be expelled. You've made it this far, might as well see it through. Or maybe you show up to be with her. Both of you are on track to graduate in a month, the entire school year almost gone in a blink. You spent most of it sneaking around, whispered conversations and secret rendezvous, meeting under the cloak of darkness without her dad knowing. He forbid her from seeing you. He told her you would cause nothing but trouble. Thing is, she already knew that. That wasn't enough to stop her. So, Vassar, huh? You ask, sitting beside her on the picnic table at the park near her house. It's dark, pushing midnight, and you just got done with a full rehearsal for Julius Caesar. The drama club is putting it on in three weeks as part of graduation festivities. Liberal arts. Bet your dad loves that. Yeah, he looked at me about the same way he did when he realized we were sleeping together. Man, he hadn't taken that well at all. Full-blown rage to the point of taking his grievances to his boss. 
Your father shrugged it off, though, saying you've done worse things than bedding a girl. Needless to say, her dad isn't enjoying his job much anymore. She's committed to attending Vassar College next year. Meanwhile, you haven't decided anything. You're not even sure you want to go to college. You have dreams, but they don't include studying law at Princeton. You got accepted. Somehow. You didn't even apply. The whole thing reeks of your father. Congratulations, you say. It's a great school. The future isn't something you and her have talked much about. You've never even given this thing you have a title. No promises. You don't promise things. Ever. But the future is coming up fast. It's about to be the present, and whatever this is between you is going to be affected. She nudges you with her shoulder. Will you come see me? I'm sure I'll pop up from time to time. You better, she says. I'm going to miss you. She's getting emotional, her voice cracking around those words. We've still got a few weeks, you say, shoving up from the picnic table as you grab her hand, pulling her to her feet. Let's not waste tonight worrying about it. You take a walk together, holding hands. There's an inn nearby, beyond the edge of the park. A cranky, middle-aged woman runs it, one of the only people you've ever encountered on your nights when you meet up here. The inn is dark tonight. Sheets hang out on a clothesline, left overnight. You snatch one off. Along the water, you lay it down on the grass. You lay her down on top of it. You know you'll have some privacy tucked back here, away from the picnic area. You don't want to waste any more of tonight. Every stitch of clothing is removed, and you take your time teasing her and tasting her before you make love to her. You're going to miss her, too. You don't tell her that, not with words, but she knows. She feels it in every kiss, in every thrust of your hips. You make her laugh as you're deep inside of her. You tell her she's beautiful as she moans beneath you. You lay there after you finish, still on top of her, catching your breath as you kiss her neck. You're careful not to leave marks anymore. There's a rustling nearby, along the water, shadows moving in the darkness. You only have the moonlight to see. Whatever it is comes closer, closer, closer. It's coming right for you. The girl notices. She screams, the piercing sound shattering the silence of the night when the thing in the shadows makes a noise beside her. Quack! She shoves you off of her. You're laughing too hard to calm her down. She scrambles away, shrieking, yanking the sheet out from under you to wrap up in it, scattering your clothes. It's just a duck, you tell her, sitting naked in the grass. You're still laughing as the duck veers toward her, quacking like crazy in reaction to the noise she's making. A duck, she says. What does it want? Oh my god, it's following me. Why is it following me? It's probably hungry, you say. Do I look like duck food? She asks, trying to shoo it away. Go home, Daffy. You get to your feet and gather up the clothes, tossing hers at her. The duck waddles off, heading for the water. It's too late, though. She made too much of a ruckus. There's movement again. More ducks are coming. She runs away, toward the inn, carrying her clothes. You start to follow when a blast of light shatters the night. A flashlight. You freeze, alarmed. Someone is there. The girl hides in the backyard of the inn, but you hesitate too long. The flashlight finds you as a voice calls out, Police, let me see your hands. Your clothes drop. You stand there in all your naked glory and hold your hands up in front of you as a police officer approaches. He orders you to get dressed before putting you in handcuffs. The girl starts to step out from the shadows. The police don't know she's there, but you do, and you shake your head, warning her not to do it. The woman who runs the inn heard noises outside and called the police. Trespassers. 
She stands on her back porch, watching you get arrested. Indecent exposure. And you don't know this, but that girl? She runs the whole way home, wrapped up in nothing but that stolen sheet, her clothes abandoned. Her mother is awake when she gets there and hears her come in. You see, the woman has known her daughter sneaks out at night for months, but she's never said a word about it. A mother knows. She knows what it's like to love the boy the world tries to keep you from. Her mother would lay awake at night, listening to make sure she made it back home, but this morning is different. The woman senses it. The girl confesses. She tells her you were arrested. Don't worry, her mother says. I'll help him. 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 13. Kennedy. You interested in going out tonight? I absently tap my fingers against the screen as I stare at the text message on my phone, debating how to answer that. Yes? No? Yes? No. Ugh. I type out some long-winded excuse before erasing it with a groan, typing some more utter crap before erasing that also. I type out, no, straight to the point, but uh, I feel guilty, so I instead type sure and press send like an idiot. The second that it says delivered beneath the text bubble, I want to slap myself. So many regrets already. Ugh, what is wrong with you? I ask myself, making a face as I start to type an excuse to get me out of it. A throat clears behind me. Wouldn't know where to start. That voice. It catches me off guard. So close I can feel his warm breath fanning across my skin. A chill shoots through me, my hands shaking as I spin around, losing grip of my phone. It drops, landing face down on the hard epoxy tile of the aisle. I cringe when it hits, but I don't reach for it because of him. Jonathan. He's right there, standing here in the grocery store, a foot of space between us, so close I have to look up to meet his eyes. My heart stalls a beat, being a traitorous nitwit before it hammers in my chest, aggressively battering my rib cage like my insides are declaring war on my sanity. Jonathan picks up my phone as it makes a noise. Before I can stop him, he glances at the screen and freezes. Something flashes in his eyes. He looks horrified. Oh, God. It's broken, isn't it? He blinks at me. Huh? My phone. Oh, uh, no. Shaking it off, he hands the phone to me, screen still intact. Whoever Andrew is wants a time. What time should I pick you up? The text is prominently displayed. My stomach bottoms out, my hands are still shaking, and I shove the phone in my back pocket without answering that question. What are you doing here? I ask. I thought you left town. I did, he says. I told you I'd be back, didn't I? Yes, but I didn't know you meant that quick. I wouldn't have noticed you left. Why do you even tell me? Figured you should know. Why? He shrugs, like maybe he doesn't understand it either. Before either of us can make sense of things, a feminine voice rings out in the aisle beside us, calling my name. Bethany. Panic flows through me. I don't give it much thought, acting in the moment, a knee-jerk reaction to her approach. I grab a hold of him, gripping tight to his arm and take off in a hurry. He doesn't resist, doesn't put up a fight as I drag him down the aisle, away from the sound of her voice, and shove him into a small back stock room. I dart inside and shut the door, casting us in near total darkness. I can't see Jonathan anymore, but I can feel him, right behind me, pressing up against me, his hand coming to rest on my hip. His touch heightens my panic. I shove away from him, putting space between us. 
Why are you here? I ask, keeping my voice low. You can't be here. I, uh... Kennedy? Bethany calls out from the other side of the door. Are you back here? Don't talk, I hiss at Jonathan. Don't even breathe. I open the door again and slip out, leaving it cracked behind me as I come face to face with Bethany. Her brow furrows as she looks into the pitch black room behind me. What are you doing? Inventory. In the dark? Yeah, I, uh, yep. I glance behind me before turning back to her. Did you need something? Marcus told me to find you. Her face twists into a fake pout. Oh, God. I asked for the Saturday off in two weeks, and he said the only way I can have it is if I find someone to cover. And you want me to do it? Please. She pokes her bottom lip out. I wouldn't ask, but it's important. Okay. BreezeCon is that weekend, and they're having this big thing for the 10th anniversary of Ghosted? Okay. And I know it probably sounds silly to you, but I said, okay, go, have fun. You mean it? Wouldn't say it if I didn't. She lets out a squeal and hugs me. Thank you, Kennedy. Oh my God, you're the best. You're welcome, I say, prying her off. I'm gonna get back to, you know, stuff. I nod toward the stock room. Her eyes narrow. What are you really doing? Bye, Bethany. I slip back in the room, slamming the door and leaning up against it. Humor tinges every syllable of Jonathan's words as he says, She sounds like you back in high school. How scary could she be? Rolling my eyes, I feel along the wall beside me, flicking up the light switch. It doesn't make it very bright, but I can see him propped up against a crate, a smirk on his lips. She writes fanfic, I tell him. The self-insert kind. His smile only grows. I'm not talking about Breezio. Oh, no. I'm talking about Johnny Cunning fanfic. Erotica. The first flicker of concern shows on his eyes, but he still smiles. So did you. I roll my eyes. That's completely different. Still, she's just a girl with fantasies, he says. Nothing to hide from. True, but do you really think she'll keep it to herself? Come on, her idol shows up where she works. The only way it could ever be more thick come true is if we were working in a coffee shop here. Before you even made it out the door, it would be all over social media. But, I mean, unless that's what you want. He shakes his head. Didn't think so. It grows quiet for a moment before he says, Kale. Kale. That's why I'm here. I needed to grab Kale. Oh. That's all I say. It grows quiet again. Awkward. There are no windows in here, making the room feel impossibly small. Just him and I, confined together after all this time breathing the same air, the room filled to the brim with strained silence. So much to say, but no words strong enough to clear the air between us. I wish shit wasn't so weird, he says eventually. I wish you weren't so distant. Yeah, well, that's what happens when people break up. I know. I just wish there was a way we could... Could what? He doesn't answer right away, looking away from me like he's struggling to find a way to explain. Forget? Move on? Start over? B, he says. I wish we could just be. For such a talented actor, he wasn't always good at expressing himself with me. But then again, I wasn't much better. Maybe that was why we worked so well. He spoke through the characters he played, and I... Well, I used to create... 
the two of us always seemed to be on the same page until the day we just weren't anymore, and there was no way to get back to that place once we struggled so much to communicate. But for a time, we just... were. It's the most comforting feeling in the world. When you lose it, though, it's the most confusing. It's like losing a piece of your soul. I'm sorry, he says, glancing at me again. How many times are you going to apologize? As many as it takes until you believe me. I do, I say. I believe you. You do? Yeah, I do. He stares at me when I say that. He doesn't respond, but I can tell he's holding back some reaction. Anyway, we should get you out of here before you get spotted, I say, pushing away from the door. I can grab your kale for you. I turn to leave, but he stops me, grabbing my arm as he stands up from the crate. I tense, letting out a shuddering exhale when he pulls me to him. It's just a brief moment as he holds me there, a breath away, so close that if I stood on my tiptoes, I could taste his lips if I wanted to. I do. Or at least some part of me, deep down, does. A stirring in my gut that almost spurs me on. The moment he touches me, it's like I'm drunk. But the moment is over, just like that, when he says, I also need milk. His voice, those words, they sober me up. Milk. Yes, he says, letting go of my arm. If you don't mind. Uh, sure. No problem. I walk out, and he follows, diverting halfway through the store to head for the exit while I grab his stuff. I don't hear any frantic screams, so I assume he made it out. Bethany lingers at her register, not paying attention to any of her surroundings, flipping through the latest edition of Hollywood Chronicles. Anything interesting? I ask, setting the kale and the milk on the conveyor belt. Bethany sighs, tossing the tabloid aside. Not really. I swear, it's like Johnny Cunning vanished into thin air. Nobody has seen him anywhere. My eyes flicker to the exit, catching a faint glimpse of him lurking outside. I'm sure he's... around. I hope so, she says. Ugh! I hope he's not, like, dead in a ditch somewhere. That would suck. Yeah, it would, I agree, as she rings the stuff up. After I pay for it, she picks the tabloid back up and continues reading. I make my way outside once she's distracted, carrying the bag to where Jonathan lingers. Here, I say, shoving it at him. Your milk and your kale so you can go feed ducks or whatever you're doing with it. He lets out a light laugh. It's for me. Doctor's orders. That's horrible. Uh, it could be worse. If you say so, I mumble, glancing at my watch. I should get back to work. I go to head back to the store when he calls out to me. Okay? I glance at him, words on the tip of my tongue, but I don't get a single syllable out. The look on his face stuns me into silence. The vulnerability, like he's splitting himself open right now. Thank you, he says, quietly. I nod, hesitating before saying, If you change your mind about eating the kale, I'm sure Maddie would be happy to help you get rid of it. He smiles. It's a genuine smile, unconscious, like happiness is radiating from inside of him at that suggestion. I don't say anything else, nor do I wait for his response. Being around him is proving dangerous for my feelings. Dangerous to my sanity. I head back into the store, strolling past Bethany at her register. She sets the tabloid down to look at me. Didn't you just leave? I stepped outside, I say. I still have another hour until my shift is over. What did you do with your stuff? Put it in my car? Even the milk? Uh, yeah. But won't it go bad in this heat? Probably. She stares at me, mumbling. 
I swear, you're so weird sometimes. I should cancel. You should do no such thing. Megan's voice is pointed. Matter of fact, don't you freaking argue with me when she says that. What you should do is take the guy for a ride, if you know what I'm saying. Megan, I'm serious, she says. Just a quick spin around the block to see how he runs. Make that engine purr for a little while. Since when are you pro-Drew? I'm not, she makes a face of disgust. I'm pro-orgasm, and I know it's been a long while since you've had one. I laugh, until a little voice chimes in, asking, What's that? Maddie sits at the kitchen table across from Megan, swinging her legs as she draws her heart out on a piece of paper. What's what? I ask, leaning back against the kitchen counter, arms crossed over my chest. What Aunt Megan said, Maddie says. What's the orga... uh... Organism, I blurt out, realizing she's about to ask us what an orgasm is. Organism, she says. What's that? It's from science, Megan says. It's what they call a living thing, you know, anything that's alive. You don't got one of those? Maddie asks, looking up from her drawing, eyebrows raised. Not for a long time. Well, I have you, I say, pausing beside her chair as I ruffle her hair. You're as alive as it gets. Don't need anything else. Not even those crazy organisms Megan's all about. Maddie seems pretty pleased with that answer as she goes back to drawing, while Megan shoots me a look, half apologetic, half pathetic. I roll my eyes, flipping her off out of Maddie's line of sight. I guess I ought to get dressed. Something sexy, Megan shouts at me. I go with something simple instead. Skinny jeans, black flats, black shirt. I brush my hair, leaving the dark locks hanging loose, and put on a dash of makeup. Done. Megan scrunches up her nose at me, but she keeps her opinion to herself. Mommy, can you do my stars? Maddie asks, shoving her paper and pencil at me. Sure thing, I say. I'm not sure what it is she's making, but I can tell the skyline easily. I've showed her the easy way to draw stars a few times. Mountain, diagonal, across, connect, but she always asks me to do them for her, since it's pretty much the only thing I can draw. A knock echoes from the front door of the apartment. Megan sighs as she shoves her chair back to stand, whispering as she passes me, Sounds like your organism is here. I'll be right there, I mumble finishing up the stars before handing the pencil back to Maddie. I have to go, sweetheart. Where? Out with my friend. Can I come this time? Not tonight, I tell her, frowning when I see the disappointment in her eyes. Someday, though. Is it your friend that didn't see you were pretty last time? Uh, yeah, same one. She makes a face. I almost laugh but then I hear another knock on the door, Megan's voice ringing out over the sound of it as she says, Jesus, hold your damn ho- Oh my fucking God. No. I tense at the sudden change in her tone from flippant to shocked within half a word. No, 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 she chants before saying, get the fuck out of here. I look out of the kitchen toward the front door, heart wildly racing. Jonathan stands on the small stoop in front of my apartment, a mere few feet in front of his sister. Megan, he says, nodding to her in greeting. The moment he says her name, the shock wears away, replaced by anger as her eyes narrow. No, she says, matter of fact, slamming the door right in his face. Maddie jumps at the sound of the bang. Megan, I groan. Please. I don't need a scene, not one I'll have to try to explain. Megan yanks the door back open. Jonathan still stands there, having not moved at all. Maddie gasps, noticing him, and jumps down from her chair at the table, snatching up her drawing as she runs for the door. Jonathan!
nothing. Hey, he says, avoiding looking at his sister, instead smiling at Maddie. You're back, she shoves her paper at him. I was making you a picture. Wow, he says, looking at it. It's amazing. It's not done, she says, snatching it back from him. But all I gotta do is the people now, because Mommy draw the stars. Well, there's some great stars, he says, meeting my gaze. I'm sure it'll be perfect. You can have it when it's done, she tells him. Are you gonna stay? You can play with me and Aunt Megan. Megan makes a noise. Not tonight, he says. I just came by to talk to your mom for a minute. Maddie frowns, mumbling, Okay, before she shuffles away. Jonathan closes his eyes, letting out a deep sigh. I can tell he wants to change his mind. Maybe tomorrow, I chime in, stepping in Maddie's path so she'll stop walking. Grasping her chin, I tilt her head up, making her look at me. It's kind of late to be playing tonight anyway. Tomorrow, Jonathan agrees. I'll be here. Her eyes light up, disappointment fading. See you tomorrow, she yells back at him before wrapping her arms around me. Love you, Mommy. Love you too, I say. More than banana popsicles and Hawaiian pizza. More than the dates with your friend? Oh, pff, of course, I playfully squeeze her cheeks. More than dates with anybody. Leaning down, I give her a quick kiss before she runs off to her bedroom. The second she's out of the room, the second she's out of earshot, Megan's voice cuts in, a low growl as she says, You better bring your ass back here tomorrow, little brother, because if you lied to her right in front of me, I swear to God. I said I'll be here, he says, turning to look at Megan, his expression hard. I'm not going to lie to her. Oh, is that right? Yes, he says. Well, excuse me, she throws her hands up. Stupid me, should have known. I mean, you've only lied to every fucking buddy else. Forgot you were daddy of the year. Now's not the time for this, I grumble, stalking over and coming between them. Sort this out when there aren't little ears nearby. I push Jonathan away from the apartment as I step outside, shutting the front door behind me to give us some privacy. Otherwise, Megan might be inclined to add her commentary like my life is an episode of Mystery Science Theater 3000. Sorry about this, he says, motioning toward the apartment. I forgot, well, that you had plans. It's fine, I say. What did you need to talk to me about? I just... I was thinking. He's hesitating, stalling. I can tell he's nervous from the way he averts his gaze. About? About something that girl said at your work. My brow furrows, and it takes a moment before I figure out who he means. Bethany? Is that her name? He stares off into space, mumbling. Bethany. You met her once, I tell him. She came to the set, said she saw you outside of a bar. He lets out a light laugh. Ah, <laughs> right. Bethany. She asked me about that time I got arrested. She did. She told me about it, and all I can think is how incredibly happy she'd be to know he remembered her. Anyway, he says that nervousness creeping back in. Bethany mentioned wanting time off so she could go to that thing. The convention? Yeah, you know, for the Brizio shit, and I was thinking, and just wondering. Wondering what? If maybe I could take Madison? It takes a moment for those words to sink in, for what he's asking me to register. I blink at him, at a loss for words, a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to think. A voice in the back of my mind is screaming out, on defense, terrified by that. But my heart, my stupid, stupid heart is soaring at him wanting to do that with her. I, 
uh... I shake my head, trying to clear my thoughts. Wow. I know I'm asking for a lot, he says. I'm asking for some trust, just a little bit, and I don't blame you if you won't give it to me, but I just... I'm asking. Can I take her? I open my mouth, still having no idea what to say when movement catches my eye seconds before a voice cuts in. Am I interrupting? 8.30 on the dot, I'm guessing. Drew. I don't turn. Don't look at him right away, but Jonathan does. His back straightens, shoulders squaring, every inch of him rigid. I watch as his face clouds with confusion, hoping there's no recognition, but it's instant. Confusion gives way to a raw sort of anger, the kind that has simmered for ages. He glares at Drew like he wants to tear his heart out, rip it from his chest, and shove it down his throat. Jonathan's voice is as scathing as his gaze when he says, Hastings? Cunningham? Drew says, unfazed. What the hell are you doing? Why are you here? Drew points at me. Picking her up. I see it as Jonathan connects the dots, realizing he's the plan I have tonight. Andrew Hastings. It's been a long time since I've heard somebody call him by his last name alone. Jonathan turns to me, his expression hard as he tries to hold back his anger, but he's struggling. Him, Jonathan asks. This is who you're dating. This is the guy you're going out with. I start to answer, but he doesn't let me. Unbelievable, Jonathan shakes his head. How could you? Those words send my defenses up. Excuse me? He's a part of your life. Madison's life? Jesus Christ, you let him around her? What the hell are you thinking? Don't, I say, holding my hands up to stop him before he says anything else. Don't even go there right now. You should listen to the lady, Drew chimes in. And mind your business. This is my fucking business, Jonathan says, taking a step toward Drew, everything about him suddenly full of aggression. We're talking about my daughter here, mine. And I don't know what kind of shit you pulled to force your way into their lives, but you can't have her mother either. You can't have either one of them. You can't steal my fucking life. Stop it. I growl, stepping between them. Jonathan shakes his head, furious, left hand clenched into a fist. I don't think he's going to swing since his right hand is in a cast, but I can tell he wants to. And it doesn't help matters a bit when Drew laughs. Amusement coats his voice when he says, Can't steal what was up for grabs. That sets Jonathan off. He comes at Drew, but I'm in the way. I shove him hard, making him back up. Just leave, Jonathan, leave. He looks at me, his expression hard as he says, I can't believe you. Turning, he walks away, leaving me standing here fuming. Unbelievable. He can't believe me? Me, after everything he's done? He wants to act as if I'm the one in the wrong. I see he showed his face again, Drew says. How long has he been here? Uh, two weeks, maybe, I mumble, watching as Jonathan disappears into the night. You haven't mentioned it. Didn't want to talk about it, I say. Still don't. Fair enough. Drew grasps my shoulder, squeezing it gently. How about we get out of here? Forget this happened. Sounds good, I mumble, giving him a smile, but I know that's a lost cause. Forgetting this is out of the question. I can feel my blood simmering. I want to follow that man right into the darkness and give him a piece of my mind. 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 Fourteen. Jonathan. One step forward, fifty steps back. That's how it feels, like getting knocked on my ass the second I find the strength to stand up. 
My phone lays beside where I sit, on top of the old wooden picnic table, under the veil of darkness that earlier settled over the park. It's stupid. I'm stupid. No, worse than that, I'm weak. My contacts are open on the phone, the screen lit up, but I don't have it in me to press any buttons. The glass bottle feels heavy in my hands, a fifth of whiskey. I don't recognize the brand. I grab the first thing I came upon in the corner store on my way here, something cheap and rough. I can almost feel the burn. I stare at it, and stare at it, and fucking stare at it. The bottle's still sealed. Would be so easy to crack it open and take a drink, dull the pain, the anger, the anguish. Grasping the lid, I unscrew it, breaking the seal and getting a whiff of the strong, stringent liquor when my phone vibrates against the picnic table. Jack's name flashes on the screen. Sighing, I ignore it, but he calls back. Again. And again. God damn it, I mutter, answering his fourth call, hitting the button to put it straight on speaker. Always knew you'd be a pain in the ass, Jack. Didn't realize you were all so psychic. Jack laughs. What can I say? I sensed a disturbance in the force. Figured I'd spit some Yoda-isms at you for a bit. A fuck-up you are. Funny, I mutter. Truthfully, I was calling to congratulate you. For what? For going a week without gracing the front of a single tabloid, he says. Went to the grocery store earlier and didn't see your ugly mug anywhere. Made my day. I'm glad I could do that for you, I say. I appreciate it more than you know, he says. Now tell me what I can do for you. I hesitate, staring at the bottle. Nothing. Bullshit, he says. Try again. You know, you're supposed to be supportive and follow my lead. Again. Bullshit. If you wanted to be coddled, you would have picked someone else as your sponsor. That's not me. I'm not babying a grown-ass man when he's whining for a bottle. Yeah, well, fuck you. Spill it, cunning, he says with a laugh. Tell me how the big bad world hurt you. I'm not in the mood to talk, but I know he's not going to drop the subject, so fuck it. I ramble, telling him all about the shitty day I've had. He listens quietly, waiting until I'm done before he says, Well, that sucks. I laugh bitterly, because yeah, it does. It sucks. Your own fault, though, he adds. I know, I mutter. Do you? Because I'm guessing, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're probably sitting alone somewhere, moping about to drown your sorrows like you're the victim. I glance around the park. It's like he's watching me. Seriously, are you psychic? Nah, I just know you, he says. You're a self-sabotaging piece of shit some days. Thanks. You're welcome, he says. But you know, most days, you're pretty okay. That's nice of you. Too bad your movies suck. That makes me laugh. Yeah, too bad. But anyway, if you're done bitching about the poor, pitiful life of a Hollywood heartthrob... I'm going to get back to my glamorous existence of trolling online and talking shit about your kind in the comments section. You do that, I say. Thanks, Jack. Anytime, Cunning. Just call me next time. Sensing the force doesn't always work. I'm going to be pissed if you get drunk and I don't have the chance to yell at you about it first. I'll call, I tell him. Next time. Noise startles me awake, drawing me from a restless sleep, the sound of footsteps stomping up the creaky wooden stairs. I stare at the ceiling, trying to blink the grogginess away, as the sound grows louder, closer, shadows shifting outside the bedroom door. No hesitation, the door flings open so hard it slams into the wall. Light streams into the room from the hallway, disrupting the darkness. I wince, sitting straight up, trying to get my wits about me as I shield my eyes. What the hell? You've got some nerve, a voice says, a sharp edge of anger to those words, so angry, in fact, that it takes a second for me to recognize it. Kennedy? 
Caught off guard, I blink at her as she steps into the bedroom. Shadows mask her features, but it's her all right. She's here, a few feet from the bed. I rub my eyes, trying to wake up. Jesus, am I dreaming or something? I can't believe you, she says, stepping closer. That's what you said to me. I can't believe you. But I've done nothing wrong. Nothing. I blink at her, trying to make sense of that. What? What? Seriously? What? She throws her hands up, coming even closer. You act like I'm this horrible person, like I've done some horrible thing that you can't understand, but I didn't. I'm not. This isn't my fault. You left me, Jonathan. I didn't. You did. She's standing right in front of me, so close that I can see her hands shaking as she clenches them into fists, tears swimming in her eyes. I glance around, trying to get some sense of the time, but I'm not sure where my phone is and there's not a clock nearby. It's dark, though, pitch black, so I'm guessing it's past midnight. You left me, Kennedy, I say, looking back at her, not the other way around. You're wrong, she says. I walked away. There's a difference. You left me long before that. I was pregnant and you left me. I didn't. You did! I stall a moment when she cuts me off before saying, I didn't know. That doesn't make it any better. I want to argue, wanting to defend myself, but there's no defending this shit. Look, I was wrong and I'm sorry for that. So you keep saying, but sorry doesn't change anything, Jonathan. Not when you keep acting like, ugh, that... She waves toward me and I glance down at myself. What are you talking about? You show up here and have the nerve to try to weasel your way into my life, into my mind, like you have any right to be there after all this time. You have the nerve to judge me for who I hang around. You have the nerve to question my parenting, like I don't know what's best for my daughter. Something clicks with me when she says that, some of the fog lifting. Jesus, is this about him? Hastings? No, this is about you. She points at me. You and your innocent act, and your money and your things. The words you say, the jokes, the laughs, the smiles you give her that she eats right up, and ugh, your face. My face? Your stupid fucking face, she says, running her hands through her hair as she groans, those words startling me. Kennedy doesn't curse. Your face is everywhere. I'm sick of it. You're sick of my face. Yes. There's not much I can do about that. You can get out of my head, she says. Stop being there all the time. I laugh at that, because it's so damn absurd. But that's the wrong thing to do. Her eyes narrow as she stares me down, looking like she wants to hit me right now. I hate you, she says, her voice shaking. I've never hated someone as much as I hate you, Jonathan. Those words... They wake me right up. I'm no longer laughing. There's nothing funny about it. I got under her skin, and with the two of us already on shaky ground, I know that's dangerous. She turns to leave, like she's going to walk away, but I grab her arm to stop her. Come on. Don't be like that. Don't touch me, she says, ripping from my grasp. I let go as I stand up, stepping toward her. Just wait a minute. Talk to me. There's nothing left to say. I'll be goddamned. I grab her arm again before she can walk out. You can't tell me you hate me and then leave. That's bullshit. You bust up in here while I'm asleep to yell at me? You deserve it. Maybe so, but still, still nothing, she says, turning to me again, getting right in my face. I hate you. That's it. There's nothing else to say. I hate everything about you. Your voice, your face. I hate it. Why aren't you going away? Because I can't, I tell her. And I'm pretty sure you don't really want me to. She scoffs. You're upset, I say, but you're lying to yourself if you think you want me gone. I do. You don't. Leave. No. Go away. I'm not. As soon as that last word leaves my lips, she's on me, slamming into me, her lips pressing against mine. She's kissing me, and I'm so fucking stunned that it takes me a moment to react, a moment to consider kissing her back. She moans and wraps her arms around my neck, clinging to me damn near aggressively as she kicks the door closed. There's a bitter tang on her tongue. In a daze, it doesn't register right away, but the second that it does, the world seems to stop. I push away from her, breaking the kiss with a groan. You've been drinking, Kay. She's breathing heavily. Even in the darkness, I can tell her cheeks are flushed. Wide eyes regard me as she says, It was just some wine. She doesn't seem drunk, but, well, there's no way in hell she's thinking clearly. Not if what she's thinking about right now is kissing. 
but before I can say anything, she's on me again, kissing, pressing against me and pushing me toward the bed. Whoa. She's not gentle about it. My ribs fucking ache. Her hands are all over, tugging at my clothes, a chill shooting down my spine when her warm fingertips reach bare skin. I don't think this is a good idea, I say. We shouldn't... Just shut up. She growls against my lips, hands winding through my hair, gripping it. The back of my knees hit the mattress and I fall back on it, dragging her down with me. Pain rips through my skull, damn near blinding, rivaling the burning happening in my chest. I hiss. Fuck. Her kiss grows harder, frenzied, desperation in her touch. She's not slowing down, showing no signs of stopping. Every stab of pain strikes deep, getting me all worked up. My heart is beating a million miles an hour. You sure you want to do this? I ask when she straddles me. Her voice is a breathy whisper when she says, No, maybe we should stop. Shut up. I laugh at that, shutting up, because I'm not going to argue. Maybe this moment is all wrong and maybe it shouldn't be happening, but there's very little I want in this world more than I want this woman, so I'm not turning her down. I drag her further onto the bed, struggling to keep a grip on her with one hand. Damn cast. Her hand slips down my pants, grasping my cock, and she strokes me over and over. Fuck, I groan. Fuck, fuck, fuck. If she doesn't stop that, I'm going to bust. Right here, right now, just like this. I flip her over, climbing on top, fumbling with her pants as I try to pull them off. She doesn't hesitate, stripping out of her clothes, flinging them across the room. I don't bother getting naked, just freeing myself from the confines of my pants as I settle between her legs, between her thighs. Right there. Questions flow through my mind, so many questions, almost as many objections, until she whispers, Make me feel good again, Jonathan. I'm inside her then, not a moment of second guessing, pushing in slowly with a deep groan. So tight, so wet, so goddamn beautiful. Oh, God. She whimpers, clinging to me. I'm still dazed. Hell, maybe this is a dream. But it doesn't matter because I'm not waking up from it. Slow and deep, the way I know she always liked it. Teasing to the point of agony. It's torture. Ten minutes, maybe an hour, I don't know. Pleasure rushes through me, my breathing haggard. Parts of me brutally hurting. But I keep on going. Fucking her. Making love. I'm not sure what this is, but her soft cries fill the room as her nails rake down my back, so I know she's all in. Sweat forms along my brow, a sheen coating her body. Her skin slick and glistening in the dim moonlight from the window. I taste it as I kiss her neck, the salty tang on my tongue. I bite and lick and suck. I'm probably leaving marks, but the harder my mouth works, the more she squirms. When she comes, her back arches her face contorting and mouth falling open in ecstasy. She lets out a strangled cry, almost like she's choking, suffocating, before she dissolves into whimpers. Fuck, that sound does something to me. I come, grunting before stilling on top of her, trying to catch my breath, trying to clear my head. What the hell is happening? She's trembling beneath me and I'm worried she's panicking. But when I pull back to look down at her, she smashes her lips to mine again, sending me reeling. Five o'clock. That's what my phone says when I slip out of bed much later, finding it shoved in the pocket of the jeans I've been wearing, the battery hovering down at ten percent. Notifications take up the screen, most of them messages from Cliff. I can get those convention tickets. Why do you want them? You remember they invited you, right? You were supposed to be the headliner. I know, I remember, I declined. Not that I didn't want to do it, but Cliff didn't think it would be wise considering when the invitation came, my sobriety was still on shaky ground. Still is, asshole. I sigh as I stroll to the door, glancing back at the bed, at her. Kennedy. My eyes skim along her naked back, following the curve of her spine. She's curled up, cuddling a pillow, a flimsy white sheet draped over parts of her. She's sleeping, lightly snoring, in and out all night long. The world is lightning as sunrise nears. I leave the room, my bare feet quiet as I make my way downstairs, replying to Cliff. Forget about it. His response is instant, of course, because he doesn't sleep. You sure? I type a quick yes before slipping the phone in the pocket of my sweats. 
Heading for the kitchen, I grab a bottle of water from the fridge and crack it open when a voice chimes in behind me. Have you lost your gosh dang mind? McCleskey stands there in her nightgown and robe, clutching it closed and scowling at me. Uh, no? Where are your clothes? I glance down at my bare chest. No shirt. Just haven't gotten dressed yet. You should do that, she grumbles, shuffling into the kitchen past me. Might give an old lady a heart attack running around like that. I laugh, taking a sip of the water while she sets about making a pot of coffee. I think if I were to give you a heart attack, it would have happened that day at the park. Nearly did, she says. Why do you think I called the police? All that squawking going on in my backyard. She cuts her eyes at me, giving me a knowing look. Yeah, she knew what we were up to that night. And I'm pretty sure she also knows what was happening in the wee hours of this morning. Figured you were just a cranky old bat, I say. Didn't realize you had the hots for me. Oh, don't push it, Cunningham, she says. I'll throw you out on your ass. I know you will, I say as I stroll back out of the kitchen. Put on some clothes, she shouts at me. Make sure your guest does the same. No hanky-panky in public areas. Yes, ma'am, I mumble, even though she can't hear me, making my way back upstairs to the bedroom. I reach for the door to go in when it flings open on its own, Kennedy appearing. She looks frenzied, hair a mess, clothes halfway on, and she loses her balance as she tries to slip on her shoes. Oh, whoa, whoa, careful. I grab her arm to steady her, but she pulls away, cheeks flushing like she's embarrassed. She gives me the briefest glance before averting her eyes, refusing to meet my gaze. Sorry, I, uh, uh... It's okay, I say. No reason to apologize. But there is. That's what her expression says, and I can guess why. She was trying to sneak out during my absence to avoid seeing me, but I caught her. My chest tightens at that. Fuck. Regret is written all over her, like she bathed in shame and can't get the stench off this morning. She straightens her clothes and my stomach bottoms out when I realize a bottle of whiskey is tucked under her arm. I have to go, she says, ducking past me out of the room. I didn't drink any of that, I say right away. I know it looks bad, fuck, but I didn't. And you won't, she says, because I'm taking it. Okay? I'm pouring it out, she says. You shouldn't even have it, it's stupid. You're stupid. Me and my stupid fucking face, huh? Her cheeks turn red as she stammers. I shouldn't have... Uh, I should have been home hours ago. I understand, I say, crossing my arms over my chest as I lean against the doorframe, watching her scrambling. You didn't plan on staying here last night. Or even coming, she mutters. Coming. Pun intended? She doesn't laugh. She doesn't find that funny. She just starts down the steps to leave, done with being here. I watch in silence as she hesitates halfway down. You, uh, you can take her she says, her expression guarded. I mean, if you were serious about it. If you wanted to take her, you can. Those words stunned me. Yeah? She nods. We're gonna have to talk about, you know, things. But if you meant it, I did. Well then, okay. She's gone then. I hear the front door as she rushes out, probably running to get away from here. Sighing, I pull out my phone using the last bit of battery left to send Cliff another message. I'm going to need those tickets. As usual, his response is instant. Are you drunk? Because I swear, Johnny, you and these tickets... Previously. Not ready to say goodbye. An audience is gathered in the auditorium of Fulton Edge Academy. Nearly every seat is filled. Students... Families, administrators, donors. The girl sits in a seat along the aisle in the back, her parents beside her. Her father hadn't wanted to come, blaming the $30 cost of the tickets, but the girl knew he wanted to steer clear tonight for other reasons. You. Saturday evening. Drama Club's production of Julius Caesar. There's a rumbling in the audience. People are growing restless. 
The play was supposed to start 10 minutes ago. Hastings frantically runs around, dressed in his elaborate costume. They're scrambling as an announcement is made. There has been a last-minute recast. The role of Brutus will now be played by... Not you. The blue Porsche is parked in the parking lot. There's a reserved spot up front for your father, although his seat is empty. The limo arrived earlier, which means you're both around, just not here. The girl gets up from her seat as the play starts. Her father tries to stop her, but her mother doesn't let him, saying, Let her go, Michael. She runs out, heading toward the parking lot. You're out there. So is he. The two of you are standing in front of your car, your father's security detail lurking as you argue. The deadline to accept admission to Princeton was last night, so he accepted it on your behalf. You tell him you're not going. Becoming him isn't your dream. He tells you to get your head out of the clouds. It's time to be the man he raised you to be. You tell him he didn't raise you to be a man. He didn't raise you at all. He'd have to be a father to take credit for that, but he's not. He's nothing but an egotistical asshole that only cares about his job. You tell him you'll never be like him. Becoming him is your worst fucking nightmare. The moment you say that, he loses his composure. He swings. He hits you. You're braced for it. You knew it was coming, but you don't expect the second hit. Or the one after it. He swings again and again. You try to block the blows, but he's not stopping, so you shove him off. That gives you a moment of reprieve, but it doesn't last. He comes back at you, so you react. You swing. You punch him right in the mouth. It's the first time you've ever struck back. Your father is stunned, staggering. You hit him hard. Security rushes over, restraining you. Your father's lip is busted. He runs his tongue along it. You're bleeding. Blood runs from your mouth. He stands in front of you, staring you in the eyes as he says, You'd never amount to anything without me. A waste of a life just like your mother. You spit in his face when he says that. He blinks, pulling out a handkerchief to wipe the blood off. The girl, she's in front of the school, causing a scene as she screams for him to stop. Your father looks away like he's about to leave, but then he turns back. Bam. He punches you again. One last time, a blow right to the chest. Security lets go of you to escort your father away as he calls back at you. Princeton's nice, son. You'll like it. You don't stick around. People are coming out of the school. Julius Caesar is a mess without its Brutus. So you get in your car and speed away, not wanting to be there. You can't face them right now. You drive around. You drive around for a long time. Eventually, you end up in Bennett Landing. It's three o'clock in the morning. You're standing on the sidewalk in front of the girl's house. You're drunk. Not that drunk. Not drunk enough to forget. Not sure that's even possible when you're drinking champagne straight from the bottle. You swiped it from home before heading to the play. You thought you'd be celebrating with her tonight. But instead, it came to this. She's still awake. She sees you from her bedroom window. She sneaks downstairs and slips outside. You're drinking, she says, looking around. It's the first time she's seen you this way. Please tell me you're not driving like this. My car's at the park, you say. Drank there. Without me. You hold the bottle of champagne out to her. You can have some. She takes it, dumping it out, before tossing the bottle behind her on the grass. I meant you went to the park without me. Needed to think, you say, staring at the discarded bottle as you run your hands through your hair been a rough day. I know. Her hands press gently to your cheeks as she examines your face. Are you okay? I'm fine, you say, kissing her, whispering against her lips. I just needed to see you again. Needed to tell you that I, uh... 
I love you. You almost say it. Tell me, she says. I'm leaving. Your voice is quiet. She pulls away, blinking at you. What? I couldn't leave without saying goodbye, you say, caressing her cheek as you smile softly. Didn't want to disappear on you. You'd never forgive me for pulling a breezio. You're making light of it. You're trying to make her smile. You're trying to make this moment okay, but she's panicking inside. Her hands are shaking. She inhales sharply. Tears are filling her eyes. What do you mean you're leaving? She asks that, but she knows what you mean. You can't leave, she says. Where would you go? What would you even do? You're heading to California, you tell her. Or maybe you'll end up somewhere else. All you know is you have to follow your dreams and you have to do it now. It's time. You're going to go wherever life takes you, and as much as your chest aches at the thought of leaving her, at the thought of going through tomorrow without seeing her smile, at the idea of never again getting to hold her in your arms, you can't stay. Not even one more day. Because every day you stay just makes it harder for you to go, and come tomorrow you may lose your courage. You'll end up at Princeton. You'll become your father. She stares at you as you say all that. She's starting to cry. I'm not ready to say goodbye. You wipe the tears from her cheeks. Do you think you'll ever be ready? No, she won't. She grabs a hold of you, hugging you tightly. I know you have to go. I know. And you have to follow your heart, but how can I follow mine if you're gone? I love you, Jonathan. I love you so much. You wrap your arms around her, holding her as she cries. Always making the first move. I love you. A long moment passes before you say, Come with me, Kay. She inhales sharply. What? You have a life here. You have a family. Fuck, you have finals on Monday. You're about to graduate and go to college, and I'm probably about to fuck up my entire life, but I love you. She pulls back to look at you. You love me. More than anything, you say. More than drama club and dress rehearsals and Julius Caesar. More than annoying the shit out of Hastings. More than the goddamn park down the road. Hell, even more than I loved punching my father. I didn't stick around here so long for any of that. I stayed for you. And if me loving you is enough, it is, she says. So come along, you say. Run away with me, baby. You don't know this, but that girl, as she stands there staring at you, seeing the light in your eyes and feeling so much love in her heart, she would have done anything you asked anything. She would have climbed any mountain and dug any hole. She would have lied, cheated, and stolen. That girl would have promised you forever. As long as you love her, for as long as you care, she's yours. So walking to the park with you and climbing in that Porsche? Easiest decision she's ever made. She's ever made. She's ever made. She's ever made. He's ever made. He's ever made. He's ever made. Fifteen. Kennedy.
Come on, we've got to go. I yell, shoving stuff around in a junk drawer in the kitchen, looking for my car keys but finding them nowhere. Ugh. I check the counter and the table before moving on to the living room. Not on the coffee table, either. Certainly not on the hook by the front door where they're supposed to be. I pull the cushions up on the couch, checking under them. Nothing. Maddie, have you seen my keys? No answer. I look all around, my eyes skimming along the floor as I make my way down the hallway toward the bedrooms in case I dropped them. Nope. I'm trying to remember the last time I saw them. The door was already unlocked when I got home this morning, so yesterday sometime? Maddie, I call out, her silence concerning. Are you listening? No, it turns out, she isn't. She sprawled out on her bed, dressed and ready to go, her hair already messed up even though I fixed it a few minutes ago. She's fast asleep, not hearing a word I say. Maddie, we need to get going, I say, shaking her awake, waiting until she sits up before asking, Have you seen my keys, sweetheart? Rubbing her eyes, she shakes her head. Even if she has seen them, I don't think she's awake enough to remember it. Get your bag ready for school, I tell her, walking away, heading to my bedroom. I search around for a moment, now looking for my cell phone, going so far as to rip the blankets off my bed and dump out the hamper. Nothing. Annoyed, I give up. I don't have time for this. I'm already going to have to walk to work. I go back to Maddie's room. She's lying down again. Up, 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 I say, picking her up and setting her on her feet before grabbing her backpack, shoving some stray papers into it, not sure what she needs. I put it on her back before taking her hand and pulling her to the door. I don't want to go, she whines, dragging her feet. Sorry, school is a necessity. But why can't I stay home with you? What makes you think I'm staying home? Because you don't got no uniform? That's crazy. I... Glancing down, I realize I'm not wearing my work shirt. Crap. Wait here. Let me change my shirt. She just stares at me. Seriously, don't move, I say, pointing at her. I'll just be one second. Any longer, and she'll be right back in her bed. Of course, all my uniforms are dirty, so I shove through the pile of clothes I threw out of the hamper, finding the one that looks the cleanest. I'm pulling it on as a knock echoes through the apartment. I tense, knowing Maddie's going to open the door even before she announces, I got it! Wait! Jonathan! My stomach drops as I walk back out, finding the door wide open, of course, with him standing there grinning at her. It's been a crazy morning. Waking up at dawn, naked in your ex's bed, body aching, covered in the scent of him, has a way of putting someone through the emotional ringer. Horror. Fear. Dread. Excitement. I'm not sure how to feel about it. Not sure about anything except the awkwardness, the guilt, the shame. And maybe I shouldn't feel that way, but it's unavoidable. What are you doing here? I ask, more bite to those words than I mean. I can tell by the way he looks at me, the flicker of hurt in his eyes, that the question bothers him. He can come today, remember? Maddie chimes in, looking at me like I'm being ridiculous. He said since he couldn't stay and play with me and Aunt Megan. Oh, I know that, I say, walking over, pressing a hand to the top of her head as I force a smile, hoping she doesn't sense the weirdness. I just mean, why right now? Playtime is later. I thought you might need this stuff, he says, pulling something out of his pocket and holding it out. Keys and a cell phone. My cell phone, more specifically. My keys, too. You must have forgotten it. Somewhere. Ah, uh, thanks, I grumble taking the phone from him as it starts ringing. Work. It's been one of those mornings. I'm running late, and... 
Ugh, let me take this call. Hello? Is everything okay? Marcus asks when I answer. It's ten after and you're not here. Yeah, sorry. I'll be there as soon as I can. Just checking, since this isn't like you. I hang up, rolling my eyes, and turn back to Jonathan, about to apologize for having to cut this short when he says, I can take Maddie to school, if you need to get to work. Her eyes light up at that suggestion. I, uh, I don't know. It's only what, a couple blocks from here? I can get her there, no problem. Please, Mommy, Maddie says, grabbing his hand like she's standing in solidarity. He can get me there. Overprotective, paranoid me wants to say no. But how am I going to trust him to take her to a convention if I can't even let him walk her to school? I want to pick her up and shove her in my pocket, shield her from everything for as long as I'm alive, but I can't do that, because the truth is, she's not just mine. Yeah, okay, fine, I say, those words earning a squeal of excitement from Maddie. I smile down at her. Love you more than lunch breaks and paychecks. Love you more than recess. That's a lot of love, little girl. All of it in the whole world. Leaning down, I kiss her forehead. Go on. You don't want to be late for school. She pauses, eyes widening. Wait, I forgot. Forgot what? I call out as she sprints for her bedroom. Show and tell, she yells. Sighing, I shake my head. Can't forget about bringing something for show and tell. That would be a travesty, Jonathan says. I look at him, frowning as I slip past out of the apartment. Can you lock the door for me? Please, I have to get going. Of course, he says. Whatever you need. I leave, not wanting to dwell, because if I do, I'm liable to go back on all of it. And that wouldn't be fair. I get to work a quarter after eight, 15 minutes late, and rush to clock in, flustered. You sure you're okay? Marcus asks, eyeing me. Fine, I mumble. I couldn't find my keys. It's not a lie. Not completely. It's more than that, of course, but I don't want to get into it. I spend the next few minutes in the back stock room watching the time. At 8.30, I start to get nervous. Nearing 9 o'clock, my anxiety skyrockets. Pulling out my phone, I text Jonathan. Did you get her there okay? No response. When 9.30 comes, I can't take it anymore. I dial the number for the school, checking with the receptionist to make sure she made it, feeling like a fool when she confirms Maddie is in class and arrived on time this morning. I hang up, grumbling to myself when a message pops up on the screen. Jonathan. Forgot to charge my phone. She made it safe and sound. No limbs lost. I stare at it, considering how to respond, but everything I truly want to say feels ridiculously sappy this morning. So she still has all her fingers and toes. Ten of each, I'm assuming, but I didn't have a chance to count. Would have made us late. I laugh at that as I type out a response. Learn to multitask, man. What's so funny? Hitting send, I glance up and see Bethany in the doorway. Nothing, just, you know. I shake my phone at her as if that'll explain it. Boyfriend? She guesses, raising her eyebrows. Is it the guy that was here? My expression falls. What guy? You know, the one that came to see you. Oh, God. How do you know about that? Because I was here, she says. Don't think I didn't see him lurking around. You saw him? Of course, she laughs. You seriously think I wouldn't spot that hottie? Hello, do you even know me? Well... I mean, it's not what you think, I say. He's not, we're not, you know, so I'd appreciate it if you didn't say anything. 
Wow, you don't have to worry. Your secret is safe with me. Really? Of course, she laughs. I know you're like old or whatever, but I like to think we're friends. I'm not going to tell everyone your business. Ignoring the fact that she just called me old because screw that, I feel an intense sense of relief. She's taking this so much cooler than I expected. Thank you. And I know you've met him, I guess, but if you want to meet him again, I can probably make that happen. Oh, no thanks, she waves me off. He's a hottie, but he's not my type. I'm not really into that whole uptight authoritarian kink, if you know what I mean. What? The guy of yours. What's his name? Andrew? Oh, you're talking about Drew. Who else would I be? Oh my god, is there somebody else? She lets out a shriek. No way. You have two boyfriends? Of course not, I scoff as my phone goes off. I glance at it, seeing a message from Jonathan. I don't have a boyfriend at all. You're the queen. I'm just a commoner. Those words nearly take my breath away. It's been a long time since he's said them to me. So long that my heart skips a beat at the memories. Your face disagrees, Bethany says, motioning to me as I shove my phone in my pocket. You're all blushy. I roll my eyes. Am not. Whatever you say, she turns to leave. You look how I probably looked when I met Johnny Cunning. I heard a certain someone walked her to school this morning. I stare at my father, sitting on his front porch, casually rocking in his chair, wasting time before he heads off to lead a meeting later. It's nearing sunset. I ended up working over to make up for being late this morning. Yeah, I needed to get to work, and, well, he was there. Lucky you, he says, that he just happened to be there. Tell me about it, I mumble, leaving it at that. Anyway, we should go before it gets dark. Because he's coming over to play, he asks. Heard about that, too. I cut my eyes at him, but don't respond to that, opening the front door to yell inside, Maddie, sweetheart, time to go. Footsteps run through the house. I'm not judging you, my father says. I just want to make sure you're being careful. Careful. Squeezing his shoulder, I joke, Don't worry. Mom had the safe sex is great sex talk with me as soon as I hit puberty. Took me to the clinic, put me on the pill and everything. He cringes. A lot of good that did. Should have taught you about abstinence. Spoken like a true conservative, I say, as Maddie bursts outside with her backpack. Besides, you know, say what you will, but it gave us that one. And she's plenty enough for all of us he says, grinning at her when she throws herself at him to hug his neck. Love you, kiddo. Have fun playing. Love you, Grandpa. Maybe you can play too next time? Maybe, he agrees as she runs off the porch, skirting past me on her way to the car. My father waits until she's out of earshot before he says, Be careful. And uh, I don't mean, you know. No glove, no love? Another cringe. Uh, that, too, but I think you already know that, he grumbles. I hope you learned your lesson about going down that road with that boy. No good can come from it. She came from it, I point out. He looks at me, eyes narrowing. Don't worry, I say. I'm being careful. You better be practicing abstinence. I'm 27, not 17. It doesn't matter. There's no ring on your finger. I'm not really a fan of jewelry. It's not about the jewelry. Not really a fan of archaic vows, either. He scrubs his hands down his face. Damn liberal hippies. I laugh at that. 
He used to say that to my mother whenever she challenged him, which was all the time. Bye, Dad. I'm serious, Kennedy, he calls out as I head for the car. I know you are, I tell him. Don't worry. Don't worry. Yeah, right. I get in the car, wanting that conversation to be over before I slip up and give away just how deep I am. Sweat coats my back, my hands shaky as I grip the steering wheel and glance in the rearview mirror at Maddie, oblivious to it all as she plays with her breezy o doll. Is he at home, Mommy? She asks, glancing at me. Who? Jonathan, she says. So we can play? Oh, I'm not sure. I guess we'll see, huh? She smiles, nodding. He's not there, though. He's not waiting when we get to the apartment. Disappointment radiates from her, her smile falling. He'll be here, I say, hoping I'm not lying to her. I know, she says. She does her homework, practicing her spelling, and we eat dinner. No, Jonathan. She takes a bath, putting on her pajamas while I call him. Voicemail. Another hour or so passes before I finally change out of my work uniform. I check on Maddie in the living room, finding her fast asleep, the first Brizio movie soundlessly playing on the TV, the lights all off. I glare at the screen, at his face staring back at me, making my insides twist up in knots. Asshole. I grumble reaching for the remote to turn it off, but a soft knock from the door stops me. I give Maddie a quick look. Still asleep, before I head for the door, glancing out the peephole. The face that's currently on the TV greets me. Well, there are some differences, of course. The guy standing in front of my apartment looks like he's been through hell. He hasn't shaved in a while, and his skin is still peppered with faint scratches and bruises. Sighing, I tug the door open. He starts to greet me, but I turn away, walking away, heading for the kitchen to clean. Inviting himself inside, he shuts the door and follows, pausing when he glances at Maddie on the couch. She's asleep. Yeah, well, that's what happens when you wait so late to show up. I came by earlier, he says, around four o'clock. I was still working. You should have waited or came back before now. I didn't have the chance. Oh, something more important to do? I glance at him when he doesn't answer. I called you. You could have at least answered your phone. I had it turned off. What, didn't want any interruptions? You have a date or something? Networking? His expression hardens. Don't be like that. It's just a question. No, it's more than that, and you know it. I turn away from him and start doing the dishes, trying to shove the bitterness down that's festering. He's right. It is more than that. I'm still angry. So angry. I try not to let it show. He sits down at the kitchen table. I had to go to a meeting. I drop the plate I'm washing when he says that, hot, sudsy water splashing up at me. So that's where I was, he says. I tried to get here sooner, but the meeting ran a lot longer than I thought. A meeting, I say, shaking my head. I know meetings are the epitome of what happens here stays here, and they're supposed to be anonymous, but I'm not sure how that's possible in his situation. Yeah, the conversation veered somewhere unexpected, he says. Being careful in relationships. I turn to him, horrified. Oh, God. Please tell me you didn't say anything about us. Of course not, he says. Not even sure what to say if I wanted to. Not sure about us. Us. There is no us. There was an us, once upon a time, but now it's just me and him and whatever this mess is I've gotten into by throwing myself at him the way I did. Drying my hands off, I sit down across from him. 
He picks up the Brizio doll that Maddie left on the table after dinner. This is what she grabbed for show and tell this morning. I'm not surprised. She has probably taken it a dozen times. He smiles, staring at it, but says nothing. Are you... Uh... You know... I wave toward him, not sure how to word it. Okay? He raises an eyebrow. Am I okay? You said you had to go to a meeting, so I wondered... If I fucked up? No, I didn't mean... It's okay, you can ask it. I've fucked up a lot, but no, I haven't. Not this time. Not yet. Yet. He laughs dryly. Yet. Well, that's good to know, but that's not what I asked, I say. I asked if you're okay. He sets the doll down. Yeah, I'm okay. Good. Are you? Sure. Are you happy? It sounds like small talk, I know, but it's so much deeper than that, and his expression shows it. Am I happy? I don't know. I wouldn't say things are perfect, but I guess I'm happy. You? No. His answer is instant. He doesn't even consider it. He's living his dream, but yet he's not happy. I was happy this morning, though, he continues, smiling again. Last night, too. Last night shouldn't have happened. But he did. He reaches across the table, his hand grasping mine. I stare down at it, not moving, even though that voice of self-preservation begs for me to pull away. Get some space. He squeezes my hand as I meet his gaze. He's still smiling. He looks happy. My anxiety flares. Let's go somewhere, he says. Where? Wherever you want to go. I shake my head. We can't. Why not? Because I have work and Maddie has school. We can't just go somewhere. We'll go for the weekend. And do what? Whatever you want to do. I pull away from him, his touch clouding my thoughts. He's saying pretty words, but I'm not sure I can believe any of it. I'll think about it, I say, afraid to say yes, even though my stupid heart yearns to. We should worry about next weekend first. You know, the convention? I mean, if you're still... I am. Okay, but I need details. The where, the when, the how... When are you picking her up? When are you bringing her back? What are you feeding her? Can you guarantee she won't be kidnapped? He laughs as he leans back in the chair, like I'm being funny, but I'm serious. That's a lot of people, a lot of strangers, and I'm already starting to regret telling him he could take her. I'll pick her up early Saturday morning. I'll bring her back late Saturday night, and to be honest, I'll probably feed her whatever she wants. As far as getting kidnapped, you don't have to worry. I'm not going to let her out of my sight. But I... Uh... Okay? I don't know what else to say. Okay. He agrees, pulling his phone out when it rings, answering it quietly. What's up, Cliff? Cliff. I get up from the table, not wanting to listen to that conversation, but I catch parts of it as I finish cleaning the kitchen. Something about timelines and schedules, meetings in the city and doctor's appointments. After he hangs up, he stands up, and I think he's about to leave. But instead, he strolls over to where I'm standing and pauses behind me. He brushes my hair aside, and I gasp when he kisses my shoulder. It's soft. So soft, barely a graze from his lips. Tingles engulf me, a chill rushing through me that makes my knees go weak. We shouldn't do this, I whisper. We're not doing anything, he says, his right arm snaking around my middle, cast pressing against my stomach as he pulls me back against him. He kisses my neck, and I close my eyes, gripping the counter tightly. 
He marked me last night. Like we were some reckless teenagers, leaving love bites all over. I spent most of the day trying to hide them from people. I've made so many mistakes, he says, his voice barely a breath against my skin. But I'm not going to make those mistakes again. I want to believe you, I whisper. I turn my head, glancing back at him as he leans forward, kissing the corner of my mouth. I should get out of here, he says. It's late, and I'm sure you've got better things to do than humor me. I don't argue, nor do I try to stop him, although I think that's what he wants. He walks away, heading to the living room where Maddie is still asleep. Curious, I follow, lingering near the front door as he kneels and brushes the hair from her face to kiss her forehead. Sorry I fucked up tonight, little one. He starts toward the door, eyeing me warily as I block his path. He brushes past me, but before he can go, I say, They'll recognize you. What? At the convention, I say. People will know who you are. How are you going to shield her? How will you protect her? That won't be a problem. Nobody will know. How can you be so sure? He laughs as he opens the front door. That's what cosplay is for. Play 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 is for. 16. Jonathan. Nightmare. Brizio's arch enemy. Where Brizio is light, a breath of fresh air, the nice breeze on a warm summer day, nightmare is the storm that rolls in and takes it all away. Darkness, thick and suffocating, the shadows you can't escape in the night in back alleyways. Black leather framed with dark armor, head to toe, from the combat boots the whole way up to the oversized black hood with a metal mask covering part of the face, rendering him unrecognizable. I've always been envious of the costume. Beats the damn pseudo-spandex, that's for sure. I, uh... Wow. Kennedy stands in the doorway of her apartment with a look of awe as her eyes scan the costume. That's just... Wow. Wow, huh? I glance down. Good or bad? It's just, uh... You know. Wow? I guess. She nods, fighting off a smile. Wow. I smirk. It's the original. Seriously? Straight from the second movie, I say, touching an armored chest plate with a fingerless glove-clad hand. Well, except for these gloves. The real ones wouldn't have fit because of the cast, so I had to improvise. It's, um... Wow. Nice, she says, touching the costume, fingertips grazing the armor. Kind of weird seeing you like this, but still, it's nice. Thanks, I say as she steps aside for me to come in the apartment. I talked them into letting me borrow it. Might not give it back, though. I'm kind of enjoying it. You should keep it, she says, her eyes still scanning me as she closes the door. It's, uh, nice. Wow. She smiles playfully as she walks away. I need to finish getting ready for work. Maddie, you've got a visitor. A moment after Kennedy disappears, Madison runs in. She skids to a stop when she spots me, eyes wide, mouth popping open. Whoa! I push the hood off, shoving the mask up, her expression changing when she sees it's me, face lighting up. She runs right at me, slamming into me so hard I stumble. I laugh as she hugs me. Hey, pretty girl. She looks up at me. You think I'm pretty? What? Of course. I kneel next to her, grinning as I press a finger to the tip of her nose. You look like your mom. You think mommy's pretty too? I think she's the most beautiful woman in the world. Her expression shifts rapidly when I say that before her eyes widen. Even more beautifuler than Mary Ann. I lean closer, whispering, repeating her words. Even more beautifuler than Mary Ann. Whoa. Smiling, I hold a bag out to her. I brought you something. Thought maybe you'd want to wear it today. She grabs it, not hesitating as she yanks everything out, gasping. 
She discards the empty bag as she runs off to her bedroom, nearly slamming into Kennedy in the hallway. Careful, Kennedy says. Where are you running off to? No time, Mommy, gotta get ready. Well then. Kennedy stares at her until she disappears, before turning to me as she runs her fingers through her hair, pulling it up. You sure you can handle this? I deal with vultures from Hollywood Chronicles, I say. I can handle whatever she throws at me. Kennedy doesn't look convinced. I heard you caught an assault charge two years ago from punching one of them. Where'd you hear that? The front of Hollywood Chronicles? I shake my head. Those charges were dropped. Because you were innocent? More like they were just as guilty. Kennedy rolls her eyes but doesn't have the chance to say anything. Footsteps run our direction, an excited voice screeching, Ta-da! Madison stands there, grinning wildly, clad in the little white and blue getup. A Brizio costume. They're bringing them out for Halloween, but I managed to snag one early. Wow, look at you, Kennedy says, smoothing Madison's hair. Prettiest Brizio I've ever seen. Jonathan thinks I'm pretty too, she says, smiling at her mother. He told me so. Did he? Kennedy asks. Smart man. And you too, she says. He says you're the beautifulest woman in all the world. Damn. She ratted me out. Kennedy seems taken aback. Well, that was nice of him, Kennedy says. I have to get going. You have fun, okay? And be good. I will. She kisses the top of Madison's head. Love you more than Saturday mornings. Love you too. Madison says, more than even costumes and them other things. Madison grabs my hand. I'll bring her back tonight, I say, fingers and toes still attached. Kennedy won't look at me. I can tell she's anxious, so I don't linger, leading Madison outside. The town car is idling in the parking lot, the driver leaning against it as he waits. He smiles when we approach and opens the back door, but Madison drags her feet. Is he your friend? She asks, looking at me. Why? Grandpa says not to get in cars with strangers. Oh, yeah, I know him, I say. He's safe. She climbs into the car, and I buckle her into a booster seat as I sit beside her. As the car pulls away, I see Kennedy watching us from the front door of the apartment. Madison chatters the entire drive to the convention center, telling stories, and I listen dutifully. She's bursting with excitement by the time we arrive, but I'm somewhere on edge. While I was promised discretion, confidentiality agreements tossed around like candy at a parade, I know things don't always go according to plan. The car takes us straight to the back entrance, past the awaiting crowds. A woman meets us in an attached garage, one of the event coordinators, along with a small security detail. She smiles when we get out of the car. Mr. Cunning and Miss, uh... Madison grins. Maddie. Miss Maddie. The woman says, I'm so honored you could join us. My name is blah, blah, blah. She launches into the spiel. It's expected. Always happens. I vaguely listen as she babbles on about the company's history, their record-breaking turnouts, laying the groundwork for me signing on to something in the future. Madison grows impatient and starts fidgeting, so I hurry the woman along, getting our wristbands for admission like everyone else so we can blend into the crowd. Security will be posted all around, she says. They'll be keeping a lookout, of course, but should you need any help, don't be afraid to ask. The woman leaves, and security takes us up a private elevator, straight to the main floor, letting us out inside the hall. The crowd is streaming through, rushing to get wherever they're going. Panels, trivia, shopping, autographs. The room is filled with booths, with comics, with artists, with writers and actors and cosplayers. The whole shebang. This isn't my first convention, you know but usually I'm the one people line up for. So, what you want to do? I ask Madison. It's up to you. She clings to my hand, staring at it all with wide eyes. Everything. Everything. I laugh. We can do that. We start small, just walking around, taking in what we can see. Maddie's in awe, gawking at everyone in costume, and I think she might be intimidated by the crowd, but it doesn't take her long to warm up to things. I steer her away from autographs, since a lot of those people actually know me. 
She drags me from booth to booth, from table to table, excitedly announcing everything she sees, not lingering any one place long enough for me to buy anything. Whoa, she says, coming to a halt in front of one of those standees, a cardboard cutout of yours truly. Look, Daddy, it's you! Daddy. Crazy shit goes down in my chest when she calls me that. It's the first time I've heard her say it. I blink at her, so astounded, so enamored, that it isn't until she repeats herself and people look her direction that I realize what she's saying. Daddy, it's you! Shit. I pull her away from it and kneel down in front of her when she looks at me in confusion, like she doesn't understand. That's not me today, I say. I'm Nightmare, remember? Her brow furrows. But it's still you for real. Of course, but today we have costumes so we can play make-believe, I say. So technically, that's you today. Her expression lights up as she spins around, looking at the booth. Can I have me? Can you have you? She nods, pointing at the standee. Oh, you actually want one of those? Uh-huh. It's kind of big to be lugging around. I can carry it. I smile at the mental image of her dragging one of those damn things around all afternoon. It's like three times your size. I can do it. I don't doubt it, I tell her. How about we wait until the end of the day, after we do everything else, and if there's still one here, we'll take it with us. Okay. That was a heck of a lot easier than I expected it to be. I take her hand again as I glare at the standee. Please let them sell out of those fucking things. Madison drags me around again from place to place, before we make our way to the other side of the building where panels are happening. Madison acquires a schedule and picks where we're going. Comics in the movies. The art of fan art. Metaphors and themes. I'm not sure she knows what half the stuff is. Hell, I'm not sure she can even read the words as she picks the panels, but she sits eagerly through them, eventually dragging me to a room with a sign that says, Fandom Feud. I'm not sure about this one, I tell her. I think they'll expect participation. Oh, does that mean I can play? Sure does. A voice chimes in, a woman walking into the room behind us, dressed like Mary Ann. We're playing Breezio Trivia. That's me today, Madison exclaims, grabbing at her costume to show it off. The woman laughs. I bet that means you're going to know all the answers, huh? Madison nods. Yep. The woman's eyes flicker to me, but I avert my gaze and say nothing. We find seats toward the back of the room. They play a few rounds of trivia, picking players to face off, before opening it up to everyone and calling on people in the audience. In the comics, Mary Ann is a nurse, the moderator says. What does she do in the movies? Oh, 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 me, me! Madison yells, waving her hands wildly, trying to be seen. But the guy in front of her is too tall, so she climbs right up on the chair, standing on it. Me, me, I know! Muffled laughter flows around us when people notice her. The little Breezio girl in the back, the moderator says, calling on her. What does Marianne do in the movies? Madison beams, shouting, Nothing! More laughter. I'll accept that, the moderator says. She's still in school. Come pick your prize, little Breezio. Madison jumps down, walking proudly to the front. People ooh and ah over her, and she plays it right up. A lollipop, it turns out, is what she wins. Returning, she shoves it at me. I open it for her and try to hand it back, but she makes a face at me like I've fucked up. What's wrong? You gotta taste it first, she says. Seriously? That's what mommy does, she says. In case it's poison, because it came from a stranger. Oh. I lick it before handing it to her. Like that? She nods, popping it right in her mouth. I blink a few times, watching her. That's one of the strangest things I've ever done in my life. Taste-testing potentially poisonous candy. Trivia is over after a few minutes. I lead Madison through the crowd, out of the room, fielding a few compliments from people about how adorable she is. I probably look like an asshole, just nodding in agreement. Are you hungry? I ask her, once we're away from the crowd. 
I'm sure there's something around here that you'll eat. Hot dogs. Hot dogs. I find them easy enough, but the line is crazy long. We wait damn near 20 minutes to buy some hot dogs and chips. And, God damn it, she wants soda, so I buy it. But there's nowhere to sit inside, so we make our way outside to a small amphitheater. A crowd is gathered in nightmare cosplay. They're putting on a show having some sort of sword competition. What are those guys doing? Madison asks before taking a bite of her hot dog. Looks like LARPing, I mumble. She looks at me like I'm crazy. Like what? LARPing, I say. Live action role play. Oh, I want to play. Can I? I don't think so. Why not? I don't know, I admit. Because you're just a kid sounds like a shitty excuse to deny her some make-believe fun. She eats her lunch as the knights battle it out, getting into it like she's watching a movie, even picking a side, the one whose armor is trimmed in blue, unlike his opponent, who wears all black. Picking up the schedule, I flip through it. So, looks like we've got a choice, either the consequence of alternate universes or exploring headcanon. What do those mean? I think they both deal with fan fiction. What's that? When fans make up their own stories, I say, shaking my head. We sat through a panel that explained that to her, but I'm pretty sure it went right over her head. Can we do that? Make the fan fiction? Thought you already were, I say. You said you were going to fix the end of Ghosted. I am. Well, there you have it. So which panel would you prefer? The consequences of the cannons, she says, mashing them together. I start to correct her, but she's not paying me attention. On her feet and cheering, Go, blue guy! The blue guy, in fact, loses, if there's such a thing as losing in what they're doing. The guy in all black takes a bow, celebrating, while Madison loudly boos, drawing their attention. You, young Brizio, he says, still playing the part as he points his sword at her. You have the gall to boo me? Me? The villainous nightmare? You're not the real nightmare, she says, hands on her hips. My daddy is. She motions to me, so there's no mistaking who she's talking about. Shit. The man eyes me with a look of disgust. Him? Ha! He's not the real one. He doesn't even have the gloves. Madison glances at my hands. So? He doesn't always gotta wear them. Fair enough, the man says. But if your father is the true nightmare... Perhaps he'd like to come down and stake his claim. He points at me with his sword. I shake my head. Not happening. He will, Madison says, contradicting me. It seems your father disagrees, the man says. I suppose he's afraid of being exposed as a fraud. Nah, he's not, the man laughs. Madison's getting heated, and seriously, fuck this guy. I'd never begrudge someone their act, wouldn't demand they break character but I'll be damned if I'm going to let someone antagonize me in front of my daughter. Broken wrist or not, I'm defending her honor. Fuck it. I get to my feet, marching straight down to him as I say, Someone give me a sword. Right away, half a dozen guys offer theirs up. I grab the one closest to me, trying to get a good grip on it with the cast. Mr. Antagonizer has the nerve to look concerned, whispering, You know we're just playing around here, right? Are we? I ask. I wasn't sure. Look, I'll be honest. Filming most of the second movie was a blur, but the lead-up to it, the endless hours of training for the fight scenes, is ingrained in me to the point that I could do this with my eyes closed. So, while I'd probably die gruesomely if I lived back in the days of King Arthur's Court, a fucking nightmare LARPer is nothing. Feel free to kneel at any time, I tell him. I'll accept your surrender. He scoffs, those words setting him off. He takes the first swing. It's weak, easy to block. I let him try a few more times, picking up his pattern, before I put him on the defense, something he's clearly not used to. Bam, bam, bam. Hit after hit, I go after him, following the same fight routine from the movie. It's like a choreographed dance, one the guy knows, but he's not quick enough on his feet to stop me. Five minutes, maybe, I rail at him. He breaks a sweat eyes wide like he's starting to think I might actually stab him. He puts up a decent fight, enough that a few blows nearly makes me lose it. 
my wrist stinging, pain shooting up my arm. But I don't stop until he kneels. He drops his sword, dropping to one knee, and I hear Madison cheering, screeching as she runs for me. She wraps her arms around my waist, hugging me, and I laugh as I hand the sword off to whoever lent it to me. Man, you're good, the guy says with a laugh as he gets to his feet, holding his hand out. Name's Brad. You are... Jonathan! Madison chimes in, answering for me. Oh, wait. He's Nightmare today. Well, Nightmare, if you ever decide to join a LARPing league... I appreciate it, but it's not my thing. I mumble, steering Madison away. Could have fooled me, the guy says. I ignore that, leading Madison back inside the convention center. So, did we decide what we're doing now? More sword fighting! Uh, I'm afraid that has to wait for another time, I say. But there's still other fun to be had. More panels, some shopping, even another trivia game. She eats ice cream, getting it all over her. I buy her the Marianne doll, so she doesn't have to keep substituting with Barbie. It's nearing nightfall when things start coming to a close. I can tell Madison is running out of energy. She's quiet now, clinging to my hand. You ready to head home? I ask. I'm sure your mother must be missing you. She nods. We start toward the exit, but Madison hesitates halfway there, tugging on my hand. Wait, we forgot. Forgot what? She doesn't answer, instead dragging me straight over to the booth with all the standees. I want a Brizio one, she declares, telling the worker, pointing at the standee. They're thirty dollars, the lady says. Sighing, I count out the cash and hand it over before grabbing the standee and hauling it along with us. We make our way through the lingering crowd and out the exit. I lead Madison around the corner of the building, lingering there as I send a message for the car to get us. It's a minute or so out, so we wait as people wander past. I shove the mask up off my face when I see the car coming and take a step toward it when a voice calls out, Johnny Cunning? I turn, tense, and see a woman with her young son, the two of them gawking at me. Oh my God, it's really you the woman says, grasping the kid by the shoulders. My son told me it was you, you know, he kept saying it was you, but I didn't believe it. It's always the kids. They're intuitive. No matter how much you disguise yourself, kids can sense it. Can I have an autograph? She asks, holding out a comic book as she digs for something to write with. Please? Uh, sure. I mumble, taking the marker from her and scribbling my name, my eyes on the kid. He looks to be about Madison's age, the same look of reverence on his face that she had this morning. He, too, was wearing a Brizio costume, but his is homemade. A lot of time went into it. It's strange, after everything I've done, having kids look at me like I'm some hero. You want a picture, little man? He nods enthusiastically, like he's speechless, so I kneel down beside him, posing, letting his mother snap a quick photo. Take care of yourself, I tell him. Make sure you always look out for your mother. I stand up, grabbing Madison's hand and leading her to the car before anyone else spots me. The drive back home feels like it takes forever. It's dark when we arrive and Madison is fast asleep. I try to wake her, but she's not budging. So I pull her out of the booster seat and carry her. She grumbles, not waking up, arms wrapped around my neck. I drag the standee along under my arm as I head for the front door, prepared to knock but it pulls open before I can. Kennedy stands in the doorway, looking relieved to see us, still wearing her work uniform. She steps out of the way for me to come in. I drop the standee right inside the apartment. Kennedy stares down at it before shooting me a peculiar look. I know, I mutter. It's probably the last thing you want to have to look at, but she wouldn't leave without it. Kennedy shakes her head, closing the front door as she says... You can tuck her in bed, if you want.
previously. The start of a new life. As the students at Fulton Edge Academy take their finals, you're driving through the Midwest on your way to California. The girl? She sits beside you, in the passenger seat of your blue Porsche, writing her heart out in her notebook. It's one of the few things she brought along. She slipped back into the house as you sobered up, filling her school backpack with clothes, packing her breezy o comics, and grabbing her cell phone before writing a note to her parents. Mom and Dad, I know you're going to be upset when you realize I'm gone, but please don't worry too much. I'm okay. I'm with Jonathan. Love you both. Kennedy. Needless to say, over 24 hours later, they're pretty freaking worried. She's only 17. They've already called the police. She's officially a teenage runaway. Her phone started going off not long after you got on the road, bombarding her with messages, begging her to come home. The phone died after a few hours. She forgot to bring her charger. You? You've got your phone with nearly a full charge. The only person who has called you is your sister to warn you that someone leaked the Fulton Edge Academy security footage. Your fight with your father is all over the news, playing on a loop. It's a political nightmare. Speaker Cunningham assaulting his own child. They're calling for his resignation. Time keeps ticking away. The miles between you and New York continue to grow as California edges closer. You offer to turn around for her. You don't want her to have any regrets. She tells you to shut up and keep driving west. A few days later, you cross into the city limits of Los Angeles. The day you should have graduated. You find a small hotel that'll rent a room to an 18-year-old, just until you can get set up somewhere permanently. Let's go out you say. Where to? she asks. Somewhere nice. We're here. We made it. We should celebrate. So you do just that. You take her out. She wears her graduation dress, the one her mother helped pick out. Sleeveless. Royal blue. She has to wear her everyday flats because she forgot to pack extra shoes. It's simple. She feels so plain. You tell her she's the most beautiful woman in the world. Dinner is at a fancy steakhouse, the kind where portions are small and the bill is massive, but people don't complain because it's all about the atmosphere. Afterward, the two of you hit Hollywood Boulevard, seeing the handprints immortalized in cement before strolling along the Walk of Fame, looking at the celebrity stars as you hold hands. Someday, you'll be here she tells you, smiling, as you pause and pull her to you. You'll have your name on one of these stars. Yeah? You think I'm as talented as... You glance down to the nearest star by your feet, reading the name on it. Kermit the Frog? She laughs. Well, now that I think about it, I'm not so sure. I mean, Gonzo, maybe, but Kermit? Maybe if I work hard, you say. Maybe, she agrees, kissing you. You make out, right there on Hollywood Boulevard. It's a beautiful moment. Nothing can ruin it. Not even when a guy dressed like Darth Vader angrily tells you to get a room. We have one of those, you say. How about we go make use of it? I thought you'd never ask. You make love to her, on and off, all night long. Now that those words are out, now that they exist between you, you can't seem to stop saying them. I love you. I love you. I love you. Your first night in California is one of the best of your life. You're hopeful for the future. The next day, all your credit cards get shut off. The day after that, your bank account is frozen. It's a quick descent from hopeful to despondent, you're not surprised your father cut you off, but it hurts. What you have is maybe a hundred dollars in your wallet and a notice to vacate the hotel in 72 hours. What you don't have is a job. You're going to have to do something drastic. 
So you leave the next morning before dawn to try to figure something out, and you don't make it back until later that night, well after sunset. You sleep for a few hours before you're back at it again. You finish earlier this time, though, around three o'clock in the afternoon. The girl is sitting on the bed in the hotel, writing in her notebook. She greets you with a smile. What are you writing? You ask, sitting down next to her, not expecting her to answer. You ask all the time, and she always tells you a story. This time, though, she says, Our story. Our story, you say. That's what it is. Sort of, she says. It's my version of us. Can I read some of it? Her pen stalls. She hesitates. Carefully, she flips back to the beginning and hands it to you. Just the first few pages. You read, utterly fascinated, but you don't get far at all before you have a grievance to air. See, now that's bullshit. This line right here, you said there was nothing special about you. She snatches the notebook back. About her, not me. But she's you. And I can assure you the first time I saw you, I wasn't thinking... You grab the notebook, and she refuses to surrender it, but you pull it close enough to read. You're a commoner because not all girls can be royalty. That's bullshit. You're the queen, baby. She yanks the notebook away, closing it and tossing it out of your reach. I said it's my version. It's fictionalized. You should write my version. Which would be what? Thirty pages of duck jokes followed by a whole bunch of smut? Duck jokes, you say, or dick jokes. Knowing you, both. Funny, but no. It would be a story of struggle that leads to triumph. You stand up. Come on, put your shoes on. Let's go for a walk, I'll show you. You'll show me. Despite her incredulous tone, she listens, and the two of you walk around, strolling a few blocks. The neighborhood isn't the best, but it isn't too dangerous. Maybe a bit run down, but it's quiet. When you reach an old two-story white and blue building, you lead her around to the back of it, to a small outdoor staircase. You pull a ring of keys from your pocket. She looks at you with confusion. Still, she follows you up those stairs, patiently waiting as you unlock a creaky door at the top. She steps inside, looking around the empty place. It's an apartment. It's small. There's no other way to put that. The kitchen and living room merge together into one, beside a single bedroom just big enough to hold a bed. The bathroom is like a box, everything cramped together. The floor is made of old, unfinished wood, scuffed and stained. The white paint on the walls is peeling, leaving patches of a peach color in places. There's only one window in the entire apartment in the bedroom, blocked by an old air conditioner. I know it's not much, you say. It's shitty, really. I know. But I'm 18. I've got no job and no credit, so it's the best I can manage right now. It's ours, she looks at you. You rented this. You hesitate, like your mouth doesn't want to admit that before you nod. You're swallowing your pride. It's ours. But can we even afford a place? She asks. How will we pay for it? I got us some money, you tell her. It won't last forever, but it should be enough to get us settled. Where'd you get money? You hesitate yet again. I, uh, I sold my car. You sold the blue Porsche. You tried to think of another way, but it was the only thing of value you had that you owned. So you sold it. For less than it's worth, but if you're careful, it's enough to cover living expenses for a few months. This place is great, she says, wrapping her arms around you. Our very first apartment together. And hopefully the last, you mumble. It's only up from here. As soon as things start coming together, I'm going to build you a house. 
You don't know this, but that girl, she doesn't need a house. She doesn't even need an apartment. She would have slept in the car. She wouldn't have complained at all about it. You didn't have to sell it, but you did. And as grateful as she is for that, she already feels guilty. She's worried, and she's scared, that this won't be a story of triumph. Because she believes in you. She wouldn't be there if she didn't. But the world isn't always kind to good people. Sometimes, it eats them alive. 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 Eats them alive.